Good evening, everyone. My name is Diane Howard, Mayor of Redwood City, and I'd now like to call the meeting to order. Thank you for tuning into our virtual City Council meeting. Attending the meeting tonight via teleconference are Council Members Aguirre, Espinosa Garnica, G, Reddy, and Smith, Vice Mayor Hale, and myself. I also wanted to remind everyone that following the adoption of Ordinance 2496, the start time of all regular City Council meetings has been changed from 7 to 6 p.m. Also, we are offering Spanish translation for tonight's meeting through a dial-in conference line. If you wish to hear the meeting in Spanish, please dial 669-900-9900. Enter meeting ID 346-830-8566 and password 1017. And this information is on the screen in front of you. Again, the phone number is 669-900-6833. The meeting ID is 346-830-8566. And the password is 1017. Instructions are also shown on our screen. And now I'll turn it over to our translator, Gonzalo Cordova, to give these instructions in Spanish. Muy buenas noches a todos. Gracias por unirse a la reunión del Ayuntamiento de Redwood City este 14 de junio de 2021. Si desea escuchar esta reunión en español, llame al 669 900 6833 y la contraseña de la reunión es 1017 y el número de reunión es 346 830 85 66. Gracias. Thank you so much, Mr. Cordova. As a reminder, items will be taken in the order they are listed on the agenda. I will now ask our city clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mayor Howard. We'll start with Council Member Aguirre. Here. Council Member Espinosa Garnica. Here. Council Member G. Here. Council Member Reddy. Here. Council Member Smith. Here. Vice Mayor Hale. Here. And Mayor Howard. Here. Thank you. I would now like to ask our Vice Mayor if she will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Certainly, please join me remotely in saying our nation's pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Vice Mayor Hill. Appreciate that. Moving on to item number four, presentations and acknowledgments. Tonight, we'd like to introduce our newly appointed fire chief, Ray Iverson, and welcome him to Redwood City. I will turn it over to our city manager, Melissa Stevenson-Diaz, for a few remarks. Good evening, and thank you very much, Mayor and City Council. It's my great pleasure this evening to introduce Ray Iverson as our new fire chief. As many of you know, earlier this year, we conducted a national recruitment process to select our new fire chief, who serves not only the city of Redwood City, but also the city of San Carlos under contract. Ray comes to us from the San Mateo Consolidated Fire Department, and uh, that agency served the cities of San Mateo, Foster City, and Belmont, so he is well acquainted with San Mateo County. He has uh, been a part of the fire service in California since 1991 and has both public and private sector fire-related experience in several communities in California. This includes serving as assistant chief and fire marshal for the Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District and as battalion chief and fire marshal with the Benicia Fire Department. I appreciated input that I received from several community members as we went through the selection process. I'm looking forward to raise leadership as we continue to reimagine city services to meet community needs and support the city's financial sustainability. Ray started work last Monday, June 7th, and he's already been hard at work interviewing firefighter candidates and preparing for tonight's budget presentation. Very glad to have him aboard, and I look forward to you meeting him soon. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Is uh, Chief Iverson not with us this evening? He is with us. Let's see. I do see his name there. Chief Iverson, would you like to say a few words? Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, um, council, members of council. Uh, I'm happy to be a part of the River City family. I'm looking forward to working with all of you uh, and the community in the many weeks, months, and years to come. Um, one of the things that I've uh, been able to do the last week is really get around to meet everyone. And uh, geez, uh, I received a great warm welcome. Uh, I'm happy to uh, be here. I'm happy to look forward to the work ahead. Uh, although I'll be very busy the next several weeks, uh, my door will always be open. I'll be looking forward to meeting and getting to all of you. Uh, one of the things that um, I'd like to do is uh, um, thank my wife, Angie, for allowing me to take advantage of this opportunity and work with Redwood City. And also um, City Manager Melissa Stevenson-Diaz for her confidence and trust in my abilities to lead the fire department into the future. Uh, thank you and looking forward to um, working with Redwood City and the entire family uh, the government of Redwood City. Thank you, Chief Iverson. And on behalf of the City Council, I want to welcome you to our Redwood City community. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Now we'll move on to the Welcoming Star Award for One Life Counseling Center. We're presenting Welcoming Star Award to a local mental health partner, One Life Counseling Center, for their work creating a welcoming environment for the community and for providing mental health services for vulnerable populations in times of critical need during the COVID-19 epidemic pandemic. I will now turn it over to Jacqueline Contreras from Welcoming Redwood City for her presentation. Ms. Contreras. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, City Staff, and community members. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Contreras, and I have the pleasure of working with the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office CARON program, a community-based program um, that serves the North Oaks and coast areas um, in partnership with PCRC. Um, the Welcoming Star Award recognizes programs in Redwood City and North Oaks and the North Oaks community that creates a welcoming environment, including treating everyone in Redwood City and North Oaks with inclusion, understanding, and respect. It shines a light on what is working with the hope that others will follow suit. Tonight, we will be honoring One Life Counseling Center, um, and I pass it on to Mayor Howard, I'm sorry, to present the award. Thank you, Jackie. I'd now like to present the award to One Life Counseling Center for creating welcoming environments, which is so important to One Life because they believe everyone should have access to mental health services. The organization provides custom tailored mental health programs for public, private, and charter schools, including innovative, culturally aware, outcome-based counseling services in the Redwood City School District. One Life also has services specifically tailored to immigrant students in their newcomer trauma program. When mental health issues worsen during the pandemic, One Life has been able to step up to serve the increased needs of the immigrant community and other marginalized communities through group sessions that teach coping skills, identifying emotions, developing healthy habits, setting goals, problem solving, building confidence, and so much more. Their team is hoped to be in all schools to be able to provide their services to anyone and everyone. I now invite Susie Hughes from One Life Counseling Center to accept the award and give her remarks. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Howard and um, Vice Mayor Hale and Council members. Thank you, PCRC and Robot City Together and Caron for this amazing award. It has not been an easy year. It's been a really tough year and um, the needs, basic needs for food, diapers, clothing, shelter have escalated. 
And if those basic needs aren't met, then uh, people's mental health suffers. And we have definitely seen an onslaught of referrals and just need in the community. Um, we've been so lucky that Redwood City School District, um, Peninsula Healthcare District, Sequoia Healthcare District have really stepped in to help support our work. And so I'd like to thank the school district specifically, um, Andrew Guerin, for their help in allowing us in to really meet the needs of the community um, through the schools. We are also here for the community. There is no one in um, Redwood City who needs to worry about finding mental health services. We will help you. Um, we are happy to um, support you any way we can. Um, we definitely believe that mental health services need to be um, an outreach um, so that people don't just seek us out, but we are in places where people need the help, like the schools or Police Activities League in Redwood City, Able Works, Samaritan House, um, where we set up camp um, and are there. And so you can know us so that access is um, available at all times. So I am so grateful um, for, for this award. Um, we we want to be as welcoming and loving to the community and serve um, the North Fair Oaks area as best we can. Um, so I'm really grateful for our funders. I'm really grateful for um, school districts and our community partners that that allow us to do what what we love to do. So we're here. Always give us a call if you ever need help. So thank you so much for this award, and I really appreciate it. Um, it's it's been it's a great honor and a great a lot of work this last year too. So thank you. I can only imagine. But we're in it together. We're in it together. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Ms. Hughes. Yeah, uh, we always ask welcoming star recipients to share a tangible way that people can take action and support their efforts. You can support One Life by purchasing early bird tickets, becoming a sponsor, or donating items to their fifth annual Night of Inspiration fundraiser happening on September 9th. Learn more at tiny one slash life 2021. Please consider taking part so One Life can continue to provide low fee counseling services for our community. If you or someone you know needs their services, please contact One Life at 650-394-5155 or info at onelifecounselingservices.com. If you or anyone you know is in need of food or would like to volunteer in their food drive, send an email to jennifer at onelifecounselingservices.com. Thank you, One Life Counseling Center, for all of the work that you do for our community. I want to thank you and your amazing efforts towards improving mental health in our community. Thank you, Susie, for joining us tonight to accept the award. And again, people, I, you saw the information on the screen. If you'd like to get involved, please do so. One Life is a wonderful organization. Thank you for being here with us. Okay. Now we will move on to item number five, public comment. At this time, we will take public comment on items that are on the consent calendar on matters of council, in, council interest, items 9B, 9C, and 9D, and on items not on the agenda. For matters of council interest, item 9A, the council referral related to the eviction moratorium, there will be an opportunity to provide public comment on that item later this evening when it is discussed. Comments on item 9A will not be taken now. Procedures for making public comment are on the screen in both English and in Spanish. I will now turn it over to our city clerk to facilitate public comment on consent items, on matters of council interest items, 9B, 9C, and 9D, and on matters not on the agenda. Ms. Aguilar? Thank you, Mayor Howard. As stated, now is the time for public comment. We ask that you please follow the instructions on the screen to be recognized. If you're joining by phone, press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself when prompted to speak. In order to see how many speakers we have for public comment, I ask that anyone who wishes to speak on the items mentioned, please raise your hand now and please keep your hand raised until your name is called to give your public comment. And we'll give it just a minute.
at this time, we have 15 speakers. We have 15 speakers. Our last speaker will be Becca Keeler. And after Becca speaks, um, we will close public comment for this portion of the meeting. If any additional speakers queue up after uh, Ms. Keely Keeler is called, you're asked to email your public comment to the city council at council at redwoodcity.org. Each speaker will be given two minutes to speak. I will call your names in the order that hands are raised two at a time, and the timer will begin once you start speaking. First is, I believe that's Bruce Utech, followed by Pat W. Go ahead, Bruce. Hi, uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council. I wanted to thank you for the proclamation that you wrote for the veterans of the foreign wars 100th anniversary. Uh, for people who don't know, the veterans of the foreign wars post 69 here in Redwood City is uh, was called Corporal James Lindsay William Jr. And that post was founded on May 28th in 1921 in honor of Corporal Williams in the service during World War One. Um, originally post 2310 was post 69 and they uh, they formed to combine with posts from East Palo Alto and San Mateo. Um, Council Member Reddy and myself, we went to their meeting on Friday, May 28th, which was the Friday before Memorial Day, and gave them the proclamation and presented them with 25 challenge, coin, challenge coins. That was followed by pictures and lunch. They were very pleased that they were recognized by the City of Redwood City staff and the City Council. So once again, thank you very much for the proclamation. Thank you, Bruce. Our next speaker will be Pat W with an X, followed by Allison M. Go ahead, Pat W. There you go. Pat W X as in Malcolm X, because today I'm incensed. Quoting from a portion of the budget message, quote, in April 2021, the city hosted a community meeting of public safety budgets to begin this multi-year conversation. Preliminary budget decisions in both the police and fire departments establish early steps on this um, multi-year journey. Excuse me, um, Pat, if yes. you are speaking on the budget, that item will be called later in the, um, in the meeting and you'll have an opportunity to make your public comment on the budget at that time. May I continue, please? If you are speaking- I don't know that yeah. I'll be here. Okay, if you're speaking about something other than the budget or um, the items that were mentioned earlier, not on the agenda or matters of um, council interest or consent, then you are welcome to continue. Um, budget comments should be reserved for later in the meeting. Okay, may I ask a question? Are these comments going to be before or after the council members speak? Because in this case, what I'm about to say is something that council members should discuss. The public comment will be taken after the council questions and discussion and before the council takes their um, action, their vote. So may I continue, please? Only yes. on items on consent, matters of council interest or not on the agenda. If I want the council to look at something specifically, can I mention what that is? Mr. Willard, I, yeah. I, I hate to interrupt, but uh, we ask everyone to please abide by the rules of the consent agenda. So if there is something that you would like us to see, you can send it to council at redwoodcity.org. And uh, those of us who have access to our email can check if you have a specific something that you would like to be sure that we read before we enter into that discussion. Okay, so I hope you understand. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Howard. I was just trying to understand more precisely what the request was. Okay, thank so you so much. I will much. wait until that time, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Our next speaker is Allison M. followed by Rona Gundrum. Hi, thank you, Pam. 
Um, I would like to speak on something I've spoken on before, but I'd like to just reinforce it. I've written on Nextdoor about it and spoken in meetings in addition to some neighborhood groups uh, that have formed in the last year or two. And a lot of us have been requesting a public process for the entire Inner Harbor area. I know that I have seen emails from the Pierce family, from Gerd, from Chris Johnson and others. And this involves the opportunity over there for an open space, for a park, for the tank to be um, displayed, for the marina to continue in some configuration, the rowing club, the RV safe lot, a navigation center, an express desire for a sports field and affordable housing, all with the po police department in the jail. It's enormous like density and stakeholder presence, and it should be coordinated. Um, I've received emails through the production rest, um, request in the relocation action. That's a trial August 2nd, where the judge will decide if the effort to entirely get rid of Docktown um, is a public process and a public purpose. And if so, a relocation plan needs to be adopted before anyone is displaced. Um, it's often referenced, I think, in some of these emails as if it's only me. I speak often, but I speak on behalf of many that are still there. There's a dozen households down there. And those, there are many who have been displaced that would like to come back. And I don't mean as residential liberal boards at Docktown, but just as commercial and recreational voters to keep um, at least half or what remains of Docktown. And also I sent a very detailed email um, and it's in the public record tonight. And I would just like to call people's attention to it because it really has all the background about what's been going on in terms of a lot of these homes large homes that hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on. They've thank sunk you. one thank of you. Thank you, Allison. Um, okay. That's time. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next is Rona Gundrum, followed by Betty Fellows. Good evening, Mayor Howard and City Council members. I am um, contacting you this evening regarding the um, Technology Park being promote, proposed for Redwood Shores by Redwood Life. Uh, this project is ill-suited for the proposed location for a host of environmental, traffic, and safety reasons. Um, these were previously brought to uh, City Council's attention. Uh, in addition to demolishing a technology park that has an abundance of office space that is attractive, contemporary, and minimal in terms of height, which is a desirable aspect in an area that's primarily residential, it is beyond wasteful, especially when there are unoccupied office spaces and dozens of projects in the pipeline to build more in both the shores and downtown Redwood City. There is a need for biotech office space. However, there are more suitable locations for biotech development in Redwood City specifically in the area off of Seaport Boulevard, where a few biotech companies are currently located. Um, a more suitable complex to develop a technology park, such as the one being proposed by Redwood Life, would be the Britannia Seaport Center along Chesapeake Drive. Uh, there are dozens of older one-story R&D buildings that can be redeveloped <clears throat> using the vision being proposed without the environmental traffic and safety issues that exist for Redwood Shores. In addition, it would be an ideal location for ferry service to get to the port of Redwood City from San Francisco and from the East Bay. We must take action to reduce the traffic and gridlock on the peninsula, especially between Woodside Road and Highway 92, and especially in light of the biotech development that's going on in San Carlos. Longfellow could make renovations to the existing- Ms. Gundrum, that is your time. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Betty Fellows. Betty will be followed by Colin user number one. Is this the time to comment about the collection of sewer service charges or is that later on? That is later on in the meeting. I will lower my hand then and comment later. Thank you, Ms. Fellows. Our next speaker is Colin User 1. 
and will be followed by Matt Tador. Go Hi, ahead. good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you. Hi, my name is Marcelina Luna, a resident of Redwood City, and I wish to make a public comment on the consent item um, 6K, which is in regards to the pavement management program. Um, after reviewing the 20 proposed projects, it's clear that they are far from being equitable since um, a little bit over 60% of them are all in affluent neighborhoods. And there's also a huge discrepancy in the length of roads being proposed to be repaired. For example, the Farm Hill Boulevard project is almost 1.8 miles, while the project on Fifth Avenue is literally one block, one block. So also, it looks like we are wasting our taxpayers' money on the Arguello Street project when the city is very well aware of the proposed um, project from Heinz Development to redevelop 3.5 acres or six parcels on that exact location of this road improvement proposed project. They are one of the wealthiest um, and largest developers in our country that are based in Texas, and they're worth $1.3 billion in assets. So I'm sure our city manager can negotiate a much better deal to benefit the community of Redwood City. Um, so I'm asking you to please remove item 6K from the consent calendar and have a hearing on it. Invest in parts of Redwood City that have been ignored for far too long, especially in District 3, um, which would bring true equity to these neighborhoods. Investing in an, an underserved communities and bring those streets to that same level as Districts 1 and 7. Can you imagine what that would look like? Also, imagine not pouring more of our tax dollars to affluent neighborhoods until all neighborhoods are up to the same level of investment. Now, that's what true equity looks like. So I hope someone is listening, um, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Marcelina. Our next speaker is Matador, followed by our final speaker, Clara Jackal. Go ahead, if you can unmute yourself. Matt Tador, public speaker. This is, if you're able to unmute yourself. Um, you Sorry go. about that. No problem. Adrian here. Um, yeah, I cede my time. I realize that the discussion regarding the sewer charges uh, is later in the meeting, so I give my time back. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from you later. And our last speaker at this portion is Clara Jackal. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly on item 6K. I share the concern just expressed by Marcelina Luna to note that a majority of the projects seem to be slated for more affluent areas, and I second the call to increase investment in infrastructure for neighborhoods that haven't received as much of it. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. If you are unable to make a public comment at this time, we ask that you email your comments to the city council at redwoodcity.org. This concludes the public comment portion uh, for these items. Thank you, Ms. Aguilar. We're moving on to item number six, the consent calendar, and these are items that are routine in nature and are approved in one motion. I will be recusing myself from item 6C regarding 612 Jefferson Avenue because I have a continuing source of income that owns shares in Sequoia Hotel. However, on September 30th, 2020, my husband and I were fully repaid for our sale of these shares in 2018, and this will no longer be a source of income as of September 30th, 2021. So I'd now like to ask for a motion to, and a second, to approve all items on the consent calendar except for item 6C. Uh, Mayor Howard, let's have Spinoza here. Yes. Um, I'd like to um, pull item K, 6K as well. For discussion. Okay, so I would need a motion and a second to approve all items on the consent uh, calendar except 6C and 6K. So moved. Second. 
Okay, moved by Council Member Reddy and seconded by Council Member Aguirre. Could I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Council Member Aguirre. Yes. Council Member Espinosa Garnica. Yes. Council Member G. Yes. Council Member Reddy. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Vice Mayor Hale. Yes. And Mayor Howard. Yes. Thank you. Now, I'd like to ask our city attorney, should I move to approve item 6C with me abstaining and then address item 6K? Would that be the most, the clearest way to handle that? Yes, you could do it that way, Mayor Howard. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'd like a motion and a second to approve item 6C. So moved. By Council second. Member Aguirre and seconded by Council Member G. I'd like to ask for the roll call, please. We'll start with Council Member Espinosa Garnica. Yes. Council Member G. Yes. Council Member Reddy. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Aguirre. Yes. And Vice Mayor Hale. Yes. The motion passes with six votes. Mayor Howard is recused. Thank you. Now we'll move on to item 6K. Council Member Espinosa Garnica, would you like to address item 6K? Yes, thank you, Mayor Howard. I was curious to know more about this, um, the selection in our streets for, for the roadway pavement management, um, knowing that districts like mine and like uh, Council Member Smith district are historically disenfranchised and have very poor conditions on their roads. Um, how was, how were these roads selected and um, was that kept into this consideration? That's a good question. And I would like to ask our city manager if she would like to address who would speak to that, please. Yes, thank you very much. Our transportation manager, Jessica Manzi, is on the call and I'd ask her to provide some more information. Great, thank you, Mayor Howard and City Council. I'm Jessica Manzi, the city's transportation manager. And uh, regarding this uh, action tonight, um, I want to first clarify that the action is to approve a list of streets that would be eligible for uh, this grant funding that comes to the city by the state. And so it doesn't necessarily um, compel us to invest in all of the streets that are listed in the resolution, but they are identified as being eligible for those funds. Um, but regarding how we pick the, the streets, we have a pavement management software program that is um, provided uh, at a cost to us through the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, but that software program allows us to match the existing conditions of the street with the type of uh, repair that we're planning to do. So in this case, uh, we're proposing an overlay project and typically we'll be doing overlay projects on streets that are higher volume collectors and arterial streets as opposed to um, more residential streets. And so really we're looking at the, um, we use the software program to identify streets uh, that have a pavement condition that warrants an overlay um, type of repair on it. And then we, we go through that list that uh, gets spit out and then remove streets that don't make sense for whatever reason, whether it's you know inconsistent or with a planned utility project or if there's a development project uh, as was suggested earlier, uh, we can remove those out or if there's something other, uh, some other work that's planned, we can revise that. And in some cases we'll add street segments in based on feedback we've received from our pavement management uh, staff at Public Works. Um, and so in terms of, of equity, that is something that we keep in mind um, more in refining the project list once we have a more technical approach to identifying streets. Um, in this case, I would also um, caution that it's, it's challenging to assess um, the equity of the, the program when you're looking at a single project uh, because you know matching a, we don't wanna artificially do an overlay, for example, on a, on a residential street that doesn't need an overlay. And so um, it's, it's best to look more comprehensively at what are the projects that we've done in the last few years and the dispersion of, of that work um, to assess 
the overall equity of the program. And that's something that when we bring the construction project forward to you for your approval, um, we could include on our staff report as well. But happy to answer any, ask, answer any other questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Manzi. Ms. Um, Council Member Espinoza Garnica, did you have a follow up question? Um, I do, but I see Michael or Council Member Smith is up. His hand is up. So oh, I thank you for that. bringing that to my attention. Uh, Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Council Member Espinoza Garnica, for bringing um, or for pulling this item off of the consent calendar. I have uh, similar concerns to uh, Council Member Espinoza Garnica's points. Um, I also would like to kind of raise a bit of an anecdote. So over the past, I would say three to four months that I've been on the council, I've been approached by several folks in my uh, district who have concerns about uh, the pavement quality uh, and the crowning on several of District 4 streets. These are incidences and issues that have been documented by the city. Um, and so, uh, and, and they've been documented for several years. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused as to um, why those projects didn't end up on the list. I understand there is a process, but I guess I'm not really sure how the process that you've described, Ms. Mancy, helps to um, escalate individual residential neighbors' concerns about the pavement of their streets. Um, so process aside, uh, I do think that this is an equity issue. As uh, Council Member Espinosa Garnica mentioned, um, we both live in uh, you know, denser parts of the city um, you know, with large populations of people of color, lower income. Um, and it's concerning to me that there's a you know, $1 million plus investment in infrastructure and it's almost completely ignoring uh, both of these areas. Um, you know, I looked specifically at the maps and uh, there's nothing in District 4, as far as I know. Um, and again, it is a district, I think, that has been crying out for help around street pavement for, for, for a while. So again, still a little concerned, still a little confused as to why the streets that were chosen were chosen, but I would like to see a little bit more rigor for that level of investment done so that we can have a more equitable distribution of those resources. So those are my comments, and uh, I hope that uh, the rest of the council uh, we'll uh, consider them. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to ask um, either Ms. Manzi or uh, our city manager, uh, this, I, I'm thinking what was said was this is grants money and there were certain qualifiers. And what I heard you say was major arterials, uh, heavy flow streets. And I guess that would explain why Farm Hill Boulevard was chosen because it is a very major arterial in our community. But as far as our program that doesn't go for qualifying grants, are we looking at that with an equity lens, looking to see that we are uh, being equitable in how we treat our different streets in Redwood City, or should we? Yeah, it's definitely something that, oh, sorry. Please go ahead. No, please go ahead. Yeah, um, it's definitely something that we keep in mind. And again, um, I think there's sort of a mix of different maintenance strategies that we use and matching the right maintenance strategy with the right street. Um, so for example, um, recrown, you know, adjusting the crown on a road is typically um, requires completely restructuring, uh, reconstructing the roadway. And a project like that would to, you know, could very easily use the entire $1.5 million budget for the project. Um, and so again, what we're focusing on here is an overlay project, um, which has the ability to adjust a little bit on the crown, but isn't something that's uh, well suited to completely regrading uh, a street just because of the cost associated with that. Um, and I would also add one sort of nuance that isn't reflected in the staff report here is that what the project that we're going to be doing is a combination of spot. We always do spot repairs before we overlay a street. Some of the street segments that are listed are only getting a spot repair. They're not going to have an overlay on top. So Farm Hill is actually one of the, an example of one of those streets where, yes, it is a very long segment, but we're not going to be overlaying the whole street. What it needs right now is just the spot repair. So some of the streets um, that are shorter segments, um, for example, like the Fifth Avenue segment does require both 
the spot repair and the overlay. So, you know, you can't just compare the, the length of a, a project uh, with the amount of investment that the city is going to be making in the street. And if I could jump in, if I understand correctly as well, this funding can only be used for certain types of improvements, right? It, it's not um, completely flexible in terms of us if we chose to um, spend it simply or wanted to spend it on a, a residential repair, it wouldn't necessarily meet the requirements for that. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? It, it depends on what the, the repair would be. So we typically wouldn't be using this money for just a slurry seal, for example. And then just one, quickly, one other thing I would note is, you know, as the Equity and Social Justice Committee continues their work and thinks about an, an equity plan to recommend to the council, I think this could be a good case study of how we as an organization think about applying an equity lens to our projects. So there's, there's complexity in terms of time and, as Jessica mentioned, multiple years of investments. And so, you know, it's a particular um, project like this is maybe not representative of the entirety of our program. There's complexities around issues of funding, um, but there might be um, good, rich discussion for that committee to, to understand that more deeply and potentially recommend some policies to the city council. I, I like that idea, Ms. Diaz. Thank you very much. Vice Mayor Hale. Uh, thank you, uh, City Manager. I was actually raising my hand to m offer up that suggestion as well. It sounds like colleagues have raised some interesting points and in, that it warrants more discussion than um, pulling on consent might offer. So I'm curious to know um, if we wanted to vote to move forward with this tonight, is there a time sensitivity around the disbursement of the SB1 funds? Um, would we want? Would we need to move forward on this list of projects or is there time to, to reconsider and have a longer conversation on a committee? So we have to submit a list of streets that would be eligible for funding by the end of the month. Okay. For this next year, but this is an, an this process happens annually. Okay. I would be comfortable moving forward with a vote. I would love to hear from my colleagues, um, Smith and Espinosa Garnica if we could move that discussion to committee and then um, move forward with the list as proposed. Um, just for point of clarification, if we move it forward to the, to the committee for social justice, um, it still needs to be approved upon at this meeting, basically, and we can still work on it. But uh, for, now, for that to happen, we need to vote on approving that. Um, Ms. Diaz, could you clarify, I don't, Let's let's be clear on what we're doing. Right. So my recommendation would be that the committee, as it thinks about the work plan to recommend to the council, that you uh, make some recommendation for kind of the big picture around incorporating equity into, say, pavement management decision making. So separating it out from the decision tonight. So my recommendation would be to move forward. This is time sensitive. We will not have access to this money if we, we don't submit this before the end of the month, but that there is a, a bigger question that, that is being raised and that I think deserves some discussion. Um, and that would be something that could start at the committee, go further to the, the full city council at a future time, but not hold up this particular allocation. Thank you. Council member Smith. Yes. Thank you again, mayor. Um, so, I appreciate the recommendation that Ms. Diaz has put forward. I don't want to see Redwood City lose out on this funding, but I would suggest that um, you're absolutely right uh, to Vice Mayor Hale's point and to your point that we need to um, really be putting our money where our mouth is when it comes to equity. So this is something um, that I think I would have loved to have a little bit more of a fulsome conversation about um, because as we you know start to see certain streets and neighborhoods get additional investment and we're seeing other uh, neighborhoods that are being put on an equity work plan. Don't get me wrong. I think that the equity work plan is going to be incredibly important for the city, but we know that it's going to take um, a bit of time to get some of these programs off the ground. And so um, I, I, I'm really, I really think that's a shame. And I, I really hope that we can um, in the future, just start looking at all aspects uh, including infrastructure and public works from an equity perspective so we can avoid these situations in the future. Okay, thank you, Council Member Smith. And uh, 
I, I would agree, and I, I agree with Ms. Diaz's recommendation uh, going forward. So I'd like to know, uh, having had that discussion, I'm glad we did, would anyone like to move item 6K? So moved by Hale. Okay. Espinosa-Garnica. Okay. Thank you. Moved by Vice Mayor Hale, seconded by Councilmember Espinosa-Garnica. Can we have a roll call on item 6K, please? Yes. We'll start with Council Member G. Yes. Council Member Reddy. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Aguirre. Yes. Council Member Espinosa Garnica. <clears throat> yes. Vice Mayor Hale. Yes. And Mayor Howard. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Aguilar. I'll now read all items that have just been approved. Amendments to term to agreement for services with Four Leaf Incorporated, Agreement for Professional Services with Bureau Veritas Incorporated, Agreement for Professional Services with CSG Consultants Incorporated, Agreement for Services with InterWest Consulting Group, Agreement for Services with Shums Coda and Associates Incorporated, Agreement for Professional Services with TRB and Associates Incorporated, an amendment to compensation and term to an agreement for professional services with True North Compliance Services Incorporated, an agreement for professional services with West Coast Code Consultants Incorporated. Agreement for support of the Redwood City Community Schools for fiscal year 2020-21. Affordable housing loan agreement for a 20-unit affordable ownership project located at 612 Jefferson Avenue. Amendment number three to agreement with Yana Kaiser for diversity, equity, and inclusion consultancy. Purchase of one 2022 combination sewer cleaner on a freight liner cab and chassis. Purchase of one 2022 Ford F-550 Wildland Brush Patrol truck. Amendment number three to agreement with the County of San Mateo for information and referral services at the Fair Oaks Community Center. Agreement with the County of San Mateo for information referral services at the Fair Oaks Community Center, Center for fiscal year 2021-22. Annual Appropriations Limit for Fiscal Year 2021-22, Fiscal Year 2020-2021 Year-End Budget Amendments, Resolution Identifying the Fiscal Year 2021-22 Pavement Management Program in accordance with the Streets and Highways Code for Road Maintenance and Rehabilitation Account, Funds generated as a result of Senate Bill 1, SB 1, the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017. Approved minutes of May 24, 2021 City Council meeting and approved claims and checks from June 14, 2021 through June 28, 2021 and the usual and necessary payments through June 28, 2021. Moving on now to item seven, our study session for fiscal year 2021-22 budget study session and date setting for the public hearing and adoption of the fiscal year 2021-22 recommended budget. Our city manager, Melissa Stevenson-Diaz and city department heads will now give a presentation on our city's recommended budget. Ms. Diaz. Thank you very much, mayor and council and members of the community. I really appreciate the opportunity to present the recommended budget for fiscal year 21-22. Uh, Ms. Diaz, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to remind everyone that this is a study session and we will not take final action on the budget this evening. And our council members may ask questions and provide feedback and then it will be followed by public comment. So thank you. I just wanted to be sure that uh, we made that clear. Thank you. Thank you, no problem. So as we step into this, I think it's important to acknowledge that we are living in really extraordinary times, requiring us, among other things, to navigate a financial recession that is markedly different from those of the past and to provide community services in new and different ways. The city's history of strategic and sound financial management and the city council's clarity in prioritizing vulnerable residents during a pandemic and the staff's commitment and creativity have all helped us to rise to the challenges before us. The 
financial dis- dynamics that we described at the mid-year budget presentation in February are largely the same at this point, and so I will not be discussing those in detail tonight. There is one major exception, and that is the unprecedented one-time support from the federal government received in late May. Since February, the City Council has reviewed the proposed capital improvement program budget, held a study session on homelessness initiatives, and improved an economic resiliency plan. And all of those discussions are reflected in the recommended budget. Additionally, the city hosted a community meeting on public safety services and budget. This evening, we'll focus primarily on work in city operating departments to advance the city council's priorities and our recommendations for using one-time funds. Much of the focus tonight is on the general fund, and just as a reminder, the city's utilities are captured in separate funds, as those activities are funded through user fees, through the ratepayers, rather than through general taxes. We have a list of questions that we'll return to at the end, seeking your feedback on the recommended budget. So I'd like to begin now with a bit of background information. I have asked each of the department heads to share in the presentation with very speedy comments. This presentation will take about an hour. We'll then turn to the City Council for questions and comments, as you described, and then public comment. Our hope tonight is to complete the study session by around 9 p.m. so that the Council may address the other agenda items this evening. The City has a long history of taking intentional, proactive, and strategic steps to ensure the long-term sustainability of the City. This includes adopting structurally balanced budgets, funding long-term needs, and maintaining a 15% general fund reserve level. We have sought to address long-term costs rather than passing them on to future generations and to be creative in providing services. Strong voter support for local sales tax and a cannabis excise tax have provided new revenue that has been especially critical during this downturn. This history of strong fiscal management has been recognized by outside organizations. We've received top ratings from financial rating agencies and received clean audits from outside auditors every year. Even with these strong practices, we have significant challenges ahead. As we discussed in February, our reduced revenues, coupled with increased costs from former and current employee benefits, result in deficits over the next five years. This is after maintaining reduced staffing in most departments and after utilizing $7.5 million of reserves that the City Council designated in February. And these financial trends are one reason that we need to keep working together to align resources with evolving community needs. This next slide shows our projections for revenues and we can return to this slide if needed. Overall, we project modest growth in our top two revenue sources, property tax and sales tax. As you hear from city operating departments, I wanna note that across every department, city staffing levels have not kept up with population growth over the last 20 years. You see staffing in the blue bars and population growth in the red lines. So over that 20 year period, our population has increased by about 13%, while our employee base has declined by about 50 positions. We've been able to continue to offer high quality services through innovation, efficiency, and partnerships. We haven't been able to just add staff as the population have grown. As is true in the business world, our approach to city service has changed in the last 20 years. It has definitely changed in the last year as we faced a pandemic and we received new ideas about services and it will continue to change. We continue to focus on reimagining city services so that we can make the best use of the resources entrusted to us, both financial resources and people. The recommended budget continues momentum in recent years to leverage technology, address climate change impacts, and address community needs previously left to the county, including mental health and homeless services. We expect that the newly formed Equity and Social Justice Subcommittee and the Community Police Advisory Committee will shape services in the future, as will community input through enhanced community engagement. Shortly now, we will turn to the department presentations. Um, Before we begin, I would like to just acknowledge that our city attorney's office and their extraordinary work in supporting every city department through this pivotal year. 
They provided legal advice under extraordinary and ever-changing conditions. They'll not be presenting budget this evening in the interest of time, but they are involved in every department's activities, and we rely upon them for the work that you're about to see. With that, I would like to turn it over to Administrative Services and let the presentation begin. Thank you, and good evening, Mayor Howard, Vice Mayor Hale, and members of the Council. I'm Michelle Boucher Flaherty, Assistant City Manager, and for purposes of this segment, Administrative Services Director. I'm joined this evening by my fellow department directors, and we will provide you with a brief budgetary highlight about each department, beginning with Administrative Services. We have a total of 34 staff positions in administrative services, 20 work in finance and revenue services, and 14 work in information technology. Our finance and revenue team handles all the accounting, payroll, investments, budgeting, purchasing, revenue collections, and risk management. And our IT folks manage and support all city departments, technology equipment, the city network infrastructure, and software support. The majority of funding for administrative services comes from the internal service fund, which is made up of charges to each of our client departments. A number of additional funds also contribute a fraction of their revenue to our administrative support that touches all departments and programs. Over the past year, administrative services has delivered an exceptional range of accomplishments. In addition to the adjustments required by remote work, this team spent the last year onboarding me as their new department head. Leadership turnover, which asked more of each of them while navigating a virtual environment. At the same time, the team has been collaborating on preparing for a new financial software system that goes live next month. We also partnered with the city manager's office to deploy a new online budget portal to support greater transparency and accountability with our public finances. Our staff has also stretched beyond the workload of a typical year to complete new bond issuances, produce an additional budget, and develop improvements in cybersecurity. And the team has risen to meet all of these challenges while keeping the shop running full steam ahead. Paychecks, vendor payments, and IT can't wait while we take on new priorities. So somehow they've managed to do it all. And there's no sign of the workload slowing down anytime soon. In the coming year, we're prepared to support pandemic response and recovery with the launch of a utility bill forgiveness program and to support the reimagining of work practices, such as hybrid council meetings and staff work. We also plan to conduct a pilot program for participatory budgeting and to better engage the community in more equitable deployment of city resources. And we will continue to keep the city's financial and technology systems reliably operating to support all departments in their delivery of services to the community. With that, I will turn it over to Pam Aguilar, our city clerk. So it will be just a moment where you're experiencing some issues with the computer in the chambers, and I believe that our city clerk will be joining us momentarily. And if we need to, we'll advance and then go to circle back to her if we're not able to have her join. Just one moment. Actually, if I could ask you, Jessica, to go ahead and advance, we'll go to the next department and then circle back to Pam when she's able to join us. Thank you, Alex. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the Council. Alex Kodikin, Assistant City Manager. I'll be going over the City Manager's Office uh, budget for the fiscal year 21-22 budget. So really current resources that we are um, covering tonight, the city manager's office has five total divisions comprised of nine and a half full-time employees. The division includes first the management and policy execution division, which implements and executes city council policy decisions and strategic initiatives. The second, second division, division is the communication and engagement, 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 engagement division, which promotes most facilitates community, community building, building and civic engagement, engagement outreach and activities. activities. 
The third, the third division is our economic, economic development division, which implements, which implements programs to strengthen and, and sustain, sustain the city's economic, economic base, base and enhance a positive business climate. Our newest, our newest division, division are inclusion, inclusion diversity, diversity, equity, accessibility, accessibility and leadership in Redwood City, known as, known as Ideal, Ideal Redwood City, City advances equity, equity, equity and inclusion both in the city's workplace and through, and through the, the city's services, services and engagement, and engagement with, the with the public. Lastly, lastly, our housing division, which works to produce, preserve, and protect affordable housing. This division also administers the Federal Community Development Block Grant and Home Investment Partnership Program funds. The total budget for this division is $8.2 million. However, most of the funding is budgeted towards affordable housing projects or as grants to nonprofits. So moving on to the pie chart, uh, which covers the entire city management, the city manager's department uh, office budget for fiscal year 21-22, we're looking at $11.8 million, representing 4.2% of the recommended operational budget. As you can see in this chart, three-fourths, nearly 75% is dedicated to the housing division with the day-to-day -day operations funded through the general fund. I'm now gonna cover some of the accomplishments over the past year. So quickly to highlight these, um, in terms of equity, last December, we welcomed Brianna Evans as the city's first equity and inclusion officer. This new position supports the city council's action to make equity as a foundational guiding principle for the city's strategic plan. Our economic development division has been working on our outdoor business activity program, which was an essential component for our businesses to be able to continue operations in light of COVID-19. Uh, which allowed businesses to operate in our right-of-way, streets, sidewalks, and in private parking lots. In terms of cannabis, the council took action uh, last October to approve a zoning ordinance and municipal, municipal code amendments to allow retail storefronts here in our city. In regards to housing production and preservation, we completed funding agreements and restrictions for over 700 affordable housing units and have continued developing housing preservation and protection policies. Our safe parking program successfully launched um, in October of last year and really helped reduce the presence and impact of our RVs overnight parking on our city streets while offering a safe place for residents um, and a safe option to park in order to find alternative permanent housing. And lastly, our strategic communications plan, uh, we adopted it with the city council to better our communication strategy um, and opportunities to reach out to our community. In terms of service delivery, our homeless outreach and encampments, um, we were investing a record two and a half million, um, which is proposed as part of this budget to help house our homeless residents and produce community impacts related to encampments. Next steps toward reimagining city services include expanding homeless outreach efforts by the city's nonprofit and county partners and seeking opportunities to reduce public safety interactions with homeless individuals. In economic development, we are in the process of implementing the council approved economic resiliency plan, which includes components of the economic development work plan that we adopted pre pandemic. Um, in our small business empowerment program. Some of the few examples includes connecting with our top sales tax generators and downtown businesses, as well as supporting our emerging life science and biotech industries. Coordinating with our regional economic development groups and encouraging consumers to shop local through our marketing and promotion efforts to bring awareness to our local businesses. We're also exploring developing pre-approved parklet designs for permanent parklets throughout the community and also a digital sign along the Highway 101 corridor. And in communications, we're also focused on enhancing our connections with underrepresented communities and increasing data analysis to support policymaking. Our equity work plan. So through the newly formed City Council Subcommittee on Equity and Social Justice, staff will be working on the development of a citywide equity plan to advance the city's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the equity plan will incorporate policy priorities and new specific commitments to equity in each of our departments. The City Manager's Office will also be staffing the newly formed Police Advisory Committee. The Housing Division will be working on an anti-displacement strategic plan in collaboration with our Housing and Human Concerns Committee. Um, the plan includes strategies to preserve unsubsidized affordable housing and mobile home units. The plan will, all, will also include an evaluation and enhancement to the city's existing tenant protection ordinances, 
as well as protections for our mobile home residents. Work on redistricting, working through an advisory redistricting committee, staff will be working on advising setting the electoral boundaries for the council districts following the 2020 US census update. And cannabis, the city has will be working with its consultant HDL on the permit review process and application process um, to establish new storefront retail cannabis um, businesses here in Redwood City. Thank you, and I'd now like to hand it off to Mark Munzer, our Community Development and Transportation Director. Thank you. Actually, if we could go back to Pam. I'm sorry, Mark. It'll just make it a little easier for Jessica to not have to go back to me. So we'll catch Pam and then Mark. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, are you able to hear me? Okay, great. Sorry about the technical difficulties that I was having earlier. Good evening, Mayor Howard and City Council members. I will now provide a summary and highlights from the City Clerk's Office. Next slide. The City Clerk's Office is currently comprised of three full-time equivalents or employees, myself, our Assistant City Clerk, and our Management Analyst. We did have a recent retirement of our admin support staff, which represents one full-time equivalent in that position we plan to fill later this summer. Our adjusted budget for fiscal year 2021 is $1.367 million. The city clerk team is responsible for the conduct of city council elections, the oversight of our city council appointed boards, commissions, and committees, the care and custody of official city records, including providing access to those records when requests are made by the public. And as you well know, our office manages the city council agenda and meeting logistics in accordance to the Brown Act, in addition to a whole host of other internal and public processes. Uh, next slide. The city clerk's office is funded by the general fund. And for the coming fiscal year, our operations will make up $1.441 million of the general fund. Next slide. I'm pleased to share with you the following accomplishments from the past uh, fiscal year. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, resulting in a major shift to how council meetings are conducted, among many other things, our office worked expeditiously to modify city council meeting procedures and accommodate a virtual meeting environment. As you can see, here we are on Zoom. This resulted in increased public participation. And in fact, public participation during city council meetings doubled in 2020 compared to 2019. I wanna thank our IT staff for their collaboration on this ever evolving effort. We also partnered with the San Mateo County Elections Office to conduct the November 2020 general municipal election, which was also the first by district city council election in Redwood City, where four of our current council members were elected. This endeavor included virtual candidate filing orientations and hosting an in-person vote center at city hall which adhered to all the public health safety guidelines. The election could not have gone any smoother and I credit my staff and staff from all the departments for their coordination. Given our remote and virtual working environment during COVID, our office also led the implementation of several business process efficiencies with the help of key staff from across the organization. First was the imp implementation of an automated Public Records Act or PRA request system, which centralizes and greatly streamlines the PRA request process. This new request portal can be found on the city's website and is a one-stop location for making PRA requests. Also, our office is responsible for the execution and archiving of many, many city contracts and agreements. And to help pull that process together with multiple staff working remotely, we implemented an organization-wide electronic signature policy and process to ensure the contract routing, signing, and archiving process was not delayed during COVID, allowing city business with our vendors and contractors to continue uninterrupted. And last, our office assisted council with the recruitment and selection process for the newly formed Police Advisory Committee, which will start their work very shortly this summer. And um, to, to wrap it up, please allow me to share the following ways the city clerk's office plans to respond, restore, and reimagine in the coming year. Our office, oh, next slide, please. 
our office will enhance translation services during city council meetings to include and respond to our diverse community. We will continue to analyze solutions to support hybrid city council meetings and evaluate in-person and virtual engagement opportunities. We will also explore automated solutions for managing and archiving public comment of city council agenda items to make those comments more transparent and more accessible. Next slide. And we will also identify tools to provide greater public access to information and services. One example is implementing an electronic system for campaign disclosure and statement of economic interest filings, and that project is already underway. And lastly, the initiative that I am most looking forward to is supporting the city's efforts towards diversity, equity, and inclusion by researching new ways to solicit broader public interest in serving on a board, commission, or committee, and reviewing the recruitment, application, and onboarding process for BCCs from top to bottom to, through an equity lens in order to increase representation. So this concludes my portion, and I now turn the presentation over to the Community Development and Transportation Department and Director Mark Munzer. Thank you, Pam. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Howard and members of City Council. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, these are the current resources for the Community Development and Transportation Department, acronym is CDT, as you're well aware. Uh, we're divided up into four work groups. On this slide, you'll see uh, building and code enforcement and their uh, staffing allocation as well as their budget. Of course, they are charged with monitoring uh, construction that goes on in the city and also compliance with city and state building codes. Our next work group is planning, uh, which is combined with GIS and analytics. There is their staffing allocation and budget. Of course, planning is in, in charge of entitlement review and also reviews uh, building permits for land use and zoning compliance, as well as uh, reviews amendments to the city's general plan. And then our very small but robust GIS group, which maintains just a fantastic uh, publicly accessible GIS system and uh, land use data and a series of dashboards that, that I'm very proud of. Next slide, please. The final two work groups, engineering and transportation, which is our largest division within CDT, the uh, staffing and budget allocations are there. They, of course, are charged with designing and uh, uh, constructing uh, a large majority of the city's infrastructure. They also are actively involved in development review uh, and also with building permit applications when applicable. And of course, are involved with improvements and construction to city facilities uh, such as parks. Finally, the administration uh, arm of the department, which monitors the operations of all these divisions and also monitors the department's budget and our performance measures. Next slide, please. Uh, we are funded uh, predominantly by the general fund, as you will see on that slide. However, we do have a large majority of funding that comes from uh, the capital projects fund as well as enterprise funds. And of course, that's related to our work um, uh, investing and uh, constructing the city's uh, infrastructure. Next slide, please. So our accomplishments this year were many. Uh, I will succinctly uh, kind of highlight the, 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 the best ones. Uh, we adopted REACH codes as a city uh, in order to do, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. You will see the image there is of the soon to be, very exciting, soon to be under construction Veterans Memorial Senior Center, which won an award for its uh, electric uh, supply from Peninsula Clean, uh, Peninsula Clean Energy, PCE. We initiated the city's transit district plan um, of course, that's an 18 acre, 18 acre area around the city's transit station that could accommodate grade separations, land redevelopment, and uh, additional tracks for Caltrain. We completed the gatekeeper development initiation process, which ultimately led to eight uh, largely mixed use land use proposals in and around the downtown area. Uh, they have begun their planning and environmental review. A very exciting thing that we participated in were improvements um, to our zoning ordinance as it related to child care operations in order to encourage and streamline their development in both residential, commercial, and mixed use districts and certainly to meet a council priority. Uh, and as also mentioned by the city manager's office, we took a very active role in supporting our business community uh, in, with their outdoor operations and sidewalk cafes, which oftentimes took place in the public right of way when we, we dedicated extra staff and we streamlined that process 
in order to allow those operations to continue during, during COVID. Next slide, please. Um, very, very proud of our building division that basically overnight went to virtual building inspections. I get a report every day. Uh, today's report told me that 67% of our building inspections were done virtually, which is just amazing. It's not anything we did prior to March of 2020. Uh, and that is done by a phone or photo or software. Um, we're also expanding our permitting system in order to allow for more digital or electronic submittals while at the same time still allowing for uh, hard copy plans, knowing that not everyone can uh, submit in a digital environment. We are expanding our planning virtual counter service. It will also be an in-person service in the next few months. And that allows you to jump on our website, schedule a meeting with a planner on a particular topic. It goes right to their Outlook calendar and you've got a meeting set up over Zoom. And that of course will migrate to a hybrid system with in-person services. And over the summer, we'll be bringing you a micro mobility ordinance um, to uh, encourage shared mobility. And of course, that would be a shared uh, bike or scooter system, largely in the downtown area. Next slide, please. Um, finally, we are leading the city's housing element along with our environmental justice and safety element process. Very excited to have that study session with you and continue community outreach and engagement over the summer and the fall. We are processing downtown precise plan amendments predominantly related to the transit district and the gatekeeper initiation proposals. We will bring to you in 2022 the successor visioning process to the downtown precise plan, which is the central Redwood City visioning process. At your next meeting, we hope to have a study session with you on the Vision Zero Action Plan. And of course, that is to uh, eliminate, uh, substantially reduce any fatalities or serious uh, accidents. We are um, seeking uh, significant funding with our partners One Shoreline to make needed improvements to the levees in Redwood Shores. And we are again collaborating with other city departments to develop a permanent outdoor dining and business program and, and to encourage economic growth and realize some of the, continue some of the successes we had over this past year. Next slide. And I will now turn it over to Fire Chief Ray Iverson. Thank you. Good evening, um, Mayor Howard and members of the City Council. My name is Ray Iverson. And I'm your fire chief, new fire chief, and I'm uh, at my pleasure to review with you the fire department budget overview. Next slide. The fire department is consisting of several divisions and programs, a total of seven major divisions and programs. Uh, first off, we have the Ministering Fire Safety Division, which is compass, uh, includes five equivalent FTEs, full time employees. The operating budget for the Administrating Fire Safety Division is $2.4 million. They are tasked, the mission of the Fire Administration Division is to provide overall management for the fire department, um, also manage the fire department budget and provide leadership and support to the fire department. Next, we have the Fire Operations uh, Division, which is including the majority of the fire department personnel, a total of 78 full-time employees. The operating budget for the Operation Division is $25.4 million and they are tasked with uh, protecting life and property, providing emergency response, and providing advanced life support, as well as protecting the environment from effects of hazardous material releases. Next, we have the uh, Fire Prevention Division, which includes five full-time employees. Uh, the operating budget for the Fire Prevention Division includes uh, $1.7 million. Uh, they are charged with protecting critical infrastructure uh, through fire prevention activities, conducting inspections and life safety aspects of public education and fire safety awareness programs. Uh, next, we have the training division, which includes one full-time employee and their operating budget is $794,000. Uh, the training division is responsible for researching, evaluating trends related to fire service delivery, uh, providing education and training, drills, exercises for our first responders, as well as ensuring the safety for the fire department members. Uh, next, we have a contractual agreement with the city of San Carlos to provide fire and emergency services. Uh, they have, we have a total of 22 full-time equivalent personnel uh, that are um, charged to this fund line item. Uh, the operating budget for this fund currently sits at $8.5 million. Uh, part of that agreement and that contract for service, we provide fire and emergency services to the city of San Carlos, uh, which continues to provide savings through shared services and resources, which include fire prevention, public education, and fire training services. 
Uh, next, we have a, a program, uh, Emergency Medical Services. There are no full-time equivalents associated with this program. However, there's an operating budget of $46,000. And that program is charged with reducing casualties and loss of life, providing um, safe and efficient fire-based paramedic, paramedic services, improving uh, advanced life support services through, through fire department training. Uh, next slide. Next, we have the op Emergency Operations Center, uh, which is a program that we use to ensure the city remains safe uh, and prepared to handle natural disasters in response, uh, such as we are experienced, have experienced through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, Emergency Operations Center has a budget of $116,000. Um, uh, they are charged with collecting and analyzing data to evaluate situations and respond to the emergencies and disasters. Uh, also providing training for city staff for, to be operationally ready to respond to such disasters and to communicate to the council and the citizens regarding emergency preparedness and response. Uh, next slide. As you can see from the pie chart, uh, the fire department budget is um, comprised of several different fund sources, uh, three separate fund sources identically uh, I, 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 um, identified here in the pie chart. Uh, first, the uh, contract for services in yellow, $8.8 .8 million, which is proposed for budget year 21-22 for the contract services for the city of San Carlos. In the blue area, you'll see the fire prevention uh, services or fees, uh, mostly collected through fire prevention services, proposed to be at $2.1 million. And lastly, the lion's share of the budget for the fire department comes from the general fund. They're in green, $27.6 million is what's projected for this coming budget year. Um, next, we have accomplishments that we have um, experienced through the 21, 2021 uh, budget year. Uh, as you are aware, we responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic and also um, established recovery plans to address uh, that situation we're currently uh, hopefully coming out of here. Uh, we also responded to over 16 strike teams requested for statewide fire activity, which was an unprecedented year of fire activity uh, last fire season last year in 20. Uh, 20. Uh, we've also completed 100% of our annual inspections uh, mandated by the state. We, we continue to provide services as we speak now uh, through the COVID-19 transition uh, and it's having a safe working environment for our personnel and, and our community. Uh, we also um, have continued to develop a new software called Image Trend. We hope to go live with that uh, this coming uh, start of the next budget year. That's going to help and assist with uh, department-wide fire prevention inspection database and be able to deliver a streamline that service for uh, fire line safety in our community. Uh, lastly, we, we purchased a new ladder truck, a 2020, a 2020 Pierce ladder truck. I'm sure you've seen it um, in around town. That is a new resource that's gonna be very beneficial for the fire department moving forward. Uh, next slide. Some of the top activities planned for our new budget year 21-22 that will help us rest respond, restore, and reimagine fire service include um, launching a new standards of cover study, which will begin work um, very soon to help with our department's strategic planning and service delivery uh, for the city of Redwood City. Uh, we also will be participating in a county pilot program to um, help see how we can help deliver uh, mental health services and how the fire department will may play a role in that uh, through mental health services. Uh, also, we all like to uh, continue to collaborate with the county and other healthcare organizations to maximize the delivery of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we are continually continuing to do that moving into next year as well. Uh, we also, with other departments, will want to consider and work together to address approaches to homeless services and response. Some of the activities that are planned to address council priorities include implementing the Zone Haven platform uh, to support community evacuation planning for all hazards, uh, reviewing our current practices um, and removing barriers to um, enter the fire and excuse me, to enter the fire and emergency medical services, a recruitment process. Uh, we also look to continue to develop our junior fire academy, our cadet program, as well as our explorer post programs. And lastly, uh, one of the things we're looking forward to do is to update our mitigation, our hazard mitigation plan that will reduce community risk and support climate adaption. Thank you. And I, now I'd like to turn this over to uh, Michelle Katsuyasu, um, Katsuyoshi, excuse me, our Human Resource Director. Good evening. Thank you, Chief Iver Iverson, and um, welcome everybody. 
Human resources, our human resources department consists of seven full-time teammates. Our operating budget is approximately $10 million, and that is divided by our human resources budget of $2 million, and then also our workers' compensation budget that includes safety, ergonomics, and COVID-19 compliance. The human resources budget, I just want to highlight that it covers programs such as benefits, classification and compensation. Classification is a fancy word for positions, employee and labor relations, recruitment, hiring, selection, performance management, and also training and development. Our workers' compensation division covers safety, ergonomics, wellness, and response to COVID-19. We oversee all our workers' compensation claims. We work with a third-party administrator. And again, we ensure COVID-19 compliance by following county, state, and federal guidelines, which include Cal OSHA and CDC Centers for Disease Control. Um, here is a picture of our budget. And as you can see in green, the Internal Service Fund supports our workers' comp budget and the general fund of approximately 2 million um, supports our other HR programs. Accomplishments, I wanted to highlight the accomplishments that mostly supported our COVID efforts. And I think because as an internal service department, this is where we spent a lot of our attention. Uh, the first highlight is that we supported the workforce during the transition to remote working. We can all remember the county shelter in place that took effect on March 17th. Well, I'm happy to report that on March 13th, the city had already implemented a telework policy. So we were prepared in anticipation of the shelter in place. Also, we implemented an equipment loan program. And what this meant was that our teammates who were now working from home could borrow equipment that they had in the office, um, popular items, were printers, monitors, laptops, um, Wi-Fi hotspots. So we allowed all of our teammates to borrow, check out and borrow equipment that they needed for their home office. We also developed an expanded professional development policy. And what that meant was that our teammates could use some of those funds to purchase equipment that they wanted to use at home. So if they were not interested in borrowing equipment, but they wanted to use some of the, the funds from this benefit, they could purchase a desk, a lamp, a chair, a laptop um, that they would own for their use at home. We also conducted the mandatory Cal OSHA training to approximately 600 of our city teammates. Another accomplishment was that our recruitment team quickly developed and implemented virtual paperless recruitment and selection processes. So not only were we having Zoom meetings, we were having Zoom interviews. Um, I also want to highlight that we recently completed a week long of lateral firefighter interviews. We invited over 50 candidates and just today we made uh, conditional offers to 10 uh, lateral firefighters. So that was a big transition to do that um, all remotely. Also, we conducted a total of 59 recruitment and selection processes for 16 regular positions and 43 contract and casual positions. The service delivery highlights include some of our ongoing goals. The first one is to negotiate fiscally responsible labor agreements with all six of our bargaining group, uh, with all six of our bargaining groups. We are currently in meetings with all six and those contracts are due to expire in 2021 and also in 2022. And the goal is that we continue to provide salaries and benefits that attract and retain a well-qualified, diverse workforce. Also, as you've heard in the city manager's presentation, as well as the city clerks, we are partnering with the city manager's office to develop a comprehensive diversity, equity, and inclusion citywide training program. Uh, so we are partnering very closely with our diversity inclusion officer, uh, Brianna Evans. We are also enhancing our diversity outreach for recruitments and ensuring that our hiring and selection rules 
support the city's DEI efforts. So you'll hear a lot about looking at our policies and procedures through a DEI lens, and that's a priority for our human resources team. Lastly, we are implementing a technology to streamline processes and improve efficiencies in recruitment, onboarding, performance management, and training and learning. So I'm happy to say that this new technology will really support all of our HR programs. And now I would like to turn it over to Derek Wolfram, our library director. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Appreciate that. Uh, good evening, Mayor Howard and council members. I'm Derek Wolfgram. I'm the Redwood City Public Library Director. And uh, the photo on the screen I just wanted to share to kick things off was taken three weeks ago. This was the first person who walked in the door of the downtown library after we had been closed for 14 months and she immediately made herself at home and started picking out some books to take home, which was just a, a really refreshing sight after 14 months of not seeing that. So next slide, please. Uh, here we do have a summary of the library's budget and staffing. Um, one of the things that I like to highlight about the library is that volunteers actually account for a 50% of FTE above and beyond what our paid staffing count is. And this was even during a pandemic year. Uh, we have, uh, usually that's even higher. Programs like Traveling Storytime and Project Read really leverage volunteers to extend our reach. So the five divisions of the library, we do have an administrative unit that handles all of the things that administrative units uh, handle. Um, our children's and teen services and community outreach uh, and engagement team does all of the amazing programs that we put on for youth and makes sure that we are uh, out in the world now that uh, it's getting to be safe to be out in the world connecting with our community again. Um, our customer experience division includes the downtown library customer service staff, as well as some of the behind the scenes folks that order and catalog our materials, um, as well as some of our IT activities. Uh, neighborhood libraries are the staff that uh, provide services at our Shaberg and Redwood Shores branch libraries. And then Project Read provides intergenerational literacy services for uh, youth, and adults and families and inmates at the McGuire Correctional Facility in our community. So next slide, please. Uh, with the transfer of the Fair Oaks branch to the county earlier this year and the elimination of daily overdue fines to remove access barriers for some of our most vulnerable residents, our revenue has gotten to be pretty straightforward, a largely general fund. Um, our grants do actually end up being usually significantly higher than what's shown here by the end of the year. Uh, but this is a baseline state grant for literacy services that we know we will receive. Um, and as noted on the slide, we do also receive significant support each year from the Library Foundation and the Friends of the Library uh, in the construction of the makerspace at the downtown library that's out for bid right now. Uh, city CIP funds will be uh, matched two to one with funds from raised by the Redwood City Library Foundation to support that project. Next slide, please. So after the shutdown in March 2020, like so many of the other departments, we pivoted immediately. Um, we had online story times available within two weeks, followed by drive-through craft pickup kits the following month, curbside pickup of library materials in June, and we just continued to expand and innovate over the entire year to meet the community's needs. Library staff were also involved in helping with a variety of other city efforts, particularly with the Fair Oaks Community Center, rental assistance and food distribution programs, as well as assisting our economic development department with contacting every business in Redwood City to let them know about available benefits. We helped the community with internet connectivity, began implementing our RCPL CARES uh, racial equity plan. Uh, CARES stands for Cultivating and Advancing Racial Equity Systemically. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We eliminated daily overdue fines and did targeted outreach activities uh, during the census to make sure that our community was fully counted. And uh, as we received recognition from the Institute of Museum and Library Services as one of the top 15 public libraries in the United States, which we're justifiably proud of. Uh, next slide, please. In the months ahead, we're planning to safely restore indoor programs and activities, seating, meeting rooms, and many other library functions, while also paying attention to services emerging from the pandemic, like online programs and drive-through activities that we may want to sustain. 
In addition, COVID-19 has strengthened our commitment to addressing some of the challenges that keeps kids from learning, including hunger and mental health issues. I'll talk a little bit more about the makerspace on the next slide. With our library takeover program, we made a really strong effort in the months right before the pandemic to deepen our engagement and our relationship with communities of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus folks, seniors and veterans. And we look forward to focusing on that work as people begin gathering again. I've mentioned our RCPL CARES team. They've developed a work plan for us to enhance our policy and budget development, staff training, programs and events and activities for the community, human resources activities and marketing all approached through the lens of racial equity to make sure that we're being attentive to who benefits and who's burdened by every decision we make in the library. Uh, next slide, please. Going forward, we have our summer learning challenge going strong and we encourage folks of all ages to sign up on our website or by stopping by our libraries. Our new maker space, which will be under construction soon, will give us tools and space to expand our science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics classes for youth, as well as supporting local artists and entrepreneurs. Again, we're looking to integrate the best of what we learned about new service delivery models over the past year with the activities that we want to bring back. The library has done great work we're really proud of to help promote a more inclusive community through our events and services, but we want to continue digging deeper into policy and budget changes that can make true systemic impacts. And we hope to continue to support the city's other strategic priorities. While the library doesn't have a direct impact on housing or transportation matters, we can certainly help inform and engage the community in dialogue about these critical issues facing our community. So I'd like to thank you so much for your time and your support. And I will hand my things off to my partner in so much of this good work, uh, the one and only Chris Beth, Director of Parks, Recreation and Community Services. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. It's always difficult to go after Derek and after all the great things he has to say about the library because the incredible work that he and his team provides the community in the top 15 uh, recognized libraries in the nation. That's amazing. So uh, thank you, Derek. And uh, thank you. Good evening, Mayor Howard, Vice Mayor Hale, City Council members. My name is Chris Beth. Director of the Parks, Recreation, Community Services Department. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a total of about 66 FTEs, just under there, that's full-time equivalent staff of about $19 million. We have a total of eight divisions. I'll provide some quick highlights and we'll go into accomplishments and what we have in store for next year. Uh, for our Parks and Landscape Maintenance Division, it's our largest division. We maintain 37 parks, street medians, with a total of 219 acres citywide. Um, we very much practice uh, green um, efforts and policies of um, water conservation efforts and also no use of glyphosate. So you recognize that more as um, a roundup that we uh, were the first city in the peninsula to eliminate this over three years ago. And we're also actively converting our gas equipment to all electric, including all of our blowers to electric blowers. Our Youth and Teen Services Division um, is one of our largest divisions. We uh, run uh, after school programs in a typical year serving um, just about over 600 children in after school Monday through Friday. Uh, we also oversee the Youth and Teen Advisory Boards as, as well as preschool youth and teen programs, camps, and special events related uh, to families and youth services. Next slide, please. For our Human Services Division, um, all divisions have done an amazing job this past year. And, uh, the Human Services Division at the Fairfax Community Center, especially in our relation to our response to uh, information referral and our rental assistance program, food assistance and homeless services. They do such an incredible job. And they also are partner of the uh, county um, uh, nonprofits, uh, as well as the Fairfax Adult Activity Center and uh, support subsidized child care program at the Fairfax Community Center. For our Senior Community Services Division, um, they also have done an amazing job in response to providing senior meals this past year. Um, they also run uh, senior programs, uh, typically senior clubs, veterans uh, programs, health and wellness focus. Uh, they also liaison to the Senior Affairs Commission and also accessible recreation programs for the community. Next slide, please. For Sports and Aquatics Division, uh, real focus on uh, scheduling um, our fields for multiple number of organizations. In a typical year, we have over 12,000 youth that um, uh, are on our fields throughout the year in, in partnerships with other youth sport groups, run our adult sport leagues, also manage recreational amenity use, rentals, and aquatics programming. 
For a special interest program division, uh, this is the brochure that you typically receive in the mail, all the recreation classes and camp programs. Today was our first day of uh, camps and you'll see a lot more children out in our parks and providing uh, our camp services in uh, multiple uh, parks across the city and uh, selectively inside our community centers. Uh, communication, marketing, customer service, and web social media uh, and uh, public engagement support. Next slide, please. For a special events division this past year, again, a uh, wonderful effort of providing virtual programs, drive-in uh, movies, Zope circus shows at the Port of Revis City. Um, and then we're very excited that uh, come mid-July next month, we will be bringing back programs live to the community. So we're so excited. For our administration division, um, we're focused on not only administration of the department, but uh, public art uh, is a major focus, as well as being liaisons for the uh, Arts Commission and the Parks, Recreation, and Community Services Commission, in addition to our park and playground design efforts. Next slide, please. Um, here it just gives you an overview. Um, this um, you'll see in I think future years, um, the pie chart increases for our recreation revenue, rentals and leases and grants, um, uh, particularly in our recreation revenue and rentals and leases, just because of COVID and some closures and restructuring our programs, uh, we were limited to uh, this. And typically you'll see it, this grow um, probably another a third to two thirds. Uh, next slide, please. For accomplishments, uh, again, amazing staff. I want to thank my, my team who worked so hard. Um, we are very proud of uh, completing the Magical Bridge Playground uh, this past year. Um, and also, uh, again, serving over 105,000 uh, free senior meals. Uh, just an extraordinary effort. Um, over at the Fairfax Community Center, I mentioned providing over $3.3 million in COVID rent relief providing homeless services, food, rental assistance, and other support services to over 6,000 individuals and over 2,500 households this past year. It just shows you the great need that we have in our community. Um, Want to also recognize the effort of um, still connecting with seniors virtually as our center was closed. Uh, you see we provided that as well as uh, health and wellness drive up services. We've hosted again uh, about 150 COVID safe drive in events at the Port of Rip uh, Redmond City. I want to thank the port for an incredible partnership. Uh, we provided school day support. Uh, that was unusual. We moved our after school programs into school day support uh, for those students that needed internet service and uh, extra uh, supervision uh, while teachers who were providing uh, lessons during the school day, uh, as well as childcare uh, during the pandemic. Um, we provided uh, safe in-person summer programs this past year, as well as hosted a, a distant learning programs um, and virtual programs. And we are um, completed the Pirate Ship Imagination Space Design and look forward to starting construction this year. Next slide, please. For service delivery, um, we um, found a, a number of homebound seniors who needed and depended uh, on uh, a meal program. And so we're gonna continue uh, providing a hybrid program of homebound senior meal delivery, as well as bringing in-person meal service back to the Veterans Memorial Senior Center when we open later this summer. Uh, we are, again, mentioned, just provided our first day at camp and we expect over 2000 youth to be participating. So people are back and parents are happy and so are the kids. Uh, we're going to be launching our Youth and Teen Advisory Board initiatives um, and also have a lens of our equity analysis for our youth and teen services. Uh, we offer, um, again, both in-person remote options uh, for the pandemic recovery and safety net services at the Fairfax Community Center, continuing rental assistance services, and expand homeless outreach. Next slide, please. And further, uh, we're going to be engaging community partners to connect community members to recovery and safety net services. Um, I mentioned we're going to be resuming in-person special events. Um, we're going to have eight-week series of both the uh, concerts, um, both at Stafford Park, uh, downtown for the movies and downtown concerts, and as well as a couple of concerts in Redwood Shores. Uh, we're going to be resuming in-person after-school programs on six campuses. Completing the racial equity mural, our first meeting is this Wednesday. So please sign up if you um, just go ahead and research that on the city's website, you can uh, look at how to participate. We're gonna be launching our downtown parks community outreach and planning. And again, uh, beginning construction of the new Veterans Memorial Building Senior Center, which we're very excited. Next slide, please. And with that, um, please to hand this off to Chief Dan Bolin. Thank you. Thank you, Director Beth. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Howard, Vice Mayor Hale, 
uh, members of the Redwood City community. My name is uh, Dan Mulholland. I am your police chief. And tonight I will be presenting the Redwood City Police Department's uh, budget presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, the Redwood City Police Department is comprised, when at full strength, of 121 uh, full-time employees. Those employees are divided up into three divisions within the Redwood City Police Department. The largest of those uh, three divisions is our Uniform Patrol Division. Uh, that's comprised of uh, 74 FTEs uh, with an operating budget of uh, just under uh, $30 million. And these uh, are the most visible component uh, of the Res uh, Redwood City Police Department. These are uniformed uh, personnel uh, assigned to patrol, assigned to traffic enforcement, uh, working in our downtown services unit, uh, or conducting parking enforcement in Redwood City. They're responsible for responding to emergency and non-emergency calls for service. And their primary responsibilities are order maintenance, uh, community safety, and crime prevention. Uh, the next division within the Redwood City Police Department is our investigations division. Uh, it's comprised of 20 full-time law enforcement uh, and uh, both sworn staff and professional staff law enforcement uh, employees. They have an operating budget of $7.3 million. And these are our investigative personnel, our detectives, our street crime uh, uh, suppression team, our juvenile services uh, personnel, um, our narcotics enforcement personnel, and our property and evidence enforcement personnel. They respond to uh, call-outs uh, to support uh, patrol operations. They conduct uh, criminal investigations. They identify crime trends and develop uh, intelligence information that's then uh, used to provide uh, enhanced uh, patrol services to our uh, police department personnel. Next slide, please. Next is our administrative services division. It's comprised of 27 uh, full-time employees. It's got an operating budget of $15.3 million. And this is really the business side of the Redwood City Police Department. It provides that administrative support uh, to our police personnel. It includes the executive staff, our administrative staff, um, our training units, our communications uh, center, or, or which is uh, where our uh, dispatch personnel work and also our records processing or records uh, unit within the police department. Our administrative services division is responsible for policy development, budget preparation and oversight, um, training and professional standards, as well as recruiting and hiring. Next slide, please. This is an example, or this demonstrates uh, where the money comes from for the police department. As you can see, the vast majority uh, of the funding for the Redwood City Police Department comes from our uh, general fund. There are lesser uh, funds as well uh, that uh, support department operations, including internal services, a parking fund, uh, can uh, cannabis business, as well as uh, COPS uh, grant funding opportunities. Next slide. We. Uh, are quite happy to, to celebrate a number of uh, key accomplishments within the police department for the last fiscal year. Uh, most notably was our work with other uh, city departments to uh, develop a pandemic response uh, plan and our recovery plan. Uh, our police department operations basically uh, pivoted uh, overnight and uh, transitioned uh, to um, a, a model of policing during a pandemic where we can continue to provide that continuity of service uh, to the Redwood City community uh, really within uh, 24, 48 hours. Uh, we were continuing our operations uh, without interruption. In, that, in addition to that, we supported our brothers and sisters in public safety service uh, at the Redwood City uh, Fire Department and uh, other fire departments and police departments in the, the greater Bay Area and in our region, uh, responding to statewide uh, wildland fires, most notably within San Mateo County, the uh, CZU Lightning Complex fire. We also developed and, main, uh, and maintained a parking enforcement uh, program uh, to implement within uh, our residential parking permit areas. Uh, we engaged in a, a number of community listening sessions to help us better understand what the community's expectations are uh, as far as delivery of public safety service and what the community was, was uh, interested in, in uh, having uh, your police department uh, provide services to you. Um, and we also significantly increased the number uh, or the amount of public information um, that was brought forward to the community regarding our police policies and the activities and uh, the different guiding principles that, that help direct our, our operation uh, at the police department. Next slide. 
And looking forward to the next fiscal year, we're very excited about the Community Wellness and Crisis Response Team program. It, it's uh, and how it's going to evolve over the next two years of the program. Uh, that's a wonderful partnership with uh, three other uh, uh, cities within the San Mateo County area and also the County of San Mateo itself. Um, in two days time, we'll have our first meeting with the uh, Police Advisory Committee. Um, I very much look forward to being part of that uh, committee where we get to hear directly from our uh, community uh, participants uh, on that uh, committee and I get to uh, engage with them, talk to them more about our police department, what we do to serve this community and receive feedback from that uh, committee to better understand their expectations uh, for police service uh, in the community of Redwood City. We're very close to implementing our body-worn camera program. As a matter of fact, right now, it's in a beta test phase. We have a number of officers that are deploying with the cameras uh, on a test basis. Uh, we have additional training that's coming up uh, within the next two weeks, and we will have uh, a deployment by uh, the end of this month, followed by uh, additional uh, personnel being equipped with the cameras we anticipate uh, towards uh, the middle of the fiscal year. Uh, we're also exploring um, how we can enhance uh, our camera system with the vehicle mounted uh, system. So that'll take place during uh, fiscal year 21-22 as well. Um, we look forward to collaborating with other city departments to consider how we can further uh, deliver services to um, our underserved members and our unhoused members of our community. And we'll be exploring those options as we move forward in the year. And also really how we can become even uh, more transparent as an organization and more accountable uh, to our community. We've got a great start going now with some of the online uh, web-based portals that uh, you can see our, um, how we operate uh, at the police department. You can view our policies, but also there'll be additional reporting requirements that'll take place after the first of the year. We'll start reporting uh, information relevant to Racial Identi Identity Profiling Act and uh, that data collection will begin after the first of the year. Next slide, please. I thank you uh, for the opportunity to present to you tonight. That concludes my presentation, and I will now uh, turn it over to uh, Terrence Chaw for the Public Works Services presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Terrence Chaw, Director of Public Works. Next slide, please. Public Works consists of five divisions. In Water Division, we have an 18.44 full-time employee and their operating budget are $29.3 million. The majority of budget is used for purchase of the water. The division manage entire water distribution system for the community. Staff from the division respond all water-related service call 24-7, 365 days per year. Another division I wanted to introduce is Recycle Water Division. It has 15.21 FTE, an operating budget of $9.3 million. Similar to Water Division, this division managed the entire recycled water distribution system. Rebel City Recycled Water is produced as Silicon Valley Clean Water Treatment Plan and distributed for irrigation and indoor toilet flushing in institution and commercial facilities. This division also manage water meter related duties and water conservation programs. Next slide, please. Public Works Wastewater Division has a 21.5 FTE with operating budget of $35 million. The division manage sewer collection system for Redwood City in several sewer districts surrounding the city. It also managed stormwater management for the city. During the winter months, this is the division distribute sandbags and response all storm related calls. In summer months, stuff clean and maintain creeks and canals. The right away division of the department has a 15.55 FTE with operating budget on $8.3 million. This is a division that the most visible from the community since that this division responsible for streets, tree, sidewalks, street lights, and traffic signals. Additionally, this division manage city solid waste collection services. Next slide, please. The last division I would like to introduce is fleet, facility, and custodial division. Although this division is 
mostly served for the city operation. It has 30.82 FTE with operating budget on $9.4 million. The division managed city fleets, facility, as well as providing fleet services to neighboring governmental agency. Next slide, please. As you can see on the pie chart, majority of funding for the public works coming from enterprise fund, internal service fund, and special district funds. Next slide, please. I am proud to highlight the department accomplishment in the last fiscal year. We were at the forefront of managing supply logistics for the COVID-19 pandemic. We updated HVAC system for the city facility to manage airborne bacteria. We also updated the city climate action plan to reduce greenhouse gas, em uh, re greenhouse gas emission reduction and introduce environmentally preferred purchasing policy, also known as green purchasing policy. To promote a safe walking, we had met the goal of repair and replacement of over 1,400 sidewalk locations. To protect the clean water in the bay, we have performed over 260 stormwater inspection for the businesses. Next slide, please. This and next slide will highlight service delivery of the department. We continuously working on employee security and public safety enhancement at city facility, which include improving on the HVAC system. We continuously replacing smart water meter for efficiency and water conservation. Working with various local and regional partners to identify potential new water supplies, mainly in groundwater in the recycled water reuse. We are converting paperless process whenever possible in line with city climate action goals. Next slide, please. We are engaging with the various community group for equity-based sidewalk replacement program. We are also renovating a federal community center to support children and senior services. We are continuously working on the green earth fleet and continuously supporting the underrepresented communities such as mobile home parks. This concludes public works portion of the presentation. Thank you. I will now turn it back over to the city manager. Thank you very much, TK. And my thanks to all of the department heads for their presentations. So as we move into the final slides, as we've talked about a few times over the course of the year, we're going through a time when we are experiencing multiple crises. And some of those are listed here. We've talked many times, you've heard a lot now about our pandemic response and recovery. We're experiencing a time of heightened attention related to racial injustice and inequity. We last summer experienced unprecedented wildfires, expect those to continue this summer. And we're going through uh, a difficult time with great political divisiveness and civic distrust. As we look at all of these things together, we will have a number of recommendations regarding the use of one-time funds to help support the city and the community and the city council's priorities in addressing these many crises and priorities. Starting first with our pandemic response and recovery strategy, the recommended budget includes funding to support each element of our strategy. We've discussed the respond and the restore activities earlier this year, and particularly rental assistance and other assistance programs. So now I really will focus primarily on the reimagining work that is underway, but will be more substantially advanced in the coming year. With public safety representing more than half of our general fund operating budget, it's essential to consider how public safety services may evolve. The City Council has already allocated funds for a pilot program to support those in mental health crisis. And the recommended budget recommends $150,000 toward a standards of cover study and strategic planning support for the fire department. This will help us to ensure that the city is well positioned to support current and future community needs related to fire and emergency services based on best practices and financial responsibility. Reimagining services requires greater analytical capacity, and the recommended budget includes $1.8 million over two years to fund management fellow positions or contract support in several city departments. This will help us conduct research, support redesign of policies and practices, and new programs. A portion of this funding would also help support city real estate management. 
One-time funds would also be used for several non-pandemic city council priorities. And I won't review each of these, but certainly can return to the slides if you have questions. I'd call out that earlier this year, we heard community concerns regarding pedestrian mobility and the recommended budget directs half a million dollars to expedite implementation of the city's Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan. This includes curb cuts and other infrastructure improvements. The recommended budget also recommends a million dollars over two years to increase funding for sidewalk repairs. Additionally, the recommended budget funds the homelessness related initiatives discussed with the City Council in May, including engaging civilian outreach workers and extending the successful downtown streets program. Proposed one time funding would help us leverage new federal and state funds related to transportation and would also help us support families through increased child care, as well as learning loss programs, including Project READ. One-time funds can help us make progress on sustainability initiatives, which reduce emissions, improve safety, and reduce city costs. We also recommend additional funds to, to address fire risks through increased vegetation management. And finally, the recommended budget includes funds to support communications and help us to transition effectively to hybrid city council meetings. So now, finally, I want to thank you for your patience with this lengthy presentation. We now will turn the study session over to you, City Council, to see if you have questions or feedback related to department operations, to the recommended use of one-time funds to support City Council priorities or any other aspect of the budget. As we close, I would like to extend a special thanks to our budget team this year. That includes Michelle Poche flaherty Derek Rampone, Jennifer Yamaguma, Sylvia Peters, Serena Gregorio, Deanna LaCroix, Nancy Murgia, and Teresa Yee. They have done terrific work under challenging circumstances, and I really appreciate their efforts. This concludes the staff presentation, and I'll be happy to return the meeting over to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Diaz. Uh, I also want to express my sincere thanks to the budget team. A very, very good report. Every, every report I read was pretty clear, and I really appreciated just coming back to restoring, responding, and reimagining uh, how we're going to go into the future and, and bringing everything back to that. So I, I really want to thank the team and department heads and staff for all working so closely together. So this is the time uh, that, as we said, this is a study session, and uh, this is the time for our city council to ask questions or to make comments. And I see hand raised for council member ready. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor, and my goodness, thank you so much to staff. Um, I appreciate so much um, the opportunity for you to add accomplishments to the budget conversation. I think it's really valuable for our community to just um, be exposed to the amazing work that our staff does during the year and to be able to attach that to the budget that we're going to be talking about. Um, I too thank you for the the, the budget itself and um, helping me um, better understand the budget and and it was it was very well um, very well done and I appreciate that. Um, one question I have and it's something related to something that will be asked later. Um, the, oh, one, I do support the, the use of all the recommendations for the one-time funds and, and thank you for that recommendation um, because they're ones that I, um, as many of you know, I really care about. Um, I would like to know how much was spent last year on the uh, forgiveness, um, the, the utility bill forgiveness program. So we actually have not launched that program yet. Um, you okay. may recall that the city council has um, directed that we not shut off utilities and that we not charge penalties um, during this pandemic time. And so that, that will continue through later this year. Um, and so our intention is to bring back a proposal regarding utility bill forgiveness um, 
as we enter into a more traditional time of uh, more normal operations. Um, but I also see Terrence may have some something to add. Thank you, Melissa. I just wanted to add that uh, during that pandemic, City Council uh, voted on to waiving fees and interest for late and delinquent utility uh, bills. So at this point, city is spending average 10 to $20,000 each month for waiving the delinquent uh, bill for fines and interest rate. I just wanted to add on to. Thank you. And that's actually what I was, I was confusing that with forgiveness. And so thank you for clarifying that because I did remember that we were waiving those funds and I remember that it cost something, but I couldn't remember what it was. So thank you so much for that clarification. And um, because it's going to be, uh, it's part of a conversation later, um, will the sewer uh, be part of that forgiveness bill later, even though the bill is going to the uh, county? might be going to the county. Mr. Jaw, did you want to answer that now or did you want to have the discussion after? Sure, sure Mayor Howard, I can answer it for now. As always, even though sewer bills will be possibly uh, building through the county property tax roll, this, the entire sewer enterprise is managed by the city or Redwood City. So the, any other forgiveness program will include sewer bill also. Thank you. I thought that was an important point to make and I appreciate your uh, clarifying that. Thank you so much. Those are all my questions. And again, thank you so much to staff. Amazing. Thank you, Council Member Reddy. Council Member Espinoza Garnica. Hi there, folks. Um, I'd like to make some of my comments um, First, starting off with my compliments to y'all. I really enjoyed reading the, the book uh, or the budget overview. Um, it seemed very accessible. It was nice to see some of the things that we talked about um, in February come up in our book, uh, especially you know, related to homelessness initiatives. So you know, I'm really pleased to see those works um, or those priorities in our, in our budget. Um, as someone who'd like to reimagine more of our, how we do our services and, and especially public safety. I was hoping to see, um, you know, more services reallocated from our police. And I was hoping to see something um, go further, such as trying to, um, I would like to see something like moving transportation um, issues such as like traffic enforcement and, um, and parking enforcement to go under the Department of Transportation. That would be one of my recommendations. I would like for us to approach this as like evidence-based. Um, the you know the way we address this should be evidence-based and also um, you know following the steps to to do what was recommended to us in other reports like the Stanford report we commissioned that we you know decrease the footprint of law enforcement. So I was really hoping to see that we would um, cut down further on the police budget. So I would like to see something like that happen. Uh, I know that we currently have a freeze. So looking into, you know, uh, permanently, permanently removing positions that are uh, essential, um, I'd be in favor of, you know, ending programs like our involvement with like funding of the SRO programs and, um, and such like that. So we can focus on funding things that actually prevent harm, because as we know, most, most of this um, harm reduction is attributable to things not related to law enforcement. So having more community resources, if we had more funding to Prex and Rec, so um, there wasn't such a long wait list for students to participate in after school activities um, or their programmings and making things much more accessible. Um, it could be even to provide relief for small businesses and such like that. I would really like to see things um, be thought more creatively. Um, the goal I, sh I have is to try and, you know, remove police from, from, you know, the city because policing itself hasn't really been like a big actor of change in a positive way. It's been a historically you know, it comes from the slave trade from as slave patrols 
you know, enforcing the war on drugs, war on terror. So I would really like for us to be very uh, transparent about that, um, especially knowing that very uh, few calls to police are for like very serious crimes, like about 2% in the, in the, in the chart that Chief Mulholland shared with us um, when we met with his, with him. Um, it seemed about 2% of calls was for the most ex like severe crimes. So I think there's a lot of money still going to the police. I was hoping to have less money and have more like things to tie in to directly. Um, especially since not a lot of the cases that they're dealing with is were the most serious offenses. So I would like for us to think about creative ways to fund um, the community rather than through the police because um, there's just no real result. There's no real data that shows that the police are successfully keeping us safe other than disappearing people. Our data is still coming out. Police data doesn't really get published. And so in the next couple of years, because of the state, we'll have to publish more data. But data so far shows that there's not that much to prove that they are actually keeping us healthy and safe. So, um, oh, and other things like looking at, at the budget to be more of a program-based listing, because I would like to see items like how much do we spend on tasers? How much do we spend on, um, you know, these examples of less lethal force? Uh, because I'd like us to move away from having an armed, like arming all of our officers. If anyone's armed, it should be like a small specialized group. So being very like mindful of how we do crowd control and, um, and not militarizing our police when they're interacting with them. So having disarmed police officers, not allowing less lethal weapons on them, um, you know, and just following others' examples like the anti-terror police project in Oakland would be a great start um, on things we should do in Redwood City to make it safer. Um, so yeah, I'd hope that we have more like itemized things so we can see how much we're paying for public relations, for PR for the police, how much we're paying for, um, for all of this. So we could really know what we're, we're paying into and then we can actually do something like get like a separate 911 like hotline dispatcher for mental health calls and actually fund the like mental health pilot program differently um, with non police officers, such and such and such. But those are my thoughts very much focus on um, how we can actually have funding be meaningful and um, backed up by research because as it is now, I don't think we have any data to support the amount we spend on policing. Um, and I think this is a very large amount and we should consider um, a lot more cuts, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Espinoza Garnica. And uh, I, I know some of your questions, I'm sure uh, the Chief, uh, Chief Mulholland is, uh, would be happy to get back to you to answer some of your questions or uh, give you more itemized information as you requested. Uh, Council Member G. Let's see here, there we go. Thank you, Mayor Howard and um, our city manager. Thank you and the entire department, city team for a very thorough presentation. Um, I'm going to save my comments to the very end. I'd like to listen to the public comment, but I had two questions or just two comments about the presentation. I think every single department is launching either new um, computer initiatives, software initiatives, or at least has gone virtual programming. So my question to the city manager is, are we investing enough in cybersecurity? Um, and one of the dynamics and one of the sort of rules that we're given to minimize cybersecurity is never open an email from someone you don't know who it's from, but we don't get to do that in the public sector. Um, and so just want to make sure that we're adequately staffing our IT department for cybersecurity and taking the right steps to make sure our networks are protected. The other comment is for Chief Iverson, and Chief Iverson, I don't expect you to answer it being you know, new, but one of the ongoing conversations in the community that I wasn't really um, didn't hear too much about and hope that you can take a look at as you get your feet um, in Redwood City, and again, welcome to Redwood City, 
is the CERT program and how we might reimagine that or re visualize that uh, going forward. Uh, so those are two things that caught my attention, both in making sure that our networks are protected and that we take a look at our CERT program and how that plays in our community. Thank you, Mayor Howard. And I'll, I'll have some final comments at the very end. Okay, well, actually we were going to take all the council and then the nope, public you comment. all the com comments yeah. now? Okay, <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to keep going. We're trying to be efficient with the time, but okay. if, if you wouldn't mind sure. and you are ready. No, I'm, I'm happy to go, go ahead. Um, um, no, I, I appreciate the budget presentation. I appreciate the philosophy of one-time money for one-time expenses. Um, I think that is very, very uh, sound financial um, foundation. I appreciate the support of the initiatives from the council priorities. Um, the hardest thing for me and, and having come back to council and is something that I've been an advocate for is one of the things that was disappointing in the budget presentation is in spite of all the hard work of the council and staff, our unfunded pension liabilities keep going up. And, and that is a tough one for us to figure out. You know, the, the team, the city has responded fantastic to the, the pandemic. I hope there's not a 2.0 out there in the future. But to see the numbers on our unfunded pension liability and other pension liabilities go up in spite of all the hard work, it's just absolutely frustrating. And to see the graph in the report about how much CalPERS is relying on return on investment over, I think it's 55%, um, it's just unrealistic on a sustainable ongoing basis. And so any change that 7%, and I, you know, former mayor and council member Jeff Fire and I, we used to talk about what a real number should be, and it was probably closer to 5%, if not lower, that would just have a devastating impact on the liability and on the financial sustainability of all cities in California. So there's still hard work to do in front. I know there's a lot of conversations about other departments, but that number is very real, or those two numbers are very real and won't go away. And in the foreseeable future, aren't gonna get any better um, that we just have, have a lot more hard work in front of us to figure that out along with our partners in Sacramento and wherever they may be to get our arms around that. So those are my comments. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Well, thank you, Council Member G. I couldn't agree with you more about our pension liability. Thank you for highlighting that difficult problem. Uh, can, oh, uh, Ms. Stevenson Diaz, would you like to add to what uh, Council Member G said? I can just briefly respond to the, the two questions he raised in terms of um, cybersecurity initiatives. And I wanted to particularly note there was a report by the civil grand jury last year um, on these questions uh, for, for public agencies. And we had a number of recommended actions that we are following up on, um, including audits of our efforts. And you as council members have been subject to, to more training uh, as have our employees re regarding um, providing our um, security of our our computer assets and, and systems. And so that is definitely on our mind. And at this point we feel sufficiently staffed, but we will know more as we complete that audit. And I might just briefly mention regarding um, the CERT program. Um, I'm not sure yet if, if Chief Iverson has uh, had a chance to, to dive into this, but um, we are in the process of looking at a shift in how we contract for that program, um, shifting likely to an agreement with the city of San Carlos and um, being able this year, hopefully, to be able to return to in-person training that has been so effective for that program this, this past year has just not been good for, for being able to offer that. Thank you. Thank you. And I know there'll be more to come about the CERT training. So thank you for, for answering that. Council Member Smith. Yes, thanks again, Mayor Howard. I appreciate it. Um, I'd just like to start off by saying, um, you know, what a wonderful staff. Um, that we have. Um, the accomplishments that the city staff has been able to produce over the last 12 months have been nothing short of remarkable given the circumstances that they had to deal with. Um, and I continue to be impressed, um, including with the materials that were presented here tonight. I would just, you know, say, keep up the hard work, keep up the good work. Um, you know, we're counting on you um, as residents of Redwood City. Um, and again, just really want to say kudos there. 
Um, I do have a few questions um, and then I'll go into comments. So putting all of kind of the am amazing, important city work aside for a moment, um, I do have a few questions about number one, the framing of the budget and then specific elements of the budget that I just don't feel like I have incredible insight into. And what I mean by the framing of the budget is this, um, I'm kind of wondering what, from a kind of a narrative perspective, the, the city staff um, believes that this budget is. Is it a conservative budget? Is it a middle of the road budget? Is it an aggressive budget? Um, and the reason I'm asking that is because my specific questions are about, um, well, three things. So the first thing is, um, I believe in a finance subcommittee meeting, we learned, or I learned that there was approximately $360 million that are in the markets right now. Seemingly most of them are earmarked for programs um, that are to take place in the future. I, I never got a sense of, you know, whether that number was accurate, whether it was mostly apportioned to pre-funded projects, but I guess I'm just trying to understand what is happening with that money? What, what is the commitment of it? And what is the flexibility with that large sum of, mar of money in the markets currently? So that's my first question. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. And maybe if someone wants to kind of provide a little bit of background on that, I would appreciate it. Sure, I'll be happy to start with that and then invite uh, Michelle or, or perhaps Derek to add on to that. So, this is um, a bit subjective, um, but I would say based on my, my past experience here and in other communities, I would consider our budget largely um, financially responsible and conservative from the standpoint of using best practices to plan for future expenses and to set aside money before we need to, to spend it on programs. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say, based on city council direction, a lot of the priorities that you, you as a council have articulated towards prioritizing vulnerable residents, toward looking at, at equity, I would consider, consider those as advancing more progressive political and policy issues. So. So the budget's some of both. It, it's attempting to both um, manage funding in a way that is sustainable and uh, defensible and plans for the long term, but also responding to immediate needs and, and policy initiatives that, that this council um, has established. Um, and then in terms of the investment funds and um, their, their flexibility, I'd ask Michelle if she would like to add some additional comments about that. Thank you, and thank you, Council Member Smith, for the question. Um, it, we we were aware that you were interested in that uh, based on our, our recent conversation about investments, and we're in the process of actually pulling together for you a list of exactly uh, what the sources of funds are for those investments, so that you can see a general breakdown of um, where the money comes from and why it's spoken for and it's being held by the city until it's ready to be expended. And while we're holding it, we invest it um, as, as part of our financial strategy. And I'm looking at Derek to see if he has anything he wants to add to that, because I know he's doing the research for me. Nothing to add at this time. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, to kind of circle back to a point that uh, City Manager Diaz was mentioning, um, you know, truly what I was kind of trying to get at in terms of the um, framing of the budget, it was not necessarily its political orientation per se, but more of its FP&A um, orientation. And so, you know, are we, you know, being less aggressive in programmatic spending because we're interested in servicing debt at a higher level to kind of drive down, um, you know, interest rate accruals or costs. I mean, so, so that was a little bit of where I was going. And, and I want to follow on to that by asking about this section 115 trust. And the reason I'm ask, asking about that, um, of course, you know, our unfunded pension liabilities are, you know, critically important for the larger strategy of the, uh, of the city. However, as uh, council member G mentioned, we're not making a lot of headway despite the activity that we're taking. And um, 
I'm bringing that up to say that if we are putting in theory over 1.5 million or some or so into this trust on a per annum basis, but we're not really experiencing any value, frankly, um, from the uh, addition of that, those additional general fund dollars, what is the rationale behind maintaining the section 15, uh, 115 trust, especially um, and especially this year with the COVID kind of dynamic that is still looming over our heads now? Thank you. Um, great question. I'll ask Derek in a moment to refresh my memory on the, the most recent returns on that. Um, so the concept with the trust is we have been looking to fund our pension obligations in, in kind of three ways. There's the minimum amount that cities have to pay every year that's set by PERS, and we've done that forever. Um, we have been making additional payments directly to PERS, which helps to lower the um, amount that they might ask us to fund in the future. And then we have also been setting money aside in a trust that can be invested, can gain some returns, and that we can then turn to in the future to marry up with our general fund to make payments at a time when the pension costs, the annual costs spike up even more than they are now. Um, the, the reason uh, for doing that now is we know that we have these rising costs. We know they are not optional. Um, and it, we can either you know, just let them eat up more and more of our operating budget and crowd out services in the future for future generations, or we can attempt to um, fund those obligations now. These are commitments we've made to former employees, um, people already retired who have already done their service for the city. There's, residents have already received the benefit of that service, but we still owe them money, you know, as long as they're living. Most of our obligations are related to people already retired and on fixed income. They're not related to current employees. And, and so the rationale is if we don't uh, pay for those obligations, um, we will not in the future, in, in the future, we will not be able to pay for the current array of services we have now. So that's why we're trying to fully fund those obligations. I, I, and I appreciate that clarification. I, I, I'm not at all suggesting that we don't pay for the responsibilities we have for our retired uh, service folks. Um, that th That's not the direction I'm going in. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is from a section uh, 115 trust perspective, is this a standard for similarly situated cities? What if any, kind of benefits us apart from the kind of general fund funding of the unfunded pension liabilities do we get, especially again, because in theory, I would think that that, that trust, those trust returns are modest as well, right? I mean, I, I don't know what the, the, re the returns are for those section 15, uh, 115 trust dollars, but I would assume it would be around four to 7% as well. And so, you know, is the value that we're getting with this trust, again, like, Number one, is it comparable to other cities? But also when we think about it from a cost benefit perspective or, a, or an opportunity cost perspective rather, um, could we be doing more with that money today rather than putting it at a trust waiting for modest returns to undercut future payments to the retirement um, obligations that we have? So maybe I'll call on Derek and ask him to um, provide some more insight into that. Thank you very much, Derek Rampone, your financial services manager. Thanks for having me. Uh, a couple of things I just want to mention, Council Member Smith, is the money that's in the Section 115 trust um, is not counted against our liabilities. Uh, GASB and CalPERS doesn't consider that to, as an asset, even though it's set aside in a trust and is not touchable, is only can be used for pension costs. Um, so when you look at those uh, long-term liabilities, we would have to deduct the money that's sitting in the Section 115 trust um, that's that's available uh, for a future contribution. So just want to keep that in mind that they, that's why, you know, the liability may be increasing, even though while we are putting additional money into the Section 115 trust. Another thing is just to keep in mind is the CalPERS numbers are two years in arrears. So they're, you know, they're a little bit outdated by the time we get the information. Um, we're currently, not we, CalPERS is currently experiencing about a 15% return this year. Um, and our Section 15 trust is, uh, I believe is keeping up with those, those earnings as well. Um, and so we will have more money, obviously, in the, in the trust as time goes on. Um, 
but so hopefully that answers some of your questions. If you have anything more specific, I'd be glad to answer it. Um, but there's two, those are two nuances, I think, just to keep in mind. And if you could just maybe quickly state the, the expected returns for our general investment, because the, the trust has a much different investment strategy than our general investment pool does. Correct. Um, our general investment pool is right now earning uh, just over 1%. So it's, it's obviously uh, very safe and, and very liquid. Um, but that's at our current earnings. It's, it's fallen quite a, quite a bit the last year. And you said the trust earns what? What, what is the return on the trust? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can look it up. I know CalPERS this fiscal year has earned about 15%. So if you give me a couple minutes, I will look it up. Okay. For I, I mean, I can move on. Um, I, I don't want to take up too much more time because I realize I'm, I'm taking up a little bit of time. You have a lot more to do. Um, I went down this line of kind of commentary because um, I have, and I've communicated this to several of uh, the city staff over the past few months. Um, I have deep interest in understanding the rationale um, of the budget process within Redwood City, especially as it relates to uh, the provision of certain services and programs um, within the consideration of basically debt obligations that we're associated with. Now we have an excellent credit rating. Um, you know, we have, you know, a really healthy reserve. I understand the need to be from a fiscal perspective um, prudent, but I don't want us to be overly conservative to the point where we're not um, undertaking projects and programs that could be very value additive to the community. And I would I, I'm thinking about that specifically within the context of the one-time funds. And one of the things that really stood out to me was um, the funding for equity and inclusion. Um, I'm seeing that there's only a one-time kind of bullet payment of $350,000. I would imagine that that could be amended in future budgetary processes. But again, I kind of come back to this, you know, 7.3 million is a fair amount. But when I think about it across all of these initiatives, I really just don't think that it's enough. And I would really love to see us ratchet that up. Um, again, I don't want, I have no interest in putting the city in financial jeopardy, but we're in a, an excellent financial position thanks to your incredible work. Um, and so we should kind of figure out how we can make that excellent financial position work for everyone in the community. So that, those are my comments. I wanna thank you again for everything. And um, Derek, if you have that information, you, know, you can send it to me offline or, or whatever, but thanks a lot, everyone, bye. I actually did just get it. If you, if I'd like to mention, the last year we've earned twenty point nine percent from March, uh, April of twenty twenty to March of twenty one. So, we're did a you, bit um, do you know what was the year before? What was the year prior? Did you do you have that? Uh, I have to look that up. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah twenty twenty was a strange year for return. Yeah. So, <laughs> for sure, I'll get that. I'll send that to you. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Vice Mayor Hale. Thank you. Um, and thanks to my colleagues. It's always great to hear the line of focus uh, and questioning um, that you each take. So I appreciate that. I wanted to uh, spend a little bit more time on, um, on equity. I also wanted to say thank you to staff for this presentation. This was a unique format, something we wanted to try uh, differently uh, to uh, get a little bit deeper look um, than we have done in past study sessions on the budget. So I hope that that was helpful uh, for everybody. And it was, I certainly found it helpful. Um, when we did our strategic plan last go round, I, I thought city staff did a really incredible job in pivoting every department, every, every commission was, how are you meeting these three strategic goals that the council had outlined? And I, I still don't feel like we're, we're there yet on equity. Um, you know, when I think about the presentations I just saw, it's hard to pinpoint what, what did we stop and what did we start as a result of that additional guiding principle. And that's something that I would like to better understand. Um, we've certainly heard from some members of the public, some of my colleagues on a desire to see um, more change and I guess my question, my first question is, 
will the Social Justice and Equity Commission Committee, will they be creating recommendations with budgetary impacts? Do we anticipate that? So just as a starting point, I, the intention for the committee is for them to develop an equity work plan to the council in August. And so it's to be determined what, what that will look like. Um, it could be that they suggest um, initiatives that would have budget impact and the rest of the council decide if that's something that, that you want to proceed with. So um, very much in that discussion process with the committee and um, Michelle is one of the staff to that committee. Looks like she has some more to add. Thank you and thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that we've been grappling with is in addition to committing resources toward explicit programs that are equity oriented like a utility forgiveness program and rental assistance and things like that um, a lot of what we anticipate the equity program will involve may be changing how we do our work mm -hmm. and so some of that may not have a budget uh, directly associated with it it will be shifting the nature of prioritization and things like that and how we do outreach differently we still do outreach but we do it differently perhaps so a lot of it may show up in changing how we do our work which may be less easy to trace as a as a budget commitment uh, but of course uh as melissa reviewed in, in the introduction there's a lot in there that is equity focused as well and that's that's fine um i just wanted to make sure that there was nothing um hands off about it that they were able to make recommendations that are also of of a budget of a budgetary impact including not new programming including sometimes that how could mean changes to the budget is that accurate or is that not a part of their scope i think we're still assessing what what would make sense for them to recommend to you so it's it's a little early for me to tell they've, they've met twice and and they're forming what what they want to recommend as a plan we've been looking at examples of equity plans from other communities that have been you know on this journey longer and some of those plans have very defined statements about what equity means that's something we would benefit from that we've not yet developed um, some of those communities have very defined metrics around specific goals uh, again work that we have not yet done so we are on the train but we are we're not there yet so it's it's hard for me to project i i see i guess for me personally that that was my intent in forming this committee is you know you, you need to have that working group that can go and take these these ideas from council, the feedback, and make it into something uh, that we can all react to and say, right direction, wrong direction, let's resource it, let's not resource it. But that's really what we need from this group. And I think that um, uh, it can, it, it's really important and I hope that it's really rewarding for the committee members, um, but I feel I feel we are relying on that as a council um, in terms of what are the ideas, what, what could be actioned here. Um, I'm gonna make just a few comments because I know we're really running already short on time with a very packed agenda, but um, uh, prior to COVID, we did have a robust work stream going on new revenue sources. Um, I think coming off of Councilmember G's uh, remarks around uh, pension liabilities, just a good reminder that I don't know where we are in, in revisiting that list. Um, I know we're actioning part of the list with the uh, cannabis retail program, but you know what else? What else is there? Um, not just cuts, but also looking for new funding sources uh, as well as efficiencies. Um, I'm happy to see the continued investment, of course, in homeless services, which I think of as something that also started in committee as a solvable problem and, and came out and is doing a lot of the work that it set out to do. So I very much believe in that model, and, and that's why I'm so bullish on it for social justice and equity as well. Uh, particip participatory budgeting got a very short mention, but I think that is a very important program and very innovative, um, what I would consider to be a more progressive policy because it really puts a lot of the decision-making uh, into people's hands and uh, having to help us think about what are, what are the programs that we've not yet thought through that we should be considering. So I'm really excited about that. And then um, getting the technology to support hybrid meetings is, 
is essential. You know, we have, what do we have right now? 60 attendees on this call, which would have been an absolute peak figure for in-person pre-COVID. And that is now a regular event. And I, I don't wanna see the participation levels drop after COVID. I want, I want people to be able to continue to come in person. I think that is so important about keeping this dialogue going. Um, so uh, overall, I, I, I do wanna continue to push for more innovation. I'm really excited about reimagining and, and looking more to how, when we're gonna unpack that further um, and, and hearing the recommendations, uh, both from Social Justice Equity Commission um, as well as our policing, uh, our newly formed policing commission and from staff. I think there's gonna be so many great ideas. So looking, looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Hale. Council Member Aguirre. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think a lot of what I was gonna ask has been mentioned. Um, I'm really grateful to staff and, and what wonderful presentations and to be able to really learn and for the community to learn all of the accomplishments and all the work that's being done by all of our departments. So I wanna thank all of the department heads and, and welcome our new uh, Fire Chief Iverson. My concern um, it is, is similar to uh, Vice Mayor Hales. I wanna make sure that when we have these committees, whether they're ad hoc or standing, that they really do make an impact on what our priorities are. So is if it, that there is some possibility that um, that the work that they're doing is is not only beneficial to the council, to the community, but that they are also empowered to really bring forward ideas and things that'll help us form our budget. And that's where I agree with the participatory budget. So that was my, my concern. And I just have one question. Um, if we look at our budget from this year compared to last year, pre-pandemic, or maybe two years ago now, because it's been, it seems like it's been two years since, the pandemic, you know, what has really, really changed? Uh, and this is big picture, I'm looking at it high level, um, you know, besides all the great things that we're trying to do uh, to respond, we've had to respond um, and try to reform and try to do things. But what would be, what would you say, Melissa, is our biggest change that happened uh, post pandemic or not even, we don't even know if it's post yet. Yeah, I think we're still very much in it. Yeah, and I, we're, and yeah. I just yeah. this year, like if you would say this year, what, what was the challenge that we were dealing with and how is it different? So I would say two, maybe three things are, are most significantly different. One, we have taken a giant step forward into virtual services in a way that um, we would have been interested in in the past, but would have taken years. And we were forced to do that overnight. It was stressful and hard. It wasn't always perfect for the community. That's a big advance, and that's something we, we definitely want to retain. I would say, secondly, the conversation around equity has taken a, a giant leap forward as well. That was not as clearly articulated in the past, and that, that's um, become a much greater um, priority. I think the third thing I want to mention is just been reflecting a lot on what I've been hearing from Dr. Morrow, our, our health officer for the county, and, and from others, which is an acknowledgement that both our community and our employees have been and will continue to experience trauma related to this pandemic. And that has shaped our ability to provide services that will keep shaping it and it's shaping and impacting the services our community needs. That is nothing like something we could have imagined in our budget or our approach to services two years ago. And are we prepared to address that with our community? you know, the mental health, the trauma. I mean, I hear that every day in the news and, you know, the outcomes that a pandemic that we weren't facing, uh, perhaps a little bit during it, but now as it's moving in a different direction, people are coming forward with a lot of issues. And how are we as a city helping to address those issues through all the departments, all the departments that made the presentations, you know, our in influence in many ways. I, I think we'll start learning what, what it is that we need to do to be best supporting our community. And definitely this is an area where we will be drawing on our partners um, with the county and with nonprofit uh, partners to help amplify resources that are out there, but also to be mindful of how we provide services uh, is changing and has to change, just recognizing that the folks we're interacting with are hurting and, and there have been tough things we've been going through and are continuing to go through. 
thank you, um, Melissa. The, the final comment I'm gonna make is, I heard um, a lot of, almost every department head, I think mentioned the word equity in some form and manner. And so I wanna make sure that with that, there's outcomes, you know, that we're measuring certain things that we're doing um, related to that. Cause yeah, two things happened, the pandemic and a lot of the issues around social equity. So some way of measuring how that has really changed in our city. Um, I was happy to hear that, but I want to make sure that we can not just um, say it, but that we can actually show that we're doing it in which ways. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Aguirre. Uh, I, I heard early on in the presentation a staff member, I believe it was you, Ms. Diaz, who said that at this time we're 50 positions down. I think I heard that correctly. And recognizing 50 positions in an organization is a pretty significant number. Um, I can't thank our staff enough who have absolutely stepped up and risen to the occasion. But as Council Member Geary has said, I'm very concerned about burnout and trauma. This past year and a half has just been really tough on everybody. But when I think about families or employees with their families and friends and all the trauma that probably happened even outside City Hall and in their homes. I, I hope that we're going to have some kind of a plan to address adding back employees where we need to, um, talking to employees and, and giving them sources, giving them ways to vent and uh, get help when they need it. I know tonight we approved Yana Kaiser uh, and her services, and I'm really pleased to see that. But I think that we have to be aware that we're working a bit understaffed and that's got to be an additional strain above and beyond everything else our employees have been through this past year. So I know you're probably giving it a great deal of thought and uh, keep us in the loop on that, on how you hope to build back the organization, how, how we hope to do that. That's pretty important. Um, do you if I could just okay. very quickly clarify, what I said was we have 50 fewer positions than 20 years ago. Oh. <laughs> so we do have substantial vacancies. And, and Sorry, we do have substantial vacancies. That is also an impact. And I think like a lot of employers, we're all going to be hiring at the same time and employees are making different choices going forward. So all your other comments are, are right on. There is there's stress and there's work to be done. Thank you. True. And, and we do want to build back strong so that we don't burn, burn people out and we continue to grow as an organization. Uh, a lot of my questions have been answered. I agree with your one-time contributions. And I, I agree with the concept, a one-time contribution for something that's not going to be something that needs constant feeding and constant monies. I think that's smart what we're doing. I think we need to um, discuss probably uh, future more proactivity as far as pay down of our pension liability. How do we do that in light of Council Member G and Council Member Smith's questions and concerns? I think that we're going to have to give more discussion uh, and strategy on how we handle our pension liabilities. Uh, I think we're staying on top of it pretty well, but we just can't anticipate how things are going to go in the years to come. Uh, let me see. The, the, um, I'm very pleased with the the programs, uh, things that we started, like the homeless services, that was a major jump start because of COVID, but it's absolutely got to be the way we do business for, for now on, from now on. I'm really pleased that we've gotten such a good head start and done such great work, but it needs to continue. And I think we understand and recognize that. So the funding will need to continue to do this job. It's not going to get better unless we continue putting resources to it. And um, let me see here. Uh, I did want to ask Public Works just to keep in mind, we've had letters over the years about gas leaf blowers. Now we are going electric. Many cities are going electric. Uh, I'm hoping that um, maybe this or next year we can put a rebate program in place so that we can help our gardeners and landscapers 
to help us with our climate action plan by investing in electric, but we'll need to help them do that because it's not uh, an inexpensive proposition. So I'd like to be sure that we give some thought to that. If there's one-time funding, maybe some of that could be given to the climate action plan or these devices uh, that can help save our greenhouse gas emissions and help our gardeners and landscapers do the right thing without making it a financial burden to them. So it's just something I thought maybe we could look at a little bit more. And I'm very interested in the Zone Haven platform uh, for community evacuation. So um, Chief Iverson, in the future, I hope you'll give us more information on that and what departments will be working on it and how we as a council can be trained because we certainly want to know what our roles and job will be in the event of an evacuation of any large type. This sounds pretty important and it's the first time I'm really hearing about it. I'm going to look online and learn more about it, but Zone Haven platform sounds like something that the council should know more about as far as what is our role in all of that. Um, I, I think I'll leave it there because everyone's answered uh, many of my questions and I think the budget was done really, really well very clear, very, I just can't thank our staff enough for doing this. I know how much time that you must have spent on all this. So thank you, many thanks. And I think what we have at this point is public comment. So I think we'll go into that and I will turn it over to our city clerk so she can facilitate public comment and then it'll come back to me for a resolution. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Um, as mentioned, now is the time for public comment. Please follow, do we have the instructions? On the screen to be recognized for public comment. Um, in order to see how many speakers we have for public comment, I ask that everyone who wishes to speak on this item, please raise your hand now and keep it raised until your name is called to give public comment. I will give it a minute for people to queue up. And again, if you're joining us by phone, press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself when prompted to speak. Okay. It looks like at this point, we have 12 public speakers. Our last speaker is Catherine Zhu. So after Ms. Zhu speaks, um, public comment will be closed. If any additional speakers queue up after Ms. Zhu, you're asked to email your public comment to, city council, to the city council at council at redwoodcity.org. So I will start calling names. Um, each speaker will have two minutes to speak. And the timer will begin when you start speaking. Our first speaker is Pat W. And Pat W. will be followed by Cliff. Ms. Espinoza, or sorry, Council Member Espinoza Garnica. Ms. Flaherty and I, and Ms. Stevenson Diaz and I have established a friendship over the past several weeks discussing budget numbers and personnel allocations of the police department. I've submitted several recommendations, which I have been told are public record should one want to read them, but specifically, the current budget allocates three FTE for armed officers to be hired. When? the uh, community service officers that you and I prefer to have can be funded with that very same number at six FTE. And these community service officers can then respond to the calls that Chief Dan gets to monitor the public parks for large gatherings of brown skinned men and discover that they're playing their every early Saturday morning volleyball game, not intimidating the community at, for example, Menzies Park. 
about the comment in the budget that uh, we're just at the beginning of a multi-year conversation about policing. Sorry, my black body and the other black and brown bodies don't have time for a voyage and not for several years. The protests a year ago spoke loud and clear. No talk, no excuse about an advisory committee. Now, budget approval. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Our next speaker is Cliff, and Cliff will be followed by Patricia Abarile. Cliff? Yes, this is Cliff Shook, and I'm calling to or uh, speaking to urge the City Council to support the traffic calming measures as it relates to uh, Hudson Street, speed humps on Hudson Street. We have unsafe traffic conditions there, and really traffic insanity. And a survey done by the city shows that 17,000 cars per week are going down Hudson Street over the speed limit. And this is pandemic, if you will, traffic. And you know, we have drivers speeding and ignoring pedestrians and crosswalks, just a terrible situation. 65% of residents on the five blocks, 100 through 500 of Hudson Street support speed humps. This was a survey done by the city the community development department. And um, last, I'd like to thank uh, Jessica Manzi and Eric Zen for all their help in putting up with my uh, seemingly endless uh, questions. And that's really all I had to say. Thank you, Cliff. Our next speaker is Patricia uh, Barile, please. Let me know if I pronounced that correctly. And then Patricia will be followed by call in user number one. Hi, my name is Patricia Burrill and uh, I'm wanting to make a comment about uh, what I've been reading uh, about um, sewer fees being, being charged to our property taxes. I don't oh, know. Ms. Burrill, if, if you don't mind, that item is actually, um, will be called next after we conclude the budget. Oh, so if okay. you could reserve your comments and raise your hand again when we get to that item, we'd be happy to hear your comments on the, the sewer rates. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Next speaker is Colin User 1 and Colin User 1 will be followed by Ian W. Hi, good evening. My name is Marcelina Luna, and I want to take a moment to really applaud Council Member Spinoza Garnica for um, really having the courage to speak up against the um, really bloated police budget once again. It's like year after year, not much changes for that department. Um, so I really applaud her for the importance of having um, a greater focus on what keeps our community safe, and police does not keep our community safe. If anything, um, I believe Pat, um, when he called in, he mentioned something about the parks. I have experienced that, what he talked about at Mises Park. I go to that park often. I take my grandchild there. And there isn't a day that I go to that park, whether it's at 10 in the morning or 5 in the afternoon, when there's police officers around. And I have to explain to my grandchild why they're there. Um, there's really no need to have armed officers um, around that, and I, I just don't understand why we're spending our taxpayers' money on such things like that um, when there's so many other services that our city needs to keep our community safer. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Marcelina. Our next speaker is Ian W., and Ian will be followed by Adrian Caponera. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First, I'd like to thank the tireless public servants who've gone above and beyond to adapt to unique challenges and increased needs to help our community through the trials of the last year. In light of unprecedented disasters, including not just COVID, but also the ash-choked skies and other threats that will only increase as our climate warms, 
people need their public support services more than ever. We need to increase our investment in fire preparedness. We need to increase our support for unhoused neighbors. And as the combination of unaffordable housing, economic ripples from COVID and global warming fueled fires displace more and more people each year. Um, and we need to invest in undoing generations of harm and inequity. And as the city staff repeatedly point out, pointed out in the presentation, city services have not adequately scaled to meet the needs of our population. We know money is limited and has to come from somewhere. And fortunately, the people of Redwood City have been very clear and consistent about how to handle this. Uh, here are three specific ways that you can show that you're listening. First, uh, I'm asking the members of city council to pledge that any and all cuts to the general fund will come from the bloated police budget so that we can maintain and invest in our city services when they are needed most. This was recommended by the Stanford report and I fully support council member Espinoza Garnica's call to continue reallocating these funds to other services. Second, to aid this, I'm asking for a continued moratorium on police hiring. And third, I'm asking for the city council to make strategic investments in increasing city services that will be needed uh, most to deal with the challenges ahead, especially COVID and housing aid, resources such as our parks and libraries, firefighting, mental health services that do not include police, uh, and a special focus on our historically neglected communities to help them reach service parity with the more affluent parts of the city. All these things can be funded with the money we're currently wasting on a bloated and unnecessarily large police force. Please listen to the people of Redwood City and do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Our next speaker is Adrian Caponera, and Adrian will be followed by Kendra Lechtenberg. Hello, thank you. Um, so I recently received notice of this public hearing notifying me of the proposal for the collection of sewer charges as part of the tax roll. Well, Mr. Caponera, yes. if you don't mind, um, the, the sewer item is going to be called separately following the budget. That's going to have its own discussion. And if you could reserve your comments and raise you, your hand. Yeah, do you have an idea when that's gonna be? It's been three hours. We are wrapping up this item, so it shouldn't be too much longer. Okay, great. Okay, okay. we'll hear from you in a little bit. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kendra Lechtenberg, and Kendra will be followed by Jimmy Hedges. Hello, thank you. My name is Kendra Lechtenberg. I'm a volunteer with the Mid-Peninsula chapter of the ACLU. While we were very pleased to see your statements of commitment to equity and reimagining public safety services in the proposed budget, we do not believe that budgeting such a large proportion, 33% of the general fund to the police department is in alignment with these commitments. We echo the wonderful statements made by council member Espinoza Garnica and ask that the budget be revised to reallocate funds to social support programs and non-policing forms of public safety. Notably, the police patrolling services budget comprises over 50% of the Redwood City Police Department's total budget. However, a detailed breakdown of the full range of patrolling activities and services included in the significant pool of funding has not been made available. We recommend tasking the newly formed Police Advisory Committee to review the activities, supplies and services funded by the Law Enforcement Patrol Services budget make this information available in an itemized way and identify opportunities to reduce expenditures by reducing or eliminating activities and supplies which do not meet high standards of, of supporting community safety. For example, reducing traffic stops and criminal enforcement of low level offenses could be cost saving from a budget perspective as well as reduce racial bias in policing. We also recommend to reallocate these funds to expand the county mental health pilot crisis program to include a non-law enforcement crisis response team. The current San Mateo pilot program only adds a clinician to ride alongside the officer, but mental health crisis response teams are most effective when operated independent of law enforcement. I thank you for your consideration of these recommendations um, and I would welcome the opportunity to discuss them further. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Our next speaker is Jimmy Hedges, and Jimmy will be followed by Pat Pritchard. Go ahead, Jimmy. Jimmy, if you are there, your mic is unmuted and you can begin 
with your public comment. You want to try one more time, and if it doesn't work, we'll come back to um, Jimmy. You want to try unmuting? Okay, Jimmy, if you can hear us, we're going to move on, and um, I will try. I will call you again after our last speaker. Our next speaker is Pat Pritchard, and Pat will be followed by Clara Jekyll. You can unmute your mic. Pat Richard, if you can hear me, you can unmute your mic. Okay. We, I will move on and I will try calling Pat again. I hope, hopefully I'm not the one having technical difficulties. We'll go to now Clara Jackal. And after Clara will be David and Karen. Yeah, thank you. And um, this is Clara Jekyll. Hi, Clara. Um, there are many elements in the proposed budget that I applaud, and these include adding civilian homeless outreach workers, investigating alternatives to public safety staff interaction with unhoused residents, increased funding for sidewalk repair, forgiving utility bills, providing direct dental assistance, and also I appreciate and in including enabling remote public participation in council meetings, even when in-person meetings resume. And so um, I take note of these and um, urge you to approve them and uh, really appreciate them. However, after a year of dialogue with the community and repeated calls for shifting funds from the police department to infrastructure and community stability services, it's really disappointing to see so many of these projects back from one-time funding and so little change in the actual police department budget, which is actually slightly increased from last year from the uh, revised budget, um, which is the opposite of what we've been asking for. Consequently, I once again recommend the following measures which we communicated at the time of the public safety meeting in April to permanently eliminate all currently frozen positions in the police department, rather than hiring for open patrol officer positions to allocate those funds to hire additional mental health commissions so that the community wellness and crisis response team can provide around the clock coverage. Going forward, whenever a police department employee resigns or retires to move that headcount to the city departments such as community development and transportation or public works and to end allocation of city funds toward a school resource officer. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Um, we're going to try Pat Pritchard again. Pat, my, there you go. Yes, my comment has to do with the sewer rates. Oh, I see. Okay, if you could queue up when we call that item, we'll be happy to hear from you then. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, okay, our next speaker is David and Karen, and David and Karen will be followed by our, our final speaker, Laura Aiden. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I am responding to the police department's uh, over budget. And I live in an area where we don't ever get traffic enforcement. And a lot of the people in our neighborhood won't go to any intersection that doesn't have a stop sign because the road kind of Alameda kind of curves where we live. And if you try to cross Alameda without a stop sign, although the traffic's posted at 30, nobody's going 30, they're all going 40 and 45, and it's suicide. So we got a lot of people that don't do anything except look for stop signs or alternative ways to get in and out. That's one. Number two, there are so many speed bumps and curb bump outs and stuff to slow you down. A lot of people are, and all you have to do is look at Hudson near Jefferson, all the black marks on these turnabouts, these, these circles, how are people hitting these? Answer, they're not necessarily going real fast. They're just dealing with the dark and all of the people before that have hit it. It's like insanity. Why don't we enforce the speed limits and let people pay enormous amounts of money so they can learn to behave? Enough said. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And it looks like our other speakers have lowered their hands. So we have no more public speakers. And that concludes public comment for this item. Um, I will turn the meeting back over to Mayor Howard. Thank you, Ms. Aguilar. Now moving, now moving on to council action. Um, I'd like to ask if the council, if anyone would like to make a motion or a second to adopt the resolution setting June 28th, 2021 as the date for the public hearing on and adoption for fiscal year 2021-22 budget and um, directing copies of the fiscal year recommended budget be filed with the city clerk. Authorizing directing city clerk to publish the notice of availability of the fiscal year 2021-22 recommended budget and the date of the public hearing. Do I have a motion to approve that resolution? So moved. Second, member Reddy. Moved by council member Reddy, seconded by council member Aguirre. Could we have a roll call vote, please? <clears throat> yes. And we will start with council member Reddy. Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Aguirre? Yes. Council Member Espinosa Garnica? Yes. Council Member G? Yes. Vice Mayor Hale? Yes. And Mayor Howard? Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you to the members of our audience who, who spoke this evening. Moving on to item number eight, we're having a public hearing and consideration of any protests related to the collection of sewer service charges on the tax roll, resolution of authorizing the collection of sewer service charges on the tax roll for residential customers with one dwelling unit per parcel, and authorization for the city manager to execute a compensation agreement with the County of San Mateo for collection of special charges. I'd like to ask our Public Works Services Director, Terrence Jaw, to give us a presentation. Mr. Jaw? Good evening, Mayor Howard and Council. I'm Terrence Jaw, Director of Public Works. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you with a short presentation before opening the public hearing. This evening, staff is submitting Council consideration for a resolution authorizing the collection of sewer service charge for the parcels containing one dwelling unit through the San Mateo County property tax roll. Next slide, please. Here is an overview of the presentation. A brief background, explanation of the proposed resolution, timeline for today's public hearing, necessary requirement to have the resolution take effect, a comparison between the existing method and the proposed method, and the impacts. The new sewer charge collection process followed by the council action. Madam Clark, next slide, please. Allow me to quickly touch on the background work, what we had done before tonight public hearing. At November 2018, Utility Subcommittee meeting, the committee endorsed collection of sewer service charge on property tax roll. The reason are increased efficiency in staff workload, reliable revenue stream, improve accuracy for the long-term financing plans planning. I also want to explain why these reasons are important for the sewer repairs. Railroad City Sewer Service is 100% funded by the repairs. All expenses relating to the system are pivotal part of calculating future sewer rates. Simply put, lower expenditure means lower sewer rate. Having sewer charge collected through property tax is viewed by the bond rating company as a, a secure way to collect the revenue and eventually leading to the better bond ratings. Better bond, bond ratings for the city is similar to our personal credit ratings. Better bond ratings could lead to a lower interest rates in terms lower overall cost for the sewer system. Especially, overall sewer system face large capital improvement requirements, such as a $550 million sewer conveyance system improvement at the Sil Silicon Valley Clean Water Treatment Plants. Railroad City share the large amount of the cost, nearly 50% of them. On May 10 of this year, 
Council approved ordinance number 2495 to update the Municode chapter 27. The adoption provide option to have sewer service charge for parcel with one dwelling unit collected on the San Mateo County property tax roll. I also wanted to note that it is called tax roll. The charge in the discussion is not a tax. It is a utility service charge and simply using another method to collect the subscription. The ordinance took effect on June 10 or 2021. Next slide, please. Even though the ordinance allows sewer charge to be on tax roll, we are required to complete specific steps. I also want to mention that this action will not increase sewer rates or impact the process of establishing future fewer sewer rates. Also in San Mateo County, about half of the 20 agencies are already collecting their sewer charge through the property tax roll. Next slide, please. The proposed resolution in front of you will authorize collecting sewer survey charge for the parcel with one dwelling unit on a property tax roll starting in fiscal year 21-22. After the public hearing, council can make a decision whether to approve or not to approve collecting sewer survey charge through the property tax roll. Two thirds of yes vote is needed from the council to pass this proposal. Report attached to the stub report contain 13,583 parcel currently paying sewer survey charge to the city for one dwelling unit equivalent. Next slide, please. This is a, um, can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, thank you. Um, this is the timeline of the process. There were many hours of background work done in less two and a half year to reach this public hearing. Next slide, please. We try our best to reach out to the community. Notice was sent to the parcel owner record on May 25th, 2021, using the less available information at the time report was generated. Staff also attended multiple neighborhood and homeowner association meeting and conducted two virtual community meetings solely dedicated to the sewage trade transfer. Notice of public hearing published on the Daily Journal on May 25th and June 1st. Various social media channels were used to provide additional information. We also had our translator available during our outreach meeting to translate to Spanish if necessary. As of now, we have received 32 protest letters. In addition, we received nine emails asking for additional information. Next slide, please. I also want to draw a comparison between the existing method and then the proposed method. The current method bills utility charge to the customer bi-monthly, whereas county bills bi-annually. The bill amount is the same. The penalties from the county can be cost more, mainly due to the other high dollar items are on the bill, not because of the sewer charge that drive the cost. County will place a parcel on the auction after five years of non-payment due to the parcel owner not willing to participate in the payment plan. Our communication with the staff from the county, the only one condominium will auction due to the not following through the payment process in the last five years. Some concern about the proposed bailing method can, uh, can garnish someone else's uh, income wages and increase the chance of property income tax audits uh, unfounded at this point. At the same time, billing through the city utility bill has its own limitation. The city can shut off water service after 90 days of no payment. I just want to note that due to the pandemic, the city is currently waiving penalties and shut off until end of this year. Next slide, please. This is a mock-up of what the sewer bill projected to be look like. Actual formatting may change at the time of bills are printed. Property tax are collected in the two equal installments each year. First portion due on December and second portion due in April. Parcel owner will see the total cost of the service listed with other charge as highlighted above. 
Bus owner may call the phone number listed next to the charge for any question that they might have. I also wanted to note that customers who currently receiving water and sewer rate assistance program will continue receiving assistance through the city utility bill. Next slide, please. This concludes my presentation. Slide in front of you is a step required to complete the public hearing. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jaw. Before we open the public hearing, does council have any clarifying questions they would like to ask? Seeing none, I think we'll move right into, oh, council member Reddy. Thank you so much, Mayor Howard. Um, yes, uh, one of our correspondents asked uh, Mr. Zhao a very good question, which I thought um, could perhaps he could repeat. That question was, um, because the taxes are increased 2% every year, will this addition to the property tax be included in that bill? Thank you, Council Member Reddy. It is not. So the 2% increase is a part of the uh, property portion of the tax, which is land and improvement um, due to the Prop 13. Uh, the charge that we are in discussion is a simple sewage charge and that every rate increase must approve by the council through the Prop 218 process with a public hearing just like this one. Great, thank you so much. I think that was a, a good question and I appreciate your response, thank you. I also wanted to mention we received several emails from people in the community after about four o'clock this afternoon and I was unable to send a response as we were getting ready for our meeting, but I wanted to assure that the council did receive those emails and the staff did receive those emails and they will be entered into the record also, along with the other emails that were sent. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Jaw, for mentioning uh, the, the letters that were sent to us. Uh, moving on to our public hearing, I'll turn it over to our city clerk. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Now is the time for everybody who has joined the meeting and wanted to speak on this topic about the sewer rates. Uh, please raise your hand to be recognized. In order to see how many speakers we have for this item, I ask that you uh, raise your hand now and keep it raised until your name is called to give your public comment. So everybody who had joined previously and wanted to talk, now is the time to queue up by raising your hand. I'll give it a minute. Okay. It looks like, anybody wanna raise your hand? Now is the time. Okay, so we have, oh, okay. This is the time to raise your hand to speak on the sewer rates item. And keep your hand raised until your name is called to give your public comment. Don't lower your hand. <laughs> All right, so it looks like we have 10 speakers. Our last speaker is David and Karen. So after David and Karen speak, um, we'll close public comment and anybody who queues up after that, we ask that you please send your comments to the city council at council at redwoodcity.org. So each speaker will be given two minutes. I will call your names in the order that your hands were raised, two at a time, and the timer will begin when you start speaking. Our first speaker is Johanna Rasmussen, and Johanna will be followed by Betty Fellows. Welcome, Johanna. Thank you. The Farm Hill Neighborhood Association has opposed this proposal since we first asked you to pull it from the consent calendar back on May 10th. There is not a bond rating projected savings or leverage amount that can justify the risk you will be intentionally exposing homeowners to. The following Redwood City res residents ask you to vote no. Jennifer Sneeden, Julie Pardini, Gary Markwith, Robbie Reed, Jamie Slocum, 
Annette Bernatelli, Susan Swope, Gary Wilsley, Glenn Unifer, Pat Pfeiffer, Jim Luna, Lonnie Penny, Sean Jerolimek, Francine Taylor, Diane Stowe, Logan Winnie, Susan Pena, G. Aponte, Lupe Flores Robles, Maggie Pearson, Jose Villacorda, Sophia Trevino, Carolyn Jane Healy, Brian Packer, Stephanie Thorpe, Gato Rivera, Lynn Trin, Ralph Garcia, John Inwood, Regina Davis, Leslie Stafford, Valerie Lou, Barbara Boca, Wendy Lapp, Shariz Quandry, Wendy Balin, Jeff Schoenstein, Molly Tinney, Mary Campbell, Karen Waddell, Claire Falong, Rena Dugish, Diana Post, Barbara Schuler, Brian Sullivan, Graciela Alvarez, Clara Jackal, Robert Latham, Marcella Luna, Denise Stowe, Deb Hankin, Elliot Powell, Jed Dugish, Rima Mahood, Chris Rasmussen, Ed Gorey, Hubert Lester, Sue Kirkpatrick, Shelley Hayes, Elaine Stewart, Rhonda Kaufman, Mary Garner, Rob Lyon, Aline Delacruz, Christina Umhofer, Franco Carla, Carlo Taylor, Michael Waltz, Marianne Colson, Carl Arise, Bob Green, Melanie Valdez, Ashley Winter. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna, very much. Our next speaker is Betty Fellows, and Betty will be followed by Karen Middleton. Welcome, Betty. Thank you. Uh, first thing, they said they were very transparent, but the only notice I got for, for anything about this was the notice for the Zoom meeting. Now, I know some of my neighbors are, uh, don't even have technology, so they couldn't do Zoom. When I called in to find other ways of, of uh, responding, one of the people said to me, well, you know, all you have to do is save those bi-monthly payments. Well, when you're living either paycheck, paycheck or social security to social security payment, you can't always save it. The next emergency that comes along is gonna take whatever savings you have. So what you're doing is you're, you're more than doubling what I will be paying every month, every um, you know, twice a year which means that I will probably lose my home. And to do that is just downright evil. I have worked very hard to survive and keep my home. And by doubling what I have to pay twice a year on this will make it impossible for me. So I want you to know that I think this should be ended, that you should vote no on it. And if you vote less, yes, you have no concept about what it's like to live on the edge to not ha have the money to, to get by on and to choose between paying bills and buying food is hard enough, but to have it to the point where you can't pay, where you literally are more than doubling what I pay for tax, thank, thank God for Prop 13, I don't pay very much for property taxes, but you're gonna make me lose my home. And if I'm homeless, I'm not gonna survive. So this is evil, do not do it. That's not what I vote for you guys to do, to try to steal my home. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Our next speaker is Karen Middleton and Karen will be followed by call in user one. Yes, hello, my name is Karen. And I, you know, I agree with a lot of these people, but my first suggestion would be show the agenda in an additional column because so many of us joined in at six o'clock waiting for this item, which is after nine o'clock. And it's frustrating as can be because this card that I got about the sewer issue was the only notification that I got also. Number one, I've lived in this community most of my life. I mean, I was born in Stanford Hospital. I mean, I've been here, I'm, I'm a senior and I've grown up in the school system. I mean, I've experienced elementary schools and the community college and, and I've worked in the county and I've done so many di different things in different departments. And I, even the planning commission for crying out loud. So these fees switching, there's no explanation as to what that's gonna mean. I mean, my water bill is outrageous. 
I still think I can't understand why Redwood City is still getting away with billing bi monthly when the fees have gone up so high. You know, a lot of years ago it didn't matter. But this is this is Nutsville and the people that are living on a fixed income, this is crazy to throw it on your property tax. Well, maybe that's fine, except show me where it's gonna help me. And what happened to the developers that have added all the infrastructure, that adds all the extra sewage, that adds all this stuff, what's their responsibility? Why are the homeowners being stuck and carrying these horrendous charges? I mean, come on, let's get real about this. I mean, let's have, let's have some real public hearings on this thing so people can uh, brainstorm with ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, very much. Our next speaker is Colin User 1, and Colin User 1 will be followed by Adrian Caponera. Hi, good evening. My name is Marcelina Luna, and we, the undersigned Redwood City residents, ask you to vote no on item 8A, and it includes the following. Jennifer Lebsack, Catherine Norwood, Joanne Scaduto, Susan Kelly, Victoria Galia, Renato Garofani, Sergio Perez, Francesca Garofani, Mary Wesley, Jerry Brick, Douglas Heinz, Joe Giannino, Carrie Boyd, Lucy Garcia, Sharon Andre, Elsa Perez, Sarah Garofani, Rocio Torres, Julissa Witzel, Jim Luna, Beverly Rosenquist, Philip Constantino, Shira Kadri, Ladra Koisian, Catherine Moray, Marina Turner, Guillermina Michel, Jeff Schoenstein, Sue Kickpatrick, Melanie Valdez, Andre Gutler, Annie Tate, Elliot Powell, Ian Maynard, Barbara Miri, Debbie Gisoni, Don Mercado, John Kuchta, Victoria Constantini, Clyde Pinto, Pierre Poncia, Patricia Berriet, Chrissy Mangiola, Jamie Slocum, uh, Carol Irvin, Leon Guild, Michelle Snyder, Carol Bowser, Y. Prudhomme, Connie Sipperly, Sean Jacqueline, Ryan Bahard, David Harvey, Juanita Sanchez, Cheryl Boyer, Alicia Frank, Janet Tipper, Richard Barrick, Jeep Jensen, David Clipperty, James Boyson, Julie Putnam, Katie Fugacy, Kelly Vai, Kim Flagg, KJ Johnson, Ty Tyson, Tamara Sikamana, Susan Swoop, Michael Coyne, Scott Schneider, Gloria Scott, Robbie Reed, Catherine Fragulia. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelina. Our next speaker is Adrian Caponera, and Adrian will be followed by Laura Aiden. Uh, yes, hello. Um, first off, I'd just like to say I agree with Betty Fellows. I agree with Karen Middleton that the way uh, notice of this public hearing was given for such an onerous uh, yet very important topic is absolutely appalling. Secondly, in that notice, uh, the, the only paragraph in that notice mentioned a report that was created by city staff and was on file with the city clerk. I reached out for that report and I'm curious if anyone on the city council actually read that quote unquote report. I'll take the silence as a no. That report was 313 pages of a copy and pasted Excel sheet with two columns on it. One column was parcel numbers. The second column was a $1,071.76 parcel charge for sewer services. That was the report. No discussion of research or uh, any thought that went into this program. Um, it would have been very nice if Mr. Kia had sent out that report that he just walked through, the presentation he just walked through, so that we had a little bit of an informed um, data coming into the public clearing. That said, in that presentation, there was uh, two reasons given for this move. One is staff efficiency. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Kia, what is the... Um, What's the compensation agreement with the county to collect these fees? 
um, Mr. Kapanar, this is the time for you to give your public comment and- um, the, In a public yeah. hearing, we don't get any response back from the city council. Well, let's just say the 13,500 parcels listed at $1,071.76 comes to over $14.5 million. If just a 1% fee is given to the county to collect these fees, that's $145,000. That's a pretty good job. So staff efficiency is a pretty bonk answer. And regarding bond ratings, uh, that also is not how bonds work. Will the county Thank be you. more aggressive in collecting these fees? Thank you. Thank because you, Mr. Kapanara. Because if the Kapanara. county be more aggressive in collecting these fees, bond ratings will not be improved. Thank you, Mr. Kapanara, for your comments. Our next speaker is Laura Aiden, and Laura will be followed by Clara Jackal. Um, yes, this is Laura Aiden. Um, I've, uh, I actually feel that people on our fixed income and a lot of people in, this, in the community, Redwood City, uh, probably aren't even, some people aren't even aware, but it's going to be real hardship paying such a bulk fee twice a year instead of paying it six times a year. And I think it will hurt actually a lot of people. Um, I I understand, I thank the person, you know, all the work that's gone into this and they've really put a lot in. I, I can see that you wanna just vote yes on this. However, if you actually look at all the people, I think it should be put up to a vote because that would help really know where people are at. So if we could, you know, if you get on the November ballot to really see how people feel and then put the pros and the cons so they can understand some of the things that, that you have, you, you're discussing. Um, also, I, I thought Mr. Papanara had a good, you know, you might be losing money also by having them collect it. But it's a real hardship, I think, on many of the people in Redwood City. And I think if, if people were aware, and I know you sent out the cards, but a lot of people don't understand. Some people don't know how to get on the computer. Um, you know, I think that you would see that prob probably 80% or more would be not in favor of this. So, you know, I, I hope you do vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Our next speaker is Clara Jackal and Clara will be followed by Pat Pritchard. Thank you. Um, I'd like to read some more of the names residents so signed that they ask you to vote no on this item. Gracie Walker, Colin Wolf, Rhea Foy, John William Butterfield, Janice Anderson, Julie Butterini, Joseph Rodden, Karen Chu, Ron Bianconi, Jerry Rexroth, Russ Flagg, Carolyn Jane Healy, Mather Mather, Beverly Spiker, Virginia Trowbridge, Richard Spiker, Rebecca Hurst, Eden Eshetu, Haley Ball, Abraham Morales, Mike Reno, Sean Allen, Hazel Lawrence, Patrick Mulligan, Sissy Baca, Scott Peterson, Rosalba Pandoja, Cheryl Mangre, Javier Mendez Jr., Penny Wartman, Sharon Lamacher, Ronald Piccinelli, William Glennon, Michael Kopek, Richard Orvik, S.J. Crowley, Hollis Orvik, Chris Smith, Marlene Johnson, John Twomey, Kingston Cole, Annie Golding, Ross Chu, Paul Anderson, Karen Renier, David Renier, Mildred Cole, Donna Schreiber, Harold Shaw, Cheryl Wick, Tyler White, Lucretia Nelson, Tim Cox, Andre He, Renata Kemper, Hector Perez, Mary Ann Butterfield, Laura Bish, Keith Crockett, Kevin Thorpe, Millicent Wisdom, Alejandro Valencia, Donna Copeland, Lana Owen, Judd Starr, Gabby Santos, James Recker, Rebecca Keeler, Kasi Puahu, Rufus Connell, Sarah Hoke, Allison White, Mixia Chos, and Tina Young. Thank you. Thank you, Clara. Our next speaker is Pat Pritchard, and Pat will be followed by Steve. Council? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Did you? and council. I am opposed to transfer billing from the Redwood City Utilities to San Mateo County Tax Collector, primarily for about three reasons. One is that 
you are overburdening landlords who are not currently able to collect rent and requiring layers of bureaucracy to solve any sewage problems. Further, removing residents from the tax from the, from the city billing creates layers of bureaucracy, creating and confusion and preventing citizen participation. I am one of the people who has written to the city council for the past five months. Redwood City ought to be ashamed of their grossly inflated charges and refusing to fix broken sewer pipes in the middle of the street. That is your property and your responsibility. I resent having no alternative but paying your disgusting rates. I also note that the rates have raised from my bill went from 163.52 to 170.88 with no explanation. In the meantime, I have twice had to hire private companies to clean out the sewer because Redwood City refused. They had three people standing around and their public works superintendent, Michael Patolo, refused to take care of it. Everyone in Redwood Shores is supposedly in a private system. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, for your comments. Our next speaker is Steve, and Steve will be followed by our final speaker, David and Karen. Hello. Yes, um, Steve uh, couldn't wait anymore, so I'm Kathy. I'll be speaking on his behalf. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. I just wanted to, to pretty much reiterate uh, most of everyone's comments. Uh, the first notice that I saw was the postcard for this Zoom meeting. And I guess I don't pay close enough attention or maybe this was the only one to go out. And I don't feel that I had time to know more about it. I still have a question, but I don't wanna ask the question because I'll lose my minutes. But what I wanted to say is my home in Redwood City, you know, going on to my tax bill is one thing, which I currently object to. But the most important thing is that I have about 10 single family homes in Redwood City and they are all low income in the Fair Oaks area. And when I have to pay all of their sewer bills and I am also now under rent control, COVID, no evictions, and this total bill will come to over $10,000 a year for me. And these are my retirements purchased many, many years ago. And I don't, I don't understand how um, this got to this point without a lot more um, input from all of us that live here and provide low income housing. We never raised rents and I have to raise their rent now. Is this, is this what everyone wants? It seems to be contrary to what the community is talking about through this two and a half hour, three hours I've been sitting here waiting to talk that we are very interested in keeping people from being homeless. But that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our final speaker will be David and Karen. Well, it's a thrill to talk to you again. I do think that there are some tremendous benefits in this. Uh, uh, the convenience of it, I think, is incredibly overpowering. Clearly, there's a reduced workload for uh, the Redwood City personnel, but um, I think there is an incredible opportunity for us to slide things under the carpet accidentally. Um, and the conversation by Middleton, by uh, Karen Middleton, I thought was, uh, was pretty excellent in terms of how this can become a problem. So were a number of the others. I wish that petition had come my way. It would have been a joy to sign it. Uh, I'm just gonna tune off and say, please hold back on this. Uh, and I thank you for listening to me and um, y'all have a good time now here.
Thank you very much. That was our uh, final um, public comments. If you are not able to make live public comment, you're asked to email your comments to the city council at council at redwoodcity.org. And I'll turn the meeting back over to Mayor Howard. Thank you, Ms. Aguilar. I will now close the public hearing and move on to council discussion. So, okay, I'll, I saw a hand now, no, okay. Mr. Jaw, I see your hand raised. Did you want to make a comment uh, to any of the questions that were brought up during the public hearing? Uh, my apologies, Mayor, uh, I accidentally hit the uh, raise hand button. Well, I'm sure we'll be talking to you soon. <laughs> Council Member Espinoza Garnica. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Council Member Reddy, I didn't see your hand raised. Council Member Reddy and then Council Member Espinoza Garnica. Thank you so much, Mayor Howard. Um, so um, I have to um, report that I am uh, a member of the Utilities Subcommittee and I felt that it would be helpful to our community to explain why I was part of the decision to recommend that um, this uh, recommendation go forward to our council, to the full council. Um, it's, I too am concerned that our community didn't get more information and that, and that there wasn't more opportunity to explain. And I thank Mr. Ja for his explanation. Um, perhaps I can reiterate it from a, from a, um, a resident's point of view. So this, I likened this conversation to a conversation I had with county staff when we were being persuaded to, to move from PG&E to PCE, to the Peninsula Clean Energy Program. And I said, why would I wanna do this? And um, is it going to be, uh, is it gonna save me money? Is it gonna be cheaper for me? And the response was, well, we can't promise that, but that is our expectation. And they raised Sonoma County and other counties as an example of um, the, the bills being cheaper for those residents. And two, three years later, it is cheaper. You know, PC is cheaper for, for us residents. So I liken that this conversation to that. When we have the um, extraordinary efficiencies that are recommended in this proposal of um, staff not having, um, we're moving from the city program to the uh, property tax, and then we're becoming eligible for these, this bond that is going to be um, a reduced interest rate. These are efficiencies and savings that are gonna prevent, and, and, and I am not speaking as a city employee who cannot promise this, but it is my expectation, and I'm only saying this as, as, a, as a member of the subcommittee to explain why I was supporting the staff recommendation and supported this recommendation coming to the full council. It's because of my personal expectation that this will, that our residents will not get a, um, a sewer increase soon. Otherwise, residents are going to have to pay for these extraordinary um, infrastructure improvements that cannot wait. Because these, um, because residents do need to pay for, for whatever the improvements are. And so I applaud staff for looking for ways to save money so that, the, so that our residents would not get these, um, improve, um, these increases for the sewer costs uh, later. And it's not to say that they won't eventually, but the, uh, the increases will not come as quickly as they would had we not, um, if we were not to pursue these um, efficiencies. Thank you, Council Member Reddy. Council Member Espinoza Garnica. Oh, yes, hello. Um, yeah, I really appreciate all the commenters uh, 
words or remarks. And, you know, this is something I, I had to learn more about uh, quickly. And I, I would agree as well that perhaps there are more ways we can definitely improve how um, we inform the public. Um, I may have been aware of a flyer that reached us months ago, but at the same time, uh, pro perhaps providing further explanations when we do outreach um, is something to look into. And I understand the logic of uh, uh, bringing this up for the reasons um, Council Member Reddy says to to look at the ways it'll be um, beneficial to us um, for staffing purposes um, and also for capital improvements. But I do largely see this as um, as more of a hardship, and I'm and I'm wondering if we can think of creative ways to lessen the burden. Um, now this. I don't know what's related to this, but you know, one of my proposals while campaigning was having like a business tax, like a big business tax to help fund, you know, the city. And I know that there's less money coming in from the federal government to help with our water and rates are gonna keep going up, but, and no thing stopping rates going up. But, um, you know, I think I think of paying month to month, to month as kind of like a payment plan versus like having to pay for full price um, during the tax, you know? And this is just kind of my thoughts after listening to everyone, you know? Um, so I see how it does give a benefit for the city, but I think it kind of threatens, I think it's a threat to people's day-to-day uh, -day lives. Um, and it's harder to, to afford that savings um, in bulk. I would agree with those statements that were shared so um, I don't think this is a quite simple decision, perhaps, um, at least not for me, but I, I would say that I would ex rather explore other ways to, to try and cover the costs of this or, you know, improve, you know, cover the cost of like capital improvements and, you know, um, and trying to get more staff because as we saw in the presentation, you know, our, our retention or hiring has gone down over the years and it wouldn't be just because of our sewers. Like it's because of the lack of affordability um, in our city. So I would say that is probably something to focus on and I would probably halt on this because it does seem like it's kind of a, a burden. That's Thank you, council member. Uh, council member Aguirre. Thank you, uh, Mayor. <clears throat> and thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Spinoza Garnica, for your comments, and Diana and uh, Council Member Reddy for, uh, being, for your work on the Utilities Committee. I think that the issue is um, the, the lack of information um, for folks that aren't always connected to uh, our meetings and, and the way reports go out and the public comments. And, you know, we all don't have the benefit of or they don't have the benefit of being on a utilities committee to understand the process and moving forward. So, um, and, and I think that's, you know, and I, I thank you, Terrence, because I know that you, you've done a good job, but obviously, um, you know, folks found out about it this week and some folks weren't aware of the things that were going on. So my, my question or request would be, if we don't have to make this decision today, if we can do some more public outreach and more explaining of the benefits to folks. Because when I think of my property taxes twice a year, I, I'm already scared, right, about the amount I have to pay, you know, and twice a year and budget for that. And so I think people um, associate that, you know, okay, now I'm going to have to budget um, for paying the sewers twice a year. And so trying to understand the process um, and and maybe getting more information and explaining it um, a little bit more. And for the folks that someone mentioned that can't get on Zoom and, and hear all of this or come to all these meetings, what do we do and what can we do? So my question and request would be if we don't have to make that decision tonight, if we can um, postpone it and do some more outreach, that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Council Member Aguirre. Um, I think that uh, we can have that question answered um, either now or as we sum up uh, 
I, I understand. I asked the question earlier myself about what our options were. So why don't we hear from other council members and keep track of the questions that are being asked so that we can do that. Uh, council member G. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Terrence, thank you for the presentation and thank you to the members of the utility um, subcommittee for kind of processing uh, this issue. You know, I, I will make my comments. Um, you know, one of the things I think is, is hard to quantify is the metrics that, that would occur with this. I think those are, are important issues. If there are staff efficiency, what does that mean? Does that mean staff could be reassigned to do other things? Um, do we, what are the cost savings? What are the costs to us from the county? And those numbers, those metrics are missing. In addition, um, I think in my work I do and the experiences, um, revenue secured by the property tax role, even though this is not a property tax, may wind up with a lower cost of borrowing or, and how do we quantify that? You know, I think Terrence, you said in your presentation, we're not the first city to do this. 10 other cities in the county have done it, including the two larger cities in Rhode City, Daly City and San Mateo, and the fourth largest city, South San Francisco. So there should be some lessons learned from those cities, about how the fixed income communities are, has dealt with this, how the seniors have dealt with it. Uh, and so there, there are lessons learned that we can learn from them or, or testimonials or whatever that can help inform our community about the pros and cons, benefits and the consequences of change. The other piece that's missing is just the context of the capital improvement program for Silicon Valley Clean Water. Um, you know, there is a big CIP program it will require borrowing and a lower bond rating or, or higher bond rating with the lower cost of borrowing is going to avoid additional costs to our rate payers, as Council Member Reddy shared earlier in her comments. So all of that needs to, put to be put together so that this change that is being proposed can be evaluated in context of all of that. So um, following up Council Member Getty's comments, I was thinking about, and I'd be happy to after other comments were made, to make a motion to table this item to a date in the future when all these things can be put together so that the public can see how this all fits together and the pros and, and cons and the benefits to the ratepayers for making this change. So thank you, Mayor Howard, for the opportunity. Thank you, Council Member G. Uh, we'll move on to um, Council Member Smith. Thanks so much again, uh, Mayor Howard. I appreciate it. I'm going to uh, continue this line of commentary um, about just needing to know a little bit more. Um, I do think that all of the kind of unanswered elements that um, my colleagues brought up previously are things that I'd like to get clarity on for sure. Um, I would also like to get clarity on, um, you know, just understanding the complete process if an account falls into arrears or if collections. Um, you know, I was having a conversation with the city manager earlier today and uh, I, I'm not sure that there's a full kind of funnel understanding of what happened um, with our collections process versus the county's um, collections process. Um, would really just love to get an understanding and, and kind of associated with that. I understand that there have been times when um, the city has been able to um, accommodate residents who are having trouble paying. Um, and I'm wondering if that flexibility will exist with this new um, partnership um, that we're proposing right now. I mean, I think um, just having the level of control that we have now um, over, you know, with the ability to help our residents um, who are having trouble paying is like a very, very important um, power for lack of a better term um, that I, I'm not sure that I necessarily think it's, it's wise to give up full swath. I also have really no conception of what this contractual arrangement looks like. What is the length of term? What are the termination kind of dynamics that we're associated with if this proves, you know, this program proves to fail um, ultimately. So I just think there are a lot of questions um, 
and would just love to see a bit more, um, a more detail uh, before I can commit to any action tonight. Thank you, Council Member Smith. Vice Mayor Hale. Thank you, Mayor and colleagues. Um, rounding out the conversation, I did attempt to reach out to some colleagues in those cities to um, gauge what the reaction had been. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a strong signal in advance of the meeting, uh, but I like that direction. I think it's also a difficult thing to gauge. Um, we can look at something as extreme as a, a default or an auction, which it sounds like we have decent data on. But what uh, members of the public were just describing is this notion of hardship, of putting aside the funds and not touching them. So I wonder if uh, other cities' billing departments could be helpful in understanding how often did um, were payments missed uh, at, uh, or uh, comparing city data with county data. And that seems uh, a little bit challenging to do. So I won't... I won't invent the model. I'm sure staff can figure that out, but um, it, it also seems difficult to collect um, the data. I do really appreciate uh, Councilman Reddy's analogy to PCE. Um, I do sit on the uh, Peninsula Clean Energy uh, Board as the representative for Redwood City, and um, that is a really accurate description of, of what it was and what it is, and it's in service of this bigger idea, which is having clean energy. And I think this is also in service of a bigger idea that will pay dividends to, to individual residents. But the problem, as one speaker said, is show me what it means, how it matters to me. Uh, so I think a combination of sort of a, a flow chart of what happens um, through the system, as Councilmember Smith was suggesting, some data, uh, as Councilmember G was suggesting, around what, um, what we saw in other cities that made the switch. Uh, and what are the benefits that an individual um, resident might experience, I think would really, would really go a long way uh, to helping bridge the gap between what our utilities uh, committee uh, saw and what our public is hearing and has concerns about. So I'd be supportive of uh, the uh, recommendation that I believe it was Council Member G wanted to make. Thank you, Vice Mayor Hill. And um, Council Member Aguirre, did you have your hand raised for a question? Oh, I forgot to lower it. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, so summing up the um, information received from my colleagues, um, I, I'd just like to, uh, and see if I missed anything, Mr. Jaw, but uh, I, I do like uh, what Council Member Reddy said and that, um, Vice Mayor Hale uh, saying in service of the bigger bigger picture, the bigger idea. I, I really, really appreciate that. But I think that maybe we needed to do a better job about getting down and drilling down to the everyday person. How is this impacting me? It, it's easier to sell a bigger picture sometimes and it's harder to reach everyone about how is this going to impact me and the way my bills will come in in the future. So I know there's a lot of misinformation out there and I, I'm so sorry for that. Um, I wish we could have done outreach sooner and more thoroughly, but with COVID there was a whole host of reasons why things didn't go as smoothly as we'd hoped. But uh, what I hear the questions are, are um, we wanna know from the lessons learned from our 10 cities that have signed up, what are the efficiencies they have seen? What are the savings they have seen? Do, are they glad they signed up? No regrets. I think that would be really useful information to have because most of these 10 cities are uh, as big or bigger than we are, which I think is encouraging, but I think it would be helpful to share that with the community about uh, what lessons learned they could share with us. I also hear that um, it, there's not a clear understanding of what the process is for someone, uh, the appeal process, penalties. Do we still have the program to help people apply if they don't qualify, if they qualify um, income-wise, do they still qualify for assistance? And my understanding is they do, 
but I don't think we probably got that message out clearly enough that there are still opportunities for people to get assistance from the city of Redwood City, even though the bill would go to the tax roll. Um, another interesting question is, what if it fails? Has anyone opted out? Is there that opportunity to opt out? Uh, what are our options? I did ask the city manager this earlier, and I guess I'll ask for confirmation. What I was told was there's a very uh, short window this year to sign up to be part of the billing for this year, that if we choose to delay it and get more information, we would probably have to defer it until next year. So I, I think in that question, I'd like to be sure that I have the correct answer, but and that may be the decision the council makes, but I, I just want to be sure that we have some answers to some of the questions. So I'll let Ms. Diaz and Mr. Jaw uh, answer any questions that people might have, and then we'll see what council would like to do. So yes, and I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Jaw. It's, it's my understanding that there's a very set time line that is required to act in a given year. Yes, uh, thank you, Melissa. Yes, it is correct. So this process is an annual process. So staff have to come back to the council every year for the list of parcels they're going to collect it through the property tax. We have to submit it comes uh, San Mateo County uh, Tax Collector Office by the um, July 1st of the year. So if we miss today event, uh, we will have to wait for one more year and then we will come back again um, sometime next year with a better information and propose this uh, proposal again. And then could you clarify that there was questions about penalties and fees and would the city be providing any assistance to people who have hardships in paying their bills? Okay, so uh, both system, collection system has a penalties and fees. Uh, so the city will provide the rate system program regardless of the, the sewer charges collected by the county or the sewer charges collected by the city. As long as someone is fit the uh, requirement of the assistance program, that resident will still receive the assistance. And we still have a program that they can qualify for, so that, that won't change. Yes. So, and um, as far as options, it seems like that there are three options. One is to do nothing. One is to move forward and vote to move forward tonight. And the other would be to defer it to next year with information gathering and maybe more robust outreach. So I'll turn to my council colleagues and see if someone would like to make a motion or if any council member would like to comment on what we've just talked about. Council Member G. Thank you, Mayor Howard. I'll, I'll take a, a run at this. Given, given the number of emails and public comments that we've received at such a late hour and we still have more stuff to go through, I'd like to make a motion to table this item to a date to be de determined by the city manager and the mayor for a more robust conversation about a more comprehensive conversation about this potential change to include all the things that were just mentioned by colleagues, you know, lessons learned, you know, the metrics, um, more outreach, a number of things that were discussed this evening so that the community has an opportunity to listen and participate and hopefully at an earlier hour so that the council can make a, a, a good decision for the entire community. Thank you, Council Member G. So the motion's been made by Council Member G, and I think he said it very well. Is there a second for that motion? Second. Second by Council Member Aguirre, and now a discussion. Um, Council Member Reddy? No, I have no discussion. I was going to uh, go in a different direction, but um, I, I guess I was going to ask if we were to schedule this for June 28th, would that be, that would be too late to put this into, um, into action? Well, that's a good question. I'll ask Mr. Jaw. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Council Member Reddy. I believe is if we vote on the uh, June 28, uh, could be uh, not able to make it by the uh, deadline of the July 1st. Okay, then I have no comments. And Council Member Aguirre, did you have any comment? I just, my, my initial comments um, still hold that I really think we need to um, take time and do more outreach mm -hmm. and make sure that folks understand it um, and so that's why I second the motion. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Espinoza Garnica. Hi, yes, uh, my question was the same as um, Council Member Reddy's, but um, I don't think I completely understood. So basically, if we say to defer it, it's still saying no, isn't it? Because like we'd have, we wouldn't meet the deadline. What if, if we do, what we're saying is that we're not going to, if this passes, we're not going to vote to move forward to do it by July 1st. We're going to discuss it uh, at a later time with all of the information we asked for, which was quite a bit. And uh, we'll have a better discussion and a more robust conversation with the public. And then it would come back next year. Oh, okay. Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. So I have a motion by Council Member G and seconded by Council Member Aguirre. Could we have a roll call, please? Yes. We'll start with Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Aguirre. Yes. Council Member Espinosa Garnica. Yes. Council Member G. Yes. Council Member Reddy. Yes. Vice Mayor Hale. Yes. And Mayor Howard. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much to our staff. I know you worked really hard on this. Uh, really appreciate your patience with this. And, and, and we'll get to work for next year. Okay, let's move on to item eight, because this is a very important one with a very immediate deadline. A public hearing on Redwood City's 2020 update for the Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan. And Mr. Jaw, you're going to introduce this item and our Public Works Superintendent of Water Utilities, Justin Chapel, will give the presentation. Mr. Jaw. Thank you, Mayor Howard and Council Terrence Jaw again, Director of Public Works. With me, Justin Chubbo, Public Works Superintendent, will present the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan update. By law, the water service provider, the city, is required to present this updated in the public hearing setting. I will now hand over to the presentation to Justin. Justin? Thank you, Terrence. Good evening, Mayor Howard, Vice Mayor Hale, and Council members. Tonight, I will be discussing the 2020 update to the Urban Water Management Plan. We'll briefly go over the requirements of the Urban Water Management Plan and its preparation, then onto our water supply and demand projections, a review of our 20 by 2020 water use target compliance, followed by water supply reliability, and the 2020 updates to the Water Shortage Contingency Plan. Next slide, please. So for Council action tonight is a consideration of information on the 2020 updates to the Urban Water Management Plan and Water Shortage Contingency Plan, followed by a public hearing and adoption of the two plans. Next slide. So the California Urban Water Management Planning Act requires urban water suppliers serving more than 3,000 customers or supplying more than 3,000 acre feet of water per annually to prepare and update the urban water management plan every five years and years ending five and zero and submit the plan to the state by July 1st of the following year. The urban water management plan must show a 20% reduction from baseline per capita or per person water use by 2020 and plan for water service reliability in normal, dry, and multiple dry years. Next slide. So why are urban water management plans important? Well, first, they're required by law. They're a key water supply and demand planning document. They're the foundation for water supply assessments for larger developments, a framework to discuss water shortage contingency planning and other issues. It provides key data to the state and enables eligibility for grant funding from the state. Next slide. So as you can see from this pie chart, about two thirds of our water use is for residential customers with commercial, industrial, and institutional uses making about 16%. Dedicated ir landscape irrigation with potable water makes up 9% and recycled water also at 
which includes mostly irrigation uses and some dual plumbing for toilet flushing. Next slide. Like many, if not all other water providers in the region, we have seen water demand decrease while population has increased, which can largely be attributed to our water conservation efforts of the community and the implementation of the Recycle Water Project. You might have noticed from the pie chart that in the early 2000s, we were exceeding our water supply from San Francisco, and it was after that when we implemented our water conservation and recycled water programs and significantly reduced our water demand. Next slide. So going forward after accounting for future past and active water conservation and recycled water use, Redwood City's total projected water demand is expected to be well below our contracted water supply limit or individual water supply guarantee of 12,243 acre feet per year that we have with SFBUC. It should also be noted that while water demand projections are not expected to decrease in the future, the rate demand is growing is about half the rate population is expected to grow. Next slide. The 2020 Urban Water Management Plan marks a milestone in the city's efforts to reduce water demand and compliance with the Water Conservation Act of 2009, which requires all urban water suppliers to reduce water demand 20% by 2020. Urban water management plans allow for several different ways to calculate the baseline per capita water use. For Redwood City, our baseline was established by taking the average per capita water use from 1999 to 2009, which is 139 gallons per person per day. In 2015, which was during the last drought, we were well below our interim target of 131. And as expected, water demand rebounded after the end of the drought in 2016. But the city still surpassed the goal to reduce water demand by 20%, with an actual gallons per person per day of 99, well below the compliance target of 124. Next slide, please. So what does our water supply reliability look like? In normal and wet years, we have more than sufficient supplies of potable water for the community, including the growth projections in the general plan and for some projects that may require general plan amendment. However, because water from the SFPUC makes up 100% of our potable water supply, it is only as reliable as the San Francisco Regional Water System. In 2018, the California State Water Resources Control Board adopted an amendment to the Water Quality Control Plan for the Bay Delta Estuary, which establishes water quality objectives to improve the Bay Delta ecosystem and increase the flow of water in the Tawana River, which makes up about 85% of the San Francisco Regional Water System supply. If the Bay Delta Plan is implemented, we could expect shores in dry years between 36 and 54%. However, the Bay Delta plan has not yet been implemented and there's some uncertainty around it for a couple reasons. First is the State Water Resources Control Board is currently negotiating with water rights holders, including the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, to find a middle ground to the adopted plan. Second, there have been over a dozen lawsuits filed in state and federal court challenging the State Water Board's decision on the Bay Delta plan, which may change what is finally implemented. San Francisco is also evaluating new sources of supply through an alternative water supply program, which is looking into different options, including new storage, groundwater banking, water transfers, and purified recycled water. Redwood City is also a partner on one of these projects called Crystal Springs Purified Water, which would pump purified water, recycled water to the Crystal Springs reservoirs so it can mix with water in the reservoir and be treated again at San Francisco's Harry Tracy drinking water treatment plant. Next slide. In the event of a supply shortfalls, the city will implement its water shortage contingency plan, which is designed to reduce water demand to meet the available supply. The 2020 water shortage contingency plan has been revised to include six standardized stages of action, whereas the previous version had five stages. The plan was designed, on two, designed around two principles. One being that cutbacks will focus on outdoor uses, which are general, relatively discretionary in comparison to indoor uses, such as drinking, cooking, and sanitary activities. And two, utilizing the city's water allocation program, cutbacks will be based on water needs and not historical use wherever possible. This helps to ensure that those customers who routinely conserve water are not penalized by receiving the same percentage cutback as non-conserving customers. The city's water allocation program has been around for about 20 years, and most customers have already experienced this program through the voluntary water target printed on their bills. The water allocation program utilizes daily rainfall and evaporation rates to calculate the amount of water that is needed for irrigated areas outdoors and for indoor uses, it provides a daily amount for each household member. Next slide. So this concludes the presentation. 
and we come back to the items for council to consider. Uh, and I, I return it back to the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapel. Um, in the interest of time, I'd now like to open the public hearing and turn it over to our city clerk to facilitate public comment. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Now's the time to take public comment on this item. In order to see how many speakers we have for public comment on this item, I ask that you raise your hand now if you wish to speak. And please keep it raised until your name is called to give your public comment. We'll give it just a minute. If you're joining by phone, press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself when prompted to speak. Okay. It looks like we have three speakers. Our last speaker is Laura Aiden. And after Ms. Aiden speaks, we'll close public comment on this item. Any additional speakers who queue up after Ms. Aiden, you're asked to email your comments to the city council at council at redwoodcity.org. Each speaker will be given two minutes. I will call your names two at a time in the order your hands are raised. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Our first speaker is Betty Fellows and Betty will be followed by Leanne Redford. Thank you. Um, two things. One, um, all my outside watering is done by a well, so it's going to be hard for me to cut back because I'm still cutting back from the last drought, so just to let you know where I stand. I would love to be able to do recycled water for flushing toilets, but I don't know how that works, and is, is that only for big businesses or whatever? Uh, third thing and final thing, in Israel, 85% of their water is recycled. That is 85% that of water that is used is recycled water. Uh, can't we be doing more? That's all, thank you. Thank you, Betty. Our next speaker is Leanne Redford and Leanne will be followed by our last speaker, Laura Aiden. Hello, uh, I'm Leanne Redford and I don't have a question, except for it's of course important to conserve water. I haven't seen a lot of information on this topic. And in fact, I was just trying to read the slides really quickly while Mr. Chapel was giving us the information. Is there somewhere else some information is available or did we receive something in the mail that I didn't look at? And I'm, I'm not really sure what is being asked of the public. It says adopt a resolution and I got, I wrote down U, W, M, P, and W. I think it had something to use Crystal Springs as an alternative. I'm just trying to find out exactly what this is. Ms. Redford, this is Mayor Howard. I was going to say I wrote your question down. And when we close the public hearing, I'll ask Mr. Chapel or Mr. Jaw to address your question. Thank you very much. Okay. Ms. Redford, okay, thank you. Our last speaker is Laura Aiden. Oh, thank you for the presentation. You know, this is all new information to me too, and I wasn't going to even speak on this because I was on the other sewage issue. Um, but it's very interesting what you're saying. I don't really understand what, what you're going to be voting on right now. However, you know, we're increasing housing, increasing people. They wanna make more people come here. And it seems like the water supply is decreasing. Uh, part of it is the state, you know, is flowing stuff down to the, you know, down, wait, just letting it out of the, the dams and taking away dams. And, you know, so I think maybe the state can do a better job of, of handling the water. Um, so, it was interesting about the recycled water. So I just wanted to add that in, you know, 
water prices are just going up, 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 and it seems like we have less and less water and they're just sort of letting it go. Okay, thank you, good luck. Thank you for all you do. I, I know you all work very hard. Thank you, Laura. Thank you to our speakers. We'll close the public hearing at this time. And I, I think that um, Ms. Redford asked a, a very good question and I, I'm going to let staff answer it, but I know it has to do um, with having a plan in place to be sure we meet goals that have been set, but I'd like you to give the reasoning uh, on why we are doing this. And I don't think the public missed anything. Uh, there was no notices sent out uh, because there were no change in rates. It's a plan that's going to be put in place that needs to be approved and has a deadline. And we're not the only ones who need to do this. So I'll let you elaborate further, either Mr. Chapel or Mr. Jaw. Yes, you're absolutely right, Mayor Howard. It is uh, you know, a plan that's required by uh, state law, and we have to complete it and submit it to the Department of Water Resources, California Department of Water Resources, by July 1st, in order to remain eligible for any sort of state uh, funding um, for for any sort of water activities. Um, so the the there was also a notice put in the uh, San Jose Daily Journal for the, for the past three Fridays, uh, notifying of the plan was going to be adopted. Um, and we did hold a community meeting uh, last week to get, provide more information about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now uh, we're going to open it up. I did love the question. Um, can't we do more with recycled water? Don't you love that question? <laughs> yeah. We certainly want to do more with recycled water, but uh, uh, I'll let uh, council now, we'll open it up discussion for council in the interest of time. So I will go back to the other board. Here we go. Uh, which council member would like to begin the discussion? If there are any, if, if there is any discussion or maybe someone would like to make a motion. Council member G. Mayor Howard, I wanna just piggyback off of your comment and thank you having been there in those early days with you and council chambers when meetings went to two or three o'clock in the morning can't we do more with recycled water? Um, and that's really great, Terrence and Justin, for your presentation. To look in 25 years that our potable water use may only increase by 3%, but our recycled water use will double. I'd love to see it triple um, on our, with regards to our use of recycled water. Um, you know, when you showed the chart that went back to where we were over our um, SFPUC water allocation and we dropped it because of recycled water and thank you to our residents for conservation too. It's remarkable what River City's done and what the residents have done. So to the extent there's things we can do more of, absolutely encourage it, support it, and want to do more with the recycled water now that the purple pipe's been brought over to the west side of 101. And just so those that are listening in, our new major developments are using recycled water. They are dual plumbed. Um, many of our larger projects are using it and paying for the extension of recycled water to different parts of the city. And so I would like to see staff take advantage of that and update our plan to see how we can spread the use of recycled water further west into other parts of our city. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Thank you. Council Member Aguirre. Thank you, Council Member G. I, too, having um, been part of Silicon Valley Clean Water and also having been the chair of the Utilities Committee, I can't tell you how exciting it is to hear folks wanting to use recycled water. And the fact that I'm proud that um, Redwood City does have that option, at least for big, big companies and other areas. And, I'm, and I know we want to bring those purple pipes and, you know, more folks to take advantage of them. So. With that, I would like to make a motion to adopt a resolution approving the urban water management plan. Thank you. The, mo the motion has been made to adopt the urban water management plan by Council Member Aguirre. And I heard a second from- uh, Council Member Reddy. Council Member Reddy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All good comments and a great presentation. So I'll turn it over to the city clerk, uh, Ms. Ignacio. 
Yes, uh, there, thank you. there are two actions, I understand. Yes, that's what I wanted to clarify, Mayor Harrod. Thank you. There's two resolutions to be adopted. Okay, and uh, can we take them together or do we need to do them separately? Um, you could vote on them together, Mayor Howard. Okay, thank you. So the motion's been made by Councilmember Geary, seconded by Councilmember Reddy to adopt the two resolutions before us. And I will turn it over to our city clerk for the roll call. Thank you. We'll start with Councilmember Aguirre. Yes. Councilmember Espinosa Garnica. Yes. Councilmember G. Yes. Councilmember Reddy. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Vice Mayor Hale. Yes. And Mayor Howard. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much. And, and my congratulations to the community that we are well below the compliance target because of all the, the measures that we have taken on as a community. Congratulations to all of us and let's keep up the good work. So moving on to item 9A, matters of council interest. This is a city council referral, uh, which is for future consideration of a local eviction protection moratorium. If the state of California does not extend SB 91 beyond June 30th, 2021, our city manager, Melissa Stevenson Diaz, will give an overview of the referral process. And then council member Reddy will have the first opportunity to speak on this item. Yes, thank you very much. So just briefly, I wanted to share that a, a city council member referral is a request by a council member for the rest of the council to decide whether to direct staff to work on a policy matter for action in the future. So it's not a decision this evening on the item before you. At this time, staff have not conducted any policy or legal analysis, and so there's no staff recommendation particularly related to this item. And in just a moment, Council Member Reddy will talk about the reason for her request. I did want to note that adopting a residential eviction moratorium by urgency ordinance would be under the city's police powers. The city council has the ability to enact uh, regulations that protect the health, safety, and welfare of Redwood City residents. And if the council tonight directs staff to do so, we would work with the city attorney's office to prepare an urgency ordinance that would be considered by the city council in the future. That would include analyzing a potential ordinance, the resources required to implement it. It could include a special meeting to collect information regarding Redwood City residents' uh, vulnerability to evictions and potential impacts on property owners and would also take into account legal considerations due to the inherent risks of an eviction moratorium. And an urgency ordinance does require a vote of at least five council members. So with that background, I wanted to turn it over to council member Reddy. Thank you so much, um, city manager Diaz and mayor Howard. This has been such a hard year and especially hard for our low income residents, many of whom were already just barely hanging on. I'm asking my council colleagues to join me in directing staff to return to us at a future meeting with an urgency ordinance to extend the residential eviction moratorium in the event the state does not extend protections that were granted under SB 91. The county recently alerted us that the $47 million fund made available to pay 80% of back rent if landlords agreed to forgive 20% has been grossly undersubscribed. Because there's concern that the state needs time to figure out how to make the program less cumbersome and both landlords and tenants need time to be informed about the program and to obtain assistance if necessary to access, um, access the funds, the eviction moratorium must be extended either by the state or by us in the city. Redwood City can be proud of the amazing list of initiatives it undertook during this past year to entertain and protect 
residents and their families during the pandemic. We must do this last thing to protect the most vulnerable of our residents from eviction and possible homelessness. So I'm asking my colleagues to please join me in, um, in directing staff to bring this ordinance to us at a later date. Thank you, Council Member Reddy. I see a hand raise um, for a clarifying question, possibly Council Member Aguirre. I'm sorry, Mayor, I didn't lower it previously. Oh. Okay. Well, maybe what we will do is move on to um, public comment on this item and I'll turn it over to the city clerk to facilitate public comment. I, I do see a hand raised, Mr. Uh, Cordova. Mr. Cordova. Yes, I have two hands raised for two phone numbers from uh, public comments that would like to participate when the time comes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Espinosa Garnica, you have your hand raised? Yes, just wanted to clarify. Right now, for clarifying questions, and after public comment um, is for council discussion. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll move on to public comment, and recognizing that Mr. Cordova will be participating, I'll turn it over to our city clerk. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Um, now it's time for public comment on this item. In order to see how many speakers we have for public comment. I ask that anyone who wishes to speak on this item, raise your hand now and keep your hand raised until your name is called to give your public comment. We'll keep, um, give it a minute or so. If you're joining by phone, pre, uh, please press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute yourself when prompted to speak. And um, Mayor Howard, I understand um, Mr. Cordova has two public um, speakers that he's helping to facilitate comment for, and I'm happy to start with them. That would work out very well, thank you. Okay, um, but just, just a moment, um, we'll, we'll see the other speakers queuing up. It looks like we have, 13 speakers. That's um, in addition to the two that uh, Mr. Cordova will help facilitate. Okay, we've got 15. Okay, we have 15 speakers plus two with Mr. Cordova, so we have 17 speakers total. Our last speaker on this Please item. I have the first speaker ready oh, to oh, hold, speak, yes, hold and on, then just... first they're gonna speak in Spanish and then I will translate into English. Okay, um, our last speaker uh, will be Adele's. And after Adele speaks, um, we'll close public comment on this item. So we'll start with Mr. Cordova, and he will facilitate uh, the Spanish-speaking public speakers. If you could um, announce the names of the speakers that you are assisting, you will have two minutes. Well, the speakers will have two minutes to speak. We'll run the timer when the speakers are talking, and we'll stop the timer while their comments are being translated to English by Mr. Cordova and Gonzalo, if you can start, please do.
todavía no ha sido entregado y llegado a su destino. Por eso esta noche, estoy aquí para pedirles a los concejales que preparen la extensión del moratorio como ciudad para que entre para que entre en vigor el día primero de julio si es que el gobernador no lo extiende muchas gracias esperando ser escuchada que tengan una feliz noche Dime un momento, señora, no me cuelgue, ¿sí? Yo no me saqué. We will wait to just a moment and our translator will provide the English translation of the public comment that we just heard. And I, my name is, I live in the city of Redwood City for more than 20 years, and I'm part of Save and Action in the Bay Area, and I'm congregated in the church of San Antonio de Paula in Melo Park, and I'm part of a praying group in the San Jose Church. My family and my children and I, we work here in the county of San Mateo. My grandchildren assist to the schools here in the city. That's why I would like to see my city and my country stable and without eviction this July 1st, because although the referendum is coming with hints of a normality, we don't know. We know that we're about to be evicted Thousands of families are in the same situation, even that yet the jobs have not been established completely. And the state funds destined to this distribution to the families that we have not been able to pay our rent, it still have not been given into its destination. That's why tonight. I am here to ask you, to all the council members, that you get ready to extend the moratorium as a city. So that it starts on July 1st, if the governor does not do it. Thank you very much and hoping to be heard. Have a wonderful night. That's the first comment of one of our Spanish speakers, and we're going to hear the second comment now. Just a moment, please. Thank you. And Mr. Cordova, if um, you can speak a little bit louder the next time, um, that would be good. 
you sound a little faint. I'm not obtaining a response from the second participant. So we can go back if you prefer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cordova, for your assistance. Um, and you'll let us know if the other speaker is, is ready. We'll go now to um, our speakers here. Um, we have 15, we have 14 now. I will call your names two at a time and we will start with Joe Ho and Joe Ho will be followed by Christina Drogan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Joe Ho, my pronouns are they and them. Um, I'm, uh, speaking in um, favor of uh, council directing staff to uh, draft this a very important urgency ordinance. Uh, eviction protections must be um, extended through the end of the year, um, even if the state fails to act. Um, it's uh, been an unbelievable year. Uh, and after all of the uh, pain of the pandemic, uh, um, it would, uh, it's just so important to prevent evictions at this time. So, um, thank you, Councilmember Reddy, for bringing this to Council, and I really urge all of you to, um, uh, move quickly on this. Thank you, Yoho. Our next speaker is Christina Drogan. Christina will be followed by Chan Chi Ma. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, I'm, hi, I'm, a, um, I'm speaking out against this eviction moratorium. Um, I am just so frustrated by, um, I'm, I'm a landlord in the area. My family has been providing affordable housing in Redwood City since the 1980s, and I've been a day-to-day -day landlord for almost 20 years. Um, I want to speak out today because I am just so frustrated and so tired that um, with all of the things that Redwood City has imposed and making the land, job of being a landlord highly undesirable in Redwood City. Um, I know that this has been an incredible year and I know it has been so hard and we have been in crisis, but it can't be solved on the backs of one small population of being landlords. Um, and I know that th th you had spoken about the rent forgiveness, um, which was fantastic. And I had a couple of tenants utilize it. Um, it was a much more palatable resolution to our crisis but landlords are always the scapegoats. It's always that rent is too high. We need to stop the evictions. But the the the, the bills for landlords don't stop. Um, during the pandemic, my bills went actually up while my income went went down. Um, I had many more plumbers I'd, on a day to day basis at my units because of the increased number of people at home, we had more people using garbage disposal, more people flushing, more people, everything. I had so much more plumbing bills than I ever have before. Um, the appliances would break. People's stoves would give out because they're cooking so much more. And while that does not seem like a big deal maybe to you, when these things start happening across the board. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, for your comments. Our next speaker is Chan Chi Ma, and Chan Chi will be followed by Ian W. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Chan Chi Ma. 
Uh, um, I appreciate uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I will be uh, recommend the city council to vote no uh, on directing staff to extend the eviction ban. Uh, we are not asking here. Uh, we are not here to ask for any favor, but uh, just ask to be treated fairly. Uh, the couple reasons for for my request. Um, entire California is ready to fully reopen by tomorrow. There are plenty of jobs opening without uh, enough employee and plenty of fat and state and local rental assistant and aid to tenant. So there's no ex no um, excuse for, for financially not paying the rent. Uh, the second reason is um, let the st state lawmaker worry about eviction moratorium duration. The local government priority should be to disperse the rental relief fund ASAP. Per San Jose Sanctuary, uh, Mercury News last week, Currently, there are 2.6 billion rental assistance funds available to the whole state, 500 million alone for Bay Area, but only 20 million have been dis distributed so far for the entire California. This is unacceptable. We have tenants that actually, uh, uh, we, we applied for this rental assistance three months ago. We haven't heard a word from the, from the uh, city. So I think that's something that city and staff want to focus on to address. And instead of, um, um, instead of going to extend the eviction moratorium, let, the, let that be the state's uh, lawmaker's problem. And uh, so basically I hope the city and staff can actually look at how to speed up the process to, to uh, disperse the rental relief fund to the landlord that's in need and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chang Chi. Our next speaker is Ian W. followed by Catherine Zhu. Hello. Um, so first off, I want to uh, thank uh, the council and uh, council member Reddy for agendizing this item. Uh, I want to express my strong support for this moratorium, uh, especially given the long-term and wide-ranging destabilizing impacts of COVID. I also want to point out that the previous caller was dead wrong in claiming that um, the fact that the state is reopening means that everything can be back to normal and there's no excuse for paying the rent anymore. We all know that there are wide ranging financial ripples coming out of the, uh, coming out of the COVID pandemic, which is not over yet for one thing. And second, it's gonna take a lot of people a long time to find you know, a job again. And third, um, people are gonna fall off a cliff because they've spent a year under, under extreme financial hardship, and that doesn't just spring back. They have to catch up to where they were before they can start moving forward again. It's absurd to leave people out in the cold, and we're going to cause a second financial crisis by expecting people to immediately be able to, you know, just jump back into everything again and pretend that the last year didn't happen financially. Um, you know, if landlords are so concerned about not having, you know, not having the money, well, the landlords can do what they're telling their tenants to do and they can get a job. <laughs> being a landlord is not being a job. It's where it's profit it's it's profiting and lining your pockets off of other people's hard work. Um, we need to protect people's homes. We need to give people the basic security to live their lives safely and healthily. And that should be our primary concern. And so again, I thank the council for bringing this. Uh, I hope they move on it. I hope they move quickly. I know that the city missed the opportunity to act on something similar to this last year by being too slow about it. And um, I hope that we don't give in uh, to um, profit motives rather than meeting human needs. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Our next speaker is Catherine Zhu. Catherine will be followed by Adriana Guzman. Hi, my name is Michael Solorio and I live in District 6 and I really appreciate y'all, the city council members, the mayor for putting this on the agenda. It's crucial and I feel like this is this is pretty cool to see that you've kind of like listened to all the speakers at the prior meetings who have called for this. So I'm grateful for this discussion and I do hope that y'all approve this because yeah, we want to save all the people who are at risk of homelessness right now. And I would also like to see the city 
prioritize and spend more money and resources in helping people apply for the rental assistance. I disagree with what Chen Chi said earlier about how people <laughs> should, should, I disagree with that bootstraps attitude, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. But I agree that like, it'd be great for the city to spend more resources, perhaps give more money to the Fair Oaks Community Center so that they could help more people fill out that super long application that's really long, complicated, hard to get through. Um, so yeah, if y'all could please help fill the gap um, and that prevents people from accessing those rent assistance resources, I think that'd be optimal. Thank y'all. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker is um, Adriana Guzman, followed by Clara Jackal. Good evening, City Council members. My name is Adriana Guzman. I am a lead organizer with Faith in Action Bay Area. And I'm here today to urge you to create an extension to the eviction moratorium so we can keep our families home, so they can recover from this pandemic and we can prevent an increase of homelessness. Please indicate your city staff to prepare a citywide moratorium extension that should take effective starting in July 1st. If the state and the county fail to do what is morally right to do. I also want to thank you for all your leadership in the county and the step that has taken so we can have this conversation tonight. I really want to thank and appreciate your work and the city staff work. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you, Adriana. Our next speaker is Clara Jackal. Clara will be followed by Kevin Guibara. Uh, thank you so much. On this item, I'm speaking as a member of Faith in Action Bay Area, I would say resident and I'm a member of Many Journeys Metropolitan Community Church. I urge you to vote in favor of having staff prepare the urgency ordinance. As I mentioned, no extension of the current moratorium has been yet been secured at the state level, which could leave residents at risk of homelessness in just two weeks from now. Although San Mateo County is preparing to celebrate reopening tomorrow, residents who have been hit hardest financially by the pandemic have not seen recovery yet. The emergency rental assistance program has been difficult to access and efforts by now being added by assistance agencies will take time to be rolled out. More fundamentally, the types of jobs that were eliminated due to the pandemic are just now starting to come back and be hiring again. So letting the eviction moratorium end at the end of this month is still much too soon. The impact on our community is too great to take the risk that the state may not act in time. So I'm asking you to take the action requested by Councilmember Reddy and recommended by Faith in Action to direct staff to prepare the city eviction moratorium and keep our residents in their homes. Thank you. Ms. Aguilar, before you Thank go on, you. Mayor Howard, do you yes. need a motion to extend? Yes. Thank I you, was, Council Member G. That's exactly what I was going to do. I figured this was a good time. Uh, yes, I need a motion to extend till 1130. So moved. Moved by Council Member G and seconded by Second. Council Member Reddy. <laughs> and a roll, roll call vote, please. Yes. We'll start with Council Member Espinosa Garnica. Yes. Council Member G. Yes. Council Member Reddy. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Aguirre. Yes. Vice Mayor Hale. Yes. And Mayor Howard. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to the city clerk. Thank you. We'll continue with our next speaker will be Kevin Guibara, followed by Brandon Enriquez. Hi, um, I'm a property manager in Northern City. I manage about a little over 100 units. Um, this is a tough decision for you guys and just listening to the speakers, you have no data to make this decision. We don't know if this decision is gonna help 10 people in Redwood City or if it's gonna help help the apartment population. Um, for my apartment stock of 100 units right between about uh, Jefferson and Woodside Road, um, I had six uh, COVID hardships. And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were five. Uh, two, we set up payment plans to help them get through the pandemic um, that included rent forgiveness. Um, three of three out of the six or 
three out of the five at the beginning of the pandemic moved out, out by July 1st. They moved into the family or moved somewhere else because they didn't want their debt to pile up. Um, and then um, more recently, um, number six um, is a 50 year old software engineer um, who I don't think is out of work. Um, but based on the notices that I gave, um, you know, per the state requirements, that he's only allowed to pay, that he only has to pay 25%. He started paying 25%. Um, <clears throat> so he's my only COVID hardship left out of over 100 units. Um, and I, I think it's clear that he's able to pay. Um, so I don't think we should extend the moratorium. Um, and I think we should get more data too, to figure out if extending the moratorium, who it's gonna help, how many people it's gonna help, because it, you might be better off providing individual assistance to people who need it um, on a more specialized basis, as opposed to making a blanket decision um, that stops laws that were in place for a long time. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Our next speaker is Brandon Enriquez. Brandon will be followed by Nani Friedman. Hello, Council. I am Brandon, um, living in Redwood City and a member of the Silicon Valley Democratic Socialists of America. And I would like to first and foremost thank the Council for um, bringing this up. Thank you, Council Member Diana Reddy. And I highly encourage the Council to uh, move to do uh, to study this proposal for a moratorium. Uh, we have no data on who this would help yet because we haven't done the study yet. And I really hope that the council chooses to do uh, the study and that their staff allocates uh, resources and time to do the study and come up with a policy as soon as possible. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused so many hardships for so many people, especially uh, working class, low income people. and as we know, the state moratorium and state laws were not enough to, to handle the devastation uh, that's happened. And there's a ticking time bomb of even more evictions if we don't act now on this. Uh, we need a moratorium to protect our most vulnerable people in our communities. Uh, I believe the council should stand with the most vulnerable and those that will be impacted the most negative. And in this instance, instance will be uh, renters. And, you know, housing is a human right. Getting income out of other people's income is not a human right. And I hope the council takes that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Our next speaker is Nani Friedman, followed by Rovi Lynn Anton Antonio. Good evening, council members. Uh, my name is Nani Friedman. I'm a Sequoia High School graduate and an organizer with Faith in Action Bay Area here in Redwood City. I would like to convey the importance of this discussion for the residents of our city and our county. The steps you have taken in the last few weeks have been critical for all of Redwood City and your leadership has had effects beyond in the county as well. After you voted to send a letter to Governor Newsom, the county and four other cities have followed suit. San Mateo City followed your lead and sent mailers. And the action that you are considering tonight is the most important decision that you can lead on. This is the moment to lead with what is morally right what will take care of one another in a time of desperation and insecurity. Your leadership on this decision tonight can prove that you are there for the most vulnerable in your city. Regardless of the actions of other politicians, you have their backs and you have the courage to stand between them and homelessness. This is not the state lawmakers problem as a previous commenter said, or the county lawmakers problem, or even your problem. This is the people's problem, the problem of working class people of color and immigrants in your city. Let's be clear about that. And we hope that as the policymakers closest to the community, you will do what is needed to protect them. We are just two weeks away from the eviction cliff with still no bill yet introduced in Sacramento to extend these protections. 
and the stress, anxiety, panic, and worry among thousands of people in your city, we know there are thousands. The, that, that stress and panic increases day by day and residents are making plans to move, to leave as, as one of our commenters early, shared earlier, or whether to stay and risk legal recourse. We hope that your decision tonight will make the critical progress needed. Thank you. Thank you, Nani. Our next speaker is Roby Lynn Antonio, followed by Laura Aiden. Good evening, Mayor Howard and City Council. Roby Lynn Antonio with the California Apartment Association. A CAA does not support an eviction um, moratorium extension, recognizing that any extension, state or local, will continue to force some owners to provide housing with little to no compensation. This is simply unfair. A better approach and a win-win situation would be to support efforts to increase utilization of the emergency rental assistance program and enable maximum to enable maximum beneficiaries. Um, this would be to support the distribution of funds and expedite the distribution of funds. It's currently concerning that in San Mateo County, of the $23 million that's rent requested, only 1.5 million has been funded. We support removing barriers to apply for the program, such as um, looking at the income eligibility and removing some lengthy application process for renters. Uh, most importantly, I believe there is a great need for the community to understand the current protections that protect rental arrears accrued during the pandemic due to COVID. As you know, under SB 91, rental arrears that were accrued during the pandemic due to the financial distress that um, the renters had suffered is protected beyond June 30th, regardless of if, if, if SB 91 is not renewed. Finally, uh, California Apartment Associations want to continue um, our support in being partners to the community by um, working on the outreach to landlords, offering help to faith-based leaders, as well as community groups to contact rental property owners who are hesitant um, on applying for the program. We are happy to serve as ambassadors of this rental assistance program and encourage more applicants so that way we can get more beneficiaries under this program and rental arrears are paid. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roby Lynn. Our next speaker is Laura Aiden, followed by Adels. Um, thank you very much for, for having this discussion. You know, I, I really, it's really difficult when you have people, you know, going to go out and you want to protect them. You know, however, this moratorium has gone on for a year and a half and it's, it's at some point you have to just stop it and people have to find a way to do what they have to do, whether it's getting a job or, you know, going in rooming with someone else or whatever it is. It's really a, a big burden to, to take things away from, from one person and say, well, we're going to give it to you. And it's sort of like stealing. I'm taking your money and we're just going to give it to you over here. So, you know, these people that are, that own, uh, that rent, they want to make nice housing for people, but they also have costs. They have costs that haven't gone down. You still have to pay the mortgage or you lose it, the whole thing. And it's your life savings that you're is just dwindling and dwindling away. And some of it is for, for retirement or whatever, but the, you know, between the mortgage, the taxes, all of the upkeeps and what you have to do for it, it's a tremendous cost for these people and they haven't had relief either. So we need to give the landlord some relief. And, you know, the faith in action, you know, I, I really hear you. I mean, you need to help out. So maybe you could take some of these people into your homes. You know, it costs you money too of water, gas, electric, and all the different things to do that. But if you're really feeling this, maybe you can help out in that way. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Our next speaker is Adele's, followed by our last speaker, Julie Pardini. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, good evening. My name is Adele. Um, um, uh, thank you everybody to stay late on this council meeting. And uh, the proposal sounds like a benefit for the tenant, but it is a nightmare for the housing provider. Um, we have done um, affordable housing for six years. And during the pandemic, we had the tenants pass due rent, but uh, we applied for the 
uh, the rental relief program on the March 17th, but almost three months, uh, we, heard, we have heard nothing from the program. We check on the program every week and uh, until today, our case has not been assigned a case manager yet. So it's been three months and also the, the past due run is for almost a one year. So um, tomorrow the entire state will be reopened. Every business will remain open in normal way. Why we have to extend this uh, non-reasonable proposal until end of year? I think over the, this, uh, um, this bill is over a year, enough is enough. And uh, just like the gentleman said, housing is a human right, but still, still money for others is not, the, is not the decent, is not the right way to do it, okay? And um, um, without the rent collect, a lot of, a lot of landlord cannot have a money to pay the property tax. If you guys are stayed, um, extend this one to end of year, and I, I bet a lot of the people, a lot of um, property owner will not have money to pay the property tax at the end of this year, unless you extend the property tax collection date. Thank you. Thank you, Adels. Our final speaker is Julie Pardini. Julie, go ahead. Julie, you have to unmute yourself if you can. Oh, there we go. Julie, you're unmuted. You can start um, speaking now. Um, okay, Ms. Pardini was our final speaker. She may be experiencing some technical issues. Okay. Okay. Julie, if you can hear us, if you want to email your public comment to the council, um, please feel free to do that. Mayor Howard. Thank you. I, I'm sorry that um, we lost our last speaker. Okay. Uh, sorry. We're going oh. Julie, are you there? Go ahead, Hello, Julie. am I there? You yes, are. yes, you are. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, yes, I am. Restart the call. My God. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, um, go ahead. Brief. Uh, can I go ahead and speak? Okay, yes. Thank you yes, very you much. Yes, you can. Uh, uh, okay. I. I. Okay. All right. I just wanted to thank you. Uh, first of all, to thank uh, Diana Reddy for uh, uh, suggesting this. I. I. I urge you to pass it. I have been a landlord. I own multiple prop property in Redwood City from a very early age. Um, I, I am not having difficulty and thank God neither are my tenants. Uh, but if they were, I would do everything in my power uh, to keep them where they are. Uh, this has been a tremendously difficult year for everybody. You can just imagine what it would be like to lose your home in the middle of a year like this. I, I urge you to pass it. Uh, 
Um, I know all of my tenants and they know all of me and they all know me. Um, I would do anything to keep them where they are. So I, I certainly hope you will pass this this evening. And that concludes my, my uh, message. Hello. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. I'm glad that we were able to hear from you. Okay, we are closing the public comment and we are opening up for council discussion at this time. So I will entertain council discussion. Would anyone like to begin? Council member Espinoza Garnica. Yes, hi. Well, I'd also like to say thank you to council member Reddy. Also, I'm gonna fidget a little because my leg fell asleep at the most inopportune time. And um, yeah, I think it is very essential. I, I appreciate everyone voicing their comments um, during public comment. I didn't think the folks that are listening have a clear idea of the housing crisis. So just to put it out there, you know, um, I'm part of the interagency committee along with council member Diana Reddy and there is, you know, data so far about San Mateo County having 10,580 households at risk. Um, and folks in my district are majority renters. So it's very at home, the issue um, is very pertinent. And the median gross rent is about 2,400 uh, a month. So there is difficulty for, like people are experiencing right now. And even if the doors are opening, I hope that we understand on council, like the doors are opening to go in maskless, what have you. Um, and, but that doesn't mean everyone's back um, at their job. And a lot, knowing also, also being on the interagency, you know, committee, I know that a lot of the tenants approval, like money that it, the, that's being approved is still pending. There's a lot of, um, you know, tenants cases that have been submitted, but very few, it's like, at the most like 60 since May, we just had this like meeting recently, um, had received any money, any money back from the relief program. So things are very slow. Um, we're very hard hit, the working class community, especially um, those of color, um, those with family. And I hope that, you know, those who are demanding that, you know, their renters find a job, you know, it's like, being a landlord isn't something that is sustainable for our economy. We don't really want landlords. We can, I can hear there is some resentment towards um, tenants by landlords growing because housing and investing in multiple housing, owning up to 10 houses is a profit. And being a housing for all, all advocate is about knowing that housing is an essential and a human, it's an essential human right, it shouldn't be denied um, or seen as a commodity. So we really shouldn't be, you know, navigating on a system that, you know, wants to promote landlords or rely on landlords to provide the affordable housing. And, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of like ADUs and such for like the meantime, but we're definitely trying to move away from that. And like, they have, many speakers pose a lot of issues that have to go beyond the city you know, the state and federal level about, you know, mortgage rates and such like that. But, um, you know, ultimately the stress shouldn't be coming from, you know, knowing where you're going to live. So ultimately everyone who's frustrated from a landlord to like a renter should be fighting for social housing because obviously people have personal interests um, and seeing housing, however, but seeing housing as a commodity, however, it creates a lot more tension. And this is a need that we just can't deny anyone just because it inconveniences someone's wallet. Um, with those with 10 units, you know, it's not easy to come up with this money at this moment. Um, you know, imagine finding a job to pay off for the 10 houses, you know, one job to pay off for 10 units. You know, it's hard to sympathize um, when it's thrown at you that way. You know, it just seems so 
short-sighted. So I hope that folks realize that, you know, if a landlord with 10 homes is having difficulty coming up with money for their sewer, sewers and all that stuff, imagine just a regular tenant. So who doesn't own anything? So we're already burdened with the housing crisis and a large homeless population in our city. Um, and we're still figuring out why that is, but a lot of it is because economic stability, instability. So we're gonna have to invest in that infrastructure. But right now, the answer is the eviction moratorium. And you know we can't rely on these landlords to provide social housing or affordable housing, I mean, and yeah, that shouldn't really be what weighs on us on this decision the most. It's really about making sure people have secure housing situations and arrangements that are safe. And um, especially during a vulnerable time because people haven't really picked up like um, that quickly. And so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Would any other council member, uh, council member Jeff G. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Um, a, a couple of questions, one for our city manager. Um, City Manager Stevenson Diaz, I believe we got a legislative update from Sacramento earlier today. Could you share that with, you know, at, at the council meeting with people that are still listening in? Yes, thank you. So our legislative consultant let us know that there continue to be talks at uh, the state uh, regarding the possibility of state legislators approving or recommending that the, the governor approve an extension to the eviction moratorium that is tied up with budget discussions. And there are several steps before the state budget is approved. Um, we understood that there could be a vote this evening actually related to a junior budget bill with additional budget bills to follow. So it is definitely still an evolving situation. The governor is expected to sign off on the budget until June 30th. And it is also possible there will be additional bills after that time. So it's it remains very fluid. Great, thank you. And, and I think I asked you earlier this morning when we talked, if council were to approve this, um, would that mean staff would be assigned and would that staff assign do this in addition to what they're doing or would something come off their list so that they can focus on this? Um, so I would likely be leaning on our housing leadership manager, uh, Lynn Lancaster, uh, possibly assistance as well from Terry Chin in Fair Oaks Community Center. And then we would certainly be needing um, legal counsel. So both our, our city attorney's office, possibly outside counsel. So um, yes, those are all people who had full calendars um, for the next couple of weeks. So there would be some impacts. Is there something they wouldn't do in those couple of weeks if they were to focus on this? I don't think we could name um, a very specific deliverable, but um, on, on the housing side of things, I mean, both Lynn and Terry are extraordinarily busily working on both assistance to residents and to um, short and longer term planning on housing related needs. Thank you. And, and then to our city attorney, one of the speakers I believe talked about SB 91, if I wrote that down correctly, and if I may, I may not have written down correctly, but are there any current laws on the books or regulations about not evicting people that have accrued rental debt during COVID? Um, so council member G, SB 91, if the tenant fit within the protections of SB 91, then they would not face eviction for rent accrued during the SB 91, SB 91 timeframe even after um, June 30th. So that's, let me just reflect if I heard that correctly to say, I'm a tenant, I've, I've not been able to pay my rent from January 1st to June 30th because of COVID or a COVID related loss of job, care for a family member, medical, whatever. July 1, I still would not be able to be evicted if I fit those parameters. If you um, submitted a, a declaration to your landlord showing that mm -hmm. you had um, a COVID related uh, financial distress, 
and mm -hmm. paid 25 percent mm -hmm. of the debt okay. um so the portion that was accrued between uh, March 1st, 2020 and June 30th, 2021, that could not serve as a basis for for um, eviction post June 30th. But, but the, the tenant would have to have paid 25%? Yes. Okay, all right. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor Howard. Thank you, Council Member G. Um, before we uh, go to Council Member Smith, I, I think I need to ask for an extension on our meeting. Bear with me. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to extend the meeting to, um, well, why don't we just say midnight and hopefully we won't need that. i like to make the motion, Mayor. Okay. And I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Council Member G. Yes. Council Member Reddy. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Aguirre. Yes. Council Member Espinosa Garnica. Yes. Vice Mayor Hale. Yes. And Mayor Howard. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Smith, would you like to speak? Yeah, thank you so much, Mayor Howard. Um, so, this comes obviously at the end of this incredible journey that we've all been on uh, with COVID-19. It's been truly a challenge for everyone um, across the country, across the world, and we're not out of it yet. And uh, I'm concerned. I have some serious concerns about what's going to happen with this um, eviction moratorium cliff that we you're about experience. And um, I will say that it is not the fault of the cities. Um, if anything, I believe that the state and county did not act in a sufficient way to accommodate for this issue that is upon us. It will happen in two weeks. It, that is an immutable fact. Everything else is somewhat speculative at this point. And um, because I am not confident that the state or county will act in a way um, that will help to protect our marginalized, the marginalized members of our community, um, the city has to step in. We have to do something. There, there has to be some conversation around this. Otherwise, we are going to have the direct impacts of this eviction moratorium cliff. We will see increased homelessness on our streets. Um, we will see um, possibly um, issues around hunger start to increase a bit more as well. Um, you know, it's something that we've been talking about for the last few weeks. And again, the state and um, the county levels have not acted. I'm not prepared to sit back and say, what is going to happen to these vulnerable communities if the state does not act? So I think that we have to look at this. Um, I think that we have to look at it in a rigorous way. Um, I do have a question for the maker of the referral. Um, would you be open to evolving your um, proposal um, rather than six months, have it be three months? I'm just kind of, op I'm wondering if you're open to that. And that gives us a little bit more flexibility um, over the coming months as obviously things continue to change. But um, with that said, I, I just don't see how we do not look at this. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And my sole reason for wanting to offer this opportunity to extend the moratorium is merely to give landlords and tenants the opportunity to access the funds that are available. And so I, um, I agree with you that it, it, would, it could hopefully be done in um, three months rather than six months. So so thank you for your question. And I, and if it would be more, uh, if it would make this request more palatable to my colleagues, I would absolutely uh, agree to that change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other council comments or discussion? Uh, I'll, I'll call on Vice Mayor Hale. Uh, and Council Member Espinosa Garnica, I'll come back to you, but I want to hear from those who haven't had a chance to speak yet. Vice Mayor Hale. Thank you. And apologies, my light went out. So, oh, there we go. There we go. Um, 
I, I had a cl- couple of questions. Um, uh, the city manager had mentioned that there we have uh, our, I, I actually don't recall what you called it, our policing capability. Um, do we have to show any burden of proof in order to uh, execute such a policy? Do we have to demonstrate the hardship or is that not a part of um, making a policy like this? Could you clarify that? Thank you. Yes, it's under the city's police powers and for an urgency ordinance, the city council would need to make findings. And to do that, you'd need to have evidence of harm. And so you would need to be able to rely on documentation of um, negative impacts people are experiencing. And so that's why I earlier mentioned that it, it would likely be necessary if the city council wanted to proceed. Um, while we have heard testimony of significant concerns now now on two evenings, I don't think we actually have much data in hand showing, say, eviction notices or, or something else that could be relied upon um, in the way it was in the previous uh, ordinance that the, the council developed. Okay, yes, and I have heard, I've heard many of these stories as well, and they're very compelling, um, but what you're saying is that we need more um, less anecdotal evidence, we would need something more concrete. So the some of the community partners who would come to us, uh, like Faith and Anne, perhaps would um, would need to assist with, you know, providing that gathering it up. Um, what happens if we don't have that? Are we? What do we do about the findings? Well, I will also point to our, our senior assistant city attorney, the, the challenge at that point is it is um, it is less strong of a case if the city's action were challenged. And um, while there is a lot of discussion happening, you know, you know, in the region and statewide over concerns about what's going to happen, um, we don't yet uh, know how legally defensible ordinances might be at a, at a local level. And so um, there is, I believe, some risk associated with not having a strong basis. And are, are, what other cities in San Mateo County are considering similar ordinances? I'm going to ask if our, thank you, Eleanor, if you'd be willing to, to take that up. Um, so there are two counties thus far who have adopted um, uh, local eviction moratoriums, um, Marin County in San Francisco. Um, there are a couple of other uh, counties and cities that are considering uh, Santa Clara, Mountain View, South San Francisco, uh, Contra Costa, and Concord, but only two have acted, Marin County and San Francisco. Okay, thank you. And then um, what would need to happen to bring the urgency ordinance forward? I would presume we need another hearing. Um, when, would, when would we envision that happening and what would move off of our agenda? So that could be either a city council meeting, um, and so we'd have to schedule likely a special meeting, I would say, before the council meeting of the 28th. Um, another alternative would be potentially to ask the Housing and Human Concerns Commission to take in testimony. They're scheduled to meet next Tuesday, um, the 22nd. And so that potentially could give us um, more time to get the word out to try to have information be gathered that could be presented that evening. Um, and, you know, optionally council members, we, we could schedule a council meeting that evening if we have a quorum, but alternatively, um, perhaps using the HHCC would be an option. Um, then what would have to happen is a staff report would have to be written. So it's it's research and analysis between now and then in order to bring forward an urgency ordinance on the 28th. Um, and so there's uh, a tight timeline for turnaround on the staff side. And if um, the state acts between now and then, then um, we would still be moving forward on that path. We would just have that in additional information for the deliberation. Right. Okay. Right. And then ultimately, as I mentioned, uh, an urgency ordinance does require a five-sevenths vote. All right. Those are my questions for now. Thank you. Could I um, just uh, follow up on that, um, Ms. Diaz? Uh, I understand that, uh, is it the city of San Diego? Uh, 
has an emergency ordinance or an urgency ordinance for an extension of the eviction moratorium, and now they're being challenged in court. Are they the only California city or county? Is anyone else being challenged at this time? And has any decision been made? I'd like to actually direct that um, to our assistant, senior assistant city attorney. Um, the only lawsuit we're aware of at this time is the one against San Diego County. And there will be a hearing on a preliminary injunction on June 21st. Uh, so at that time, we would have a better idea uh, whether the legal challenge is, um, is uh, supportable and we'll get a clear idea from the federal court at that time. And I also did wanna um, clarify in response to Vice Mayor Hill's question, I think I forgot to mention San Mateo County is considering acting on uh, June 29th on a local eviction moratorium as well. And could Thanks. you clarify, I'm sorry, I just wanted to ask a quick clarification. Is that, would that apply to us or is that just for the county? Cause they've varied on those throughout the pandemic. Um, the direction at their last board meeting was to come back with both a countywide and an unincorporated, um, one that would be countywide and one that would just be for unincorporated. Thank areas. you. And I wanted to clarify to see if I understood this, if the state decides um, at the 11th hour that they're going to extend the moratorium, wouldn't that... Um, make it unnecessary for us to pursue anything further? I, I thought I heard you say that we would still continue, but so uh, it, did it, I hear it, that? It, it really just depends on the, the motion, if a motion is approved tonight. And so what I think maybe on, on the table right now is a direction to staff to come back with an urgency ordinance at your next scheduled meeting on the 28th. And in order for us to do that at a staff level, we would need to go through work in the next you know, 10 days, hold, hold special meeting, gather information, uh, develop an ordinance, develop staff report, have that publicly available for your consideration on the 28th. It's possible that at some point during that time, the, the state may act and possibly the, you know, the, the motion tonight could say to staff to stop work if the, if the state happens to act. What is also, though, I think very likely and possible is that there might not be action by the county until the day after the next city council meeting, so the 29th instead of the 28th, and there could be signing of the state budget, you know, if an agreement is reached, you know, as late as the 29th or 30th, and so um, if, if the desire of the council is to move forward and have us develop something locally, um, we could be directed to either bring that back on the 28th with a caveat that if there is state action before the caveat, before the meeting of the 28th that it does not go on the agenda, it could be scheduled for a meeting in July instead of on the 28th um, in order to know for certain if these other pieces have fallen in the line either by the county at the state. But um, you know, all of this is, is in the context of, of the concerns obviously being raised about what happens effective July 1st. I hope that helps. I'm sorry, it's been, <laughs> it's, it's late at this point. I know, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the clarification so that we know what our options are. Um, Council Member Espinoza Garnica. Yes, I just wanted to share my thoughts about the uh, lessening the the duration of the moratorium. Um, just my thoughts are, I would be, um, I would hate to see that happen. I hope that folks on council um, would really lean towards extending it just an additional six months because what's another six months? And honestly, um, with everything, the way things have been administered, the pending, money still, you know, having to be sent to, to tenants and landlords right now. Um, it's still a very slow process. So I hope we're very, we can look into that process a lot when we bring up the ordinance next week, essentially. And I hope to pass this as soon as possible. And I don't want anything to stop it. This is reminding me a lot of the hazard pay, um, where I, I think it's very conservative the way that ended, right? And I don't want it to be too conservative um, here, but I don't want it to cost us this ordinance. So, you know, I hope that we can just 
really think about how expensive it is, how expensive it is to have homeless people um, and the amount of resources needed for that and how little we have for that compared to how expensive, you know, trying to find some aid for landlords at this time is um, for this eviction moratorium and what have you. So those are my final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council member Aguirre, would you like to add anything? I, I haven't called on you yet. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate what my colleagues have all said. And I, um, my thoughts are that we should, you know, move on and try to at least direct staff to put something together and see how things are, you know, we can't wait on the county and the state. I think we need to do something within our city. And, and I don't know what that looks like, but I, I think we should move forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, did any other council, oh, council member Hale, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Hale, I'm That's sorry. Right. That's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so just in the interest of, of time, because we've heard a few different ideas, um, I'm wondering if we want to, um, it, this is, it's the, there's such a challenge with timing here right now and, and having a lack of information about what the state is going to do and the findings and all that, and obviously wanting to do whatever we can. Um, I like this idea of um, having the direction for the HHCC to do the intake for it to come on the 28th. But if there is action by the state or the county prior that we would, um, we would not move forward, that we would be able to continue on our, our regular, already very busy agenda of doing a number of other things that support um, our vulnerable residents in our community. Um, so I would like to be judicious with that time. And um, that's what I would be supportive of, I think, at this point. Thank you. Council Member G. Thank you, Mayor Howard. I, I think I would be supportive of the concepts that Vice Mayor Hale just shared, you know, HHCC to be the uh, fact-finding group and then to tentatively schedule something for the 28th or somewhat early in the 12th, depending on what the state or the county does. I, I was curious, um, and I don't know if, if this is can be answered right now, but if it can't be, maybe it can be explored if this goes ahead, is if there's a way to, I mean, there's clearly part of our community that is in need and, and to target, let's just say if it's a three month um, continuation of the eviction moratorium to target that part of our community so that there is, you know, ways not to abuse the moratorium. The, the second piece is whether it's September, whether it's December, is there a way to transition out of the moratorium into paying rent? Because it's whether it's an on-off switch July 1st or October 1st or January 1st, that's still a hard transition. And is there a way to help tenants and property owners work through that transition? So I don't know, I don't have the answers to that. I'm just throwing that out there. If this is going to be studied, is, can we include that as part of the evaluation? So thank you, Mayor Howard. Thank you. Um, and I was going to say that uh, I, I still have grave concerns about the lack of efficiency in Sacramento. Uh, Council Member G mentioned it at the last meeting and I did some research and, and you are correct. Uh, I came to find out that there are $23 million in applications in Sacramento for assistance for landlords and only $2 million has been distributed so far. So there's such a backlog in distribution to help people, it's appalling. And I, I think that uh, we as council members and the community, I, I ask the community too, let your voices be heard. Call your electeds, write a letter to the governor in Sacramento and say, fix the problem in Sacramento so people can get the relief that they've been seeking. We ask people to fill out applications. 
they're very, very lengthy, some of them. They do it and then they don't see their money. That one woman mentioned three months she's been waiting. That's just appalling. So I, I, I'm really sad about that. And I think we can't let up pressure and lobbying Sacramento to, to do the right thing and, and fix this problem. Uh, I, do, I do have a concern about just um, getting ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I see um, Miss Ignacio, you, you have your hand raised. I'm sorry, I missed it. That's all right. Thank you, Mayor Howard. I did want to clarify that the county is um, not scheduled to act until June 29th. So that would be after the June 28th regular council meeting um, if, if there is a desire to wait until after the county acts. Well, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Is there, I mean, I'll just ask, is there a, a, a wish or desire by council uh, to, to, to see what happens with the county and the state at least till June 30th and schedule something for early July? I, I still think Housing and Human Concerns is an excellent um, way to go as far as gathering information and uh, speaking to our nonprofits to help us gather information. But I, I just am a little leery about getting out in front of uh, the state and the, I, I certainly am in agreement that we need to do something, but I'm just a little bit uncomfortable about getting out ahead of the state and the county. And so I'd like people's thoughts on that because uh, I, I want to protect city assets as best we can. I, I don't want to put us in a, a real difficult situation where we could get sued. And, and maybe that wasn't necessary. So I'll start with Council Member Espinosa Garnica, then Council Member Aguirre. Hi, yeah, I was just thinking like, is it possible just to write the ordinance in a way that like, if the state or county extends it further, um, um, it could still apply, you know, it's still, you know, operable, <laughs> basically in effect, doesn't null it, but also um, if it is moved after the 29th, because I know it's a very, like, folks would like to see an example above us lead on this. So if it went, if we did this on the 29th, would it be in effect on the, on the 1st of July? When, how soon would it be in effect? Well, that the county, I can't speak for the county, but maybe Miss Ignacio, you could answer that question better than I. Oh yeah, I meant for us because if they're voting, oh, I'm sorry, because they're voting on the 29th. I mean, if we want to vote on the day after, that was my question. So if we, if we I, voted the day after them, how soon can the ordinance take effect? Like the next day or? Well, Miss Ignacio, um, if you could tell us, no matter what day we voted, don't we have to have a, a second reading or something? Uh, can you tell me, is it just one reading because it's urgency? How does that work? Um, yes, Mayor Howard, uh, Council Member Espinosa Garnica, uh, the urgency ordinance would be effective upon adoption. So it would be effective that day. Um, the SB 91 um, by its language doesn't allow this local ordinance to be effective until July 1st if it's not extended. But if we could adopt an urgency ordinance, it would be um, effective that upon adoption um, after July 1st. Uh, and then I think to your first question, I just wanted to clarify, um, was your question that uh, whether the our ordinance could be effective at the same time as the states or is this at the same time as the counties? Yeah, like um, like if they broaden it up, I don't know, like maybe if they do it longer than us, you know, it would still be enough, like theirs would override us. I don't know, like should be fine. I guess that's automatic, right? Like I'm just trying to think what would be a concern if we laid on it. Cause I'm pretty sure, I guess, I'm not pretty sure. This is all just kind of a gamble and assumption. I would assume that they would act on it, <laughs> but yeah. Well, so when this, this, the, the two times the state has acted, it is explicitly um, uh, uh, preempted local ordinances during the time frame. Right, right. That's why I, I guess that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. So like whatever we write will be preempted. Um, okay. And I guess the concern okay. really that folks are asking is because they just want to see someone else lead the example. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council member Aguirre. My question was similar. If we can do this in tandem, if we can start um, doing some work and working with the housing and human concerns and um, moving forward and as so that we're ready when things are, the timing is kind of the challenge. So anyway, if we can do these in tandem, we, if we can move forward with our, our housing and human concerns committee as we wait for the state and the county. Council member ready. Thank you, Mayor Howard, and thank you, colleagues. Um, I just wanted to be very clear that what I'm asking of colleagues is um, that we extend the moratorium through September, and that it that we um, stand down if the state or the county um, extends the moratorium themselves. That that includes us, includes Redwood City, but I am. I am not asking, and I and I, I am asking colleagues to consider the 28th, and I'm not sure what role HHCC is going to have that is going to save the staff um, from the burden of bringing it to us on the 28th. If if staff truly feels that that's going to help, then then please do that. But but I am asking colleagues to um, extend it through September. Um, unless the state or county uh, relieves us of that. Thank you. Ms. Diaz, I think you want, had your hand raised first. Yes, just to clarify, it would not save staff time to have the HHCC um, right. speak to it. It's actually an option to not have the council have a hearing on it and have the HHCC instead. Um, and either way, either a council or HHCC, um, it would be valuable to be able to build a record to underlie findings required for an emergency ordinance. Thank you for the clarification. Vice Mayor Hale. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that. That was my understanding. And yes. I think that's important timing wise because then there's the hearing on that information. We don't have to schedule another meeting, which is, you know, challenging for staff and, you know, with the summer and everything. Um, so the, the time's really well. And then we would have hopefully a body of information for findings because we still have to make findings. Uh, to pass an urgency ordinance. Okay. So I would propose we move forward with this. Um, I, I would be happy to make a motion at this point because we've, we've had quite a bit of discussion. Um, so I'd make the motion that we uh, do the plan as, as laid out. We would um, uh, move to uh, put in place this urgency ordinance um, with a or move to study the urgency ordinance actually um, uh, with uh, fact finding being done by the HHCC uh, next week with the issue hopefully coming to the council on the 28th. However, if uh, the state or, or um, the county uh, takes action that would impact Redwood City residents prior, um, that we would not continue the study. I'll second okay. that. <clears throat> Okay, a motion been made by Vice Mayor Hale and uh, very clearly, thank you. Uh, seconded by Council Member Smith. Is there any further discussion? Just a clarifying question, Mayor. Um, I, I thought I heard Melissa say that if we, in, in the proposal that my colleague made, the Vice Mayor is the same one that I had made earlier, but if we waited for them, then we, the staff wouldn't have enough time to put this together. Is that correct, Melissa, or did I? So I think what I understood Vice Mayor Hale to say is, is that staff would, would start the work and we would develop a recommendation and an mm -hmm. analysis to bring to you on the 28th. Um, but I think I understood her to say that if the state acted before the 28th, then we would not schedule it for city council discussion that evening. Did I capture that correctly? Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And that's what I understood. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. We really want to be clear on what we're voting on. Okay. If there's no further discussion, I'll ask the city clerk to call the roll, please. 
Thank you. We will start with Council Member Reddy. Yes. Council Member Smith. Yes. Council Member Aguirre. Yes. Council Member Espinosa Garnica. Yes. Council Member G. Yes. Vice Mayor Hale. Yes. And Mayor Howard. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. And thank you for the very healthy discussion. So let's uh, quickly move on to uh, City Council Committee reports, Equity and Social Justice Subcommittee. Uh, Council Member Espinosa Garnica, could you give us an update? Yes. Yeah, so let's see, a few points from our last meeting, um, which was on the 2nd of June. The Equity and Social Justice Subcommittee met for the second time. And following from the first meeting, where we received some examples of equity plans from other communities. We use this meeting to brainstorm a range of equity issues that committee members propose for consideration by Redwood City. And we will also meet again in July and our near term objective is to bring some recommendations regarding a city equity plan to the full council before the end of August. And yeah, basically we brainstormed a lot of ideas and tried to, you know, simplify them to be main priorities and trying to think about the the philosophy of the structure of equity planning. Um, what are results? Are we basing? I had a good conversation about if we're measuring it by um, how much staff it would require versus like how much impact it would have if we invested in it. So it's just kind of that conversation came about. It was good. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the Climate Action Subcommittee, Vice Mayor Hale. Oh, there we go. Uh, yes, the, uh, let me pull my notes up here. Uh, the Climate Action uh, Subcommittee met um, that uh, consists of myself, Council Member Espinosa Garnica, and Council Member G. What's notable about this um, committee is that it's new. Uh, previously, we had a committee on environmental initiatives and we had a separate committee on sea level rise. And this committee has uh, replaced both of those because there were so much areas of overlap. And basically the meeting was to hear an update uh, since the six months when we had uh, adopted the climate action plan and to inspect the areas that staff has been focused on, which include communication and education, collaboration and adaptation and mitigation. Um, and of course the uh, council members gave um, feedback um, regarding building materials um, and metrics for, um, metrics was also an, an area of discussion uh, for incentive programs. And the committee will meet again. Uh, looks like uh, it'll be around September. Thank you very much. And the personal subcommittee uh, was is myself and Vice Mayor Hale, and we met on June 10th to discuss the annual evaluation process for the city council's appointees, our city manager and our city attorney. This process will be conducted later this summer. And now moving on to our city manager's update, Ms. Diaz. I'll be very brief, but I did wanna highlight that last week we announced uh, continuing evolution and in in-person services for the city. So starting in July, we'll be having summer hours at city hall with some in-person services uh, tentatively scheduled for Tuesdays and Wednesdays, continuing many virtual and by appointment services. And we'll start to see many more in-person events and activities beginning in July and, and that amount increasing through the fall. So we're excited to be at that stage. Additionally, as there is more business activity uh, downtown. I did want to share that the Crossing 900 garage is uh, expected to open for public parking on July 2nd, and that would be open the evenings, Monday through Friday, and then all day on weekends and holidays. Thank you. That's great news. Thank you. Our next council meeting is scheduled for June 16th, 2021. I want to thank everyone for participating this evening and thank you for staying with us. Please have a good evening and a good week. Stay healthy, stay safe. Good night.